Prologue, 18 Octar, the year of the purloined statue, 1477 DR. It was late autumn in Myth Dranor, a bright, cold morning with the first snows of the year dusting the open spaces between the trees. The fall colors were fading fast, but the forest of Cormanthor still mantled the city in a glorious cape of red, gold, and orange. The sun was brilliant on the golden treetops overhead, and the sky was perfect and clear. In the shadows beneath the trees, Garen Hullmaster fought with all his strength and lore against the elf mage Rovan Disarnal, dueling with blade and spell against spell and wand. Steel glittered and rang in the morning air as Garen parried bolts of crackling white force or deflected shining veils of madness in which Rovan tried to ensnare him. Garen wore the dove-gray coat and silver embroidery of Coronel's guard, but he was a human, tall and lean, with long black hair bound by a silver circlet. He wielded a fine backsword of elven steel, a graceful and strong weapon with a slight curve toward the point. It was longer and heavier than most such weapons, but in his hands the blade leaped and danced like a rapier. He kept his left hand free for spell-casting, fighting as elf sword mages did in the ancient bladesong tradition. Rovan, on the other hand, was no swordsman. He had only his mahogany wand, and that was weapon enough for the elf mage. Dueling was not permitted in Mythdranor. This encounter was ostensibly an invitation to demonstrate skill through the lists in a tournament of to the city's defenders. A small crowd of witnesses watched closely to ensure that the forms would be followed. Dariad Selsharan, the sun elf blade singer who taught Garin his magic, stood by to serve as Garin's second. Dariad watched with a disapproving frown, since he could tell already that the contest was long past a simple challenge of skill and was a duel in fact, if not in name. Beside Dariad stood Alier her face white with worry as she watched Garin and Rovan fight. She was beautiful beyond comparison, a slender moon-elf maiden, not much older than Garin himself, with hair of midnight blue in which a slim diamond tiara sparkled like the stars in a dark sky. Garin was only a rootless human, freebooter, a wanderer who had drifted into Mythdranor and won himself a place in the coronal's service. But she had come to love him none the less, and in the golden light of this perfect morning she was petrified with fear for him. But Rovan, a proud and handsome moon elf of a high house, loved her too, and he had come to bitterly resent the affection she held for Garin. And so the human sword mage and the elf wizard fought with the passion of lions over some trivial insult one had given the other. Rovan hurled a mighty fire-blast from his wand, and the onlookers gasped in alarm. Garin warded himself with a countering spell, even though the violet flames singed his cloak and licked at his face and hands. The magical flames seared the frost and dead leaves beneath his feet into steam and smoke that fumed around the sword-mage, rather than retreat. Garin brought a spell of translocation to mind, fixed its symbols and syllogisms firmly in his thoughts, and snarled a single arcane word. Syrock. In the blink of an eye, he stood close beside Rovan, who'd lost sight of him for a crucial instant amid the steam and smoke. The moon elf whirled and started to raise his wand, but Garin was quicker. He brought his sword up in a disarming stroke that sent the wand spinning through the air and carried through to slash Rovan across the side of his face. His enemy cried out and staggered back, falling to his knees. Garin leaped after the elf and laid his sword point at Rovan's breast. Yield! You are defeated! he shouted. He held his blade still and steady, despite the acrid stench of smoke in his nose and throat, and the pain of his singed skin. Rovan knelt in the thin snow, blood dripping from his handsome face. Brilliant hatred 
glittered in the wizard's eyes, and his teeth were bared in a feral snarl. The mahogany wand waited in the snow between the man and the elf. "'I will not yield, human dog,' Rovan hissed softly. Then he reached for the wand. Without a moment's thought, Garin batted the wand away from Rovan's hand, sending it spinning over the dead leaves and snow. The elf snarled in anger, and something dark and murderous erupted in Garin's heart. Every cold sneer, every veiled insult, every sarcastic remark Rovan had ever uttered against him coalesced into a black wave that swept over Garin. It was as if his anger, his hate, and his loathing for his rival had delivered him into the clutches of something he was powerless to resist. Rovan lunged after the wand again, his fingers stretching for his weapon. Coldly, deliberately, Garin leaned in and struck— taking off Rovan's hand at the wrist. Blood spattered the ice-crusted leaves. He heard cries of horror from those who looked on, and his adversary screamed in anger and fear. Why did I do that? Garin wondered dully. He knew that maiming Rovan in that way, cruelly, deliberately, when the jewel had already been won, was a monstrous thing to do. He knew that Alier and Dariad and the other elves watching must be horrified by what he had done. Yet something spiteful beyond all understanding had driven him to it anyway. Once, when he was a boy of about nine or ten, his father had given him a fine toy lute inlaid with ivory, a gift carried back from a long journey to Deepingdale. Garin remembered how he had found himself twisting the neck from the drum, fascinated by the flex and strain of the fragile wood. And then, deliberately, knowing what would happen, he'd flexed it too far. He'd done it just to watch the toy break. He looked down at Rovan, huddled around his bleeding stump. The elf's hand lay on the ground quite near the wand, palm up the pallid fingers twitching oddly. Garin raised his sword slowly, studying the crippled elf, and even though he felt dizzy and sick with horror, he aimed carefully at the elf's face. Without knowing why, he knew he intended to cut out an eye next, almost as if having already toppled into a shocking abyss, he meant to plumb its depths to the fullest, indulging his black compulsion until he sated it. Garin, no, it is enough, shouted Dariot. The graceful blade singer ended the duel by leaping into the clearing and interposing himself. By the ancient rules that spelled defeat for Garin, since Dariot was after all his second, and had intervened. But Garin sensed that the rules had been laid aside already. No one in the courtyard would argue that Rovan had won the encounter, would they? Garin felt his arm drawing back as if to drive his sword forward one more time, and then Dariad seized him by the shoulders and wrestled him away. "'It is enough, Garin,' Dariad hissed into his face. "'Have you lost your mind? That was cruelly done.' Garin stared at his mentor, unable to find words. The black, murderous fury ebbed away as quickly as it had come over him, leaving him weak, empty.' The sword fell from his fingers, and he shook his head, trying to clear his mind of the destructive impulse that had seized him. Why did I do that? he wondered. He despised Rovan, true, but he should have been content with besting him, especially since the mage had instigated the whole thing. All he would have had to do is take a half-step and kick the wand out of reach again, or perhaps set his blade across Rovan's neck to demand surrender, and the coronel's judge standing by certainly would have ended the match. "'I had no intention to cripple him, Dariad,' he finally said. The elf blade singer sighed deeply. "'Your intentions hardly matter at this point. You'll be judged for this, Garin Hallmaster, and judged severely, I fear.' Several of Rovan's friends were attending to the wounded mage or glaring at Garin with cold fury. Garin turned away slowly and rubbed his face with one shaking hand. When he looked up again, he found Alier staring at him from the spot where she'd stood to watch the contest. 
She was as pale as the snow, her hands pressed to her mouth, and her eyes wide with horror. The silk handkerchief she was to award the winner lay in the muddy snow at her feet. Their eyes met, and Allier flinched away. "'What have I done?' Garin murmured. He took two steps toward her, reaching out. "'Allier, I didn't mean... I don't know. Oh, Garin!' she said softly. A small, sobbing gasp escaped her throat. "'How could you do such a thing?' She backed away several steps and turned to hurry away, disappearing into the shadows under the trees. Garin took one step after her before he stopped where he stood. Allier had looked on him with fear. What could he possibly say or do to explain himself to her? Did I mean to wound Rovan? Or myself when I struck that blow? He silently asked himself. Garin, Hallmaster, come with me. The coronal's judge, a stern-faced moon-elf in the colors of the royal court, approached Garin, one hand riding on the pommel of his sword. Two more Velar guards waited nearby, equally stern. "'You are summoned to appear before the coronal. She must decide this matter now.' The sword-mage stared after Allier, but she was gone. One, eleven chess, the year of the ageless one, 1479 D.R. The moon sea crossing was wet and rough, three hard days of beating through whitecaps and spray in the cold, angry winds of early spring. By the time the battered coaster passed into the shelter of the arches, every man on board was cold, tired, and soaked. Ships in the service of kings or great nobles accommodated their passengers in cabins and assigned stewards to wait on them, but the coaster was a plain moon-sea tradesman. It was a working ship that offered its passengers nothing more than a place to sleep on the deck. She finally tied up alongside the wharf at the foot of Plank Street shortly before sunset. Longshoremen swarmed aboard to begin unloading her cargo, sacks of flour, casks of wine, and countless other crates and bundles of goods from Vespin to the south. While the laborers began their work, the ship's only two passengers, one a dark-haired man of thirty or so, the other a well-dressed halfling, carried their own satchels down the gangplank to the creaking wharf. "'So this is Hullberg,' the halfling said. He was of average height for his people." an inch or so over four feet, with a surprisingly sturdy frame under his damp green cloak. He wore daggers, several of them, two at the belt and one in the right boot, and a fourth strapped hilt down in a large sheath between his shoulder blades, and a hard, suspicious look on his sharp-featured face. Cold water plastered his russet braids close to his scalp, and he began squeezing the water from each braid in turn. I doubt I'll like it very much. My business here won't take long, Hamel, Garin answered. He towered over the halfling, of course, but in fact he was only a little taller than average. He had the rangy, lean build and the long, well-muscled arms of a born swordsman. Garin's hands were large and strong, well calloused from many hours of practice. The sword he'd won in the coronal's guard, a long elf-made blade with a hilt of mithril wire, rode in a scabbard he wore low on his left hip. His black hair was cut short, above wide, thoughtful eyes of grey, so it wouldn't obscure his vision in a fight, but left shoulder length and free otherwise. The swordsman had an unconscious habit of chewing his lip when deep in thought, as he was now. "'We've already missed Jared's funeral. Give me a few days to look after his affairs and see my family, and we'll be on our way. I guess we might as well wait for better weather before we cross back to the southern shore anyway,' Hamel said in resignation. He looked back out toward the moon sea. 
Wild white caps marched and tumbled beyond the spectacular arches which divided the calmer waters of the harbor from the open sea. The slender stone ribs soared hundreds of feet into the air, leaping and plunging like the paths of a dozen skipping pebbles somehow frozen in pale green stone. The halfling studied them for a moment and added, Those don't look like they belong here. Changeland? The arches? Yes, they're changeland. I'm told they erupted from the seabed in a single night in the year of blue fire, destroyed a quarter of the old city on the east head there, but they gave Hullberg the best harbor on the north shore of the Moon Sea. Pretty, I suppose, but not much compared to the claws of Star Mantle, Hamel shrugged. Faerun was littered with such wonders. Not two days ago they'd sailed beneath a forest-covered islet of stone, adrift in the stormy skies, forty miles out of Mullmaster. Towns and cities had long ago accommodated themselves to change lands as best they could. So, where are we going, Garin? The swordsman studied the town's waterfront, establishing his bearings. Hullaberg was Garin's home, but he had left it behind him more than ten years ago, and this was only the second time he'd returned since. "'Where, indeed?' he murmured to himself. In his travels he'd seen dozens upon dozens of cities and towns. It surprised him how much Hullaberg resembled the rest after such a long absence.' The town climbed and rambled over a low hill overlooking a sheltered bay between high, rocky headlands two miles apart, Keldon Head to the west and East Head opposite. The sun was setting, and cook fires by the hundreds burned in stone hearths and outdoor kitchens, sending twisting spirals of smoke into the sky to be caught and carried off by the harsh spring winds. Hullberg was a young town, built atop the ruins of a larger and older city. Brash new storehouses and sprawling merchant compounds crowded the harbor district, rambling along crooked, poorly paved streets that had grown like wild roots through the rubble and byways of the old city. Beyond the harbor and its walled trade yards stood a town whose workshops and houses were made from stone taken from the nearby ruins, or sometimes simply built atop the foundations of much older buildings. Most had upper stories, framed in heavy timber and roofs covered in rough wooden shakes, since Hullberg had an ample supply of timber close at hand in the forested vales of the Galena Mountains. The steep headlands and hills surrounding the town were too windswept and rocky for trees of any size to find purchase. Garin looked north along Plank Street and glimpsed the old grey keep of Griffin Watch glowering over the town. It was a mile from the harbour, perched atop a rocky spur of the eastern ridge. While it was not very well situated to guard the city against attacks by sea, that was not why Angar Hallmaster had raised his keep there. Griffin Watch faced north, inland, a defense against the savage orcs, ogres, and other monsters who dwelled in the desolate hills and moorlands of Thar. Many of the buildings and storefronts fronting the harbor, or crowding along Plank Street, were new to Garin, but the old castle, at least, had not changed. I've missed this place, he found himself thinking. Twice now I've come back to bury someone, but never otherwise. Why is that? I'm soaked, and this wind is damned cold, Hamel observed. Are we going to stand here much longer, Garin? What? Oh, of course. Garin looked up and down the busy Bay Street. It was more crowded than he remembered. Gangs of porters, shouting longshoremen, and merchants and their clerks hurried this way and that. Most seemed to be outlanders, men who wore the colors of foreign merchant companies or trading costers. Forgive me, all of these merchant yards are new. The town's grown a lot in eight years. If you say so, it looks the back end of nowhere to me, Garin snorted. I certainly thought so when I was growing up here. I couldn't wait to leave the place. He pulled the hood of his cloak up over his head and allowed the peak to shadow his features. 
He didn't really expect that he would be easily recognized, but for the moment he didn't feel much like talking with anyone he might happen to meet. Let's find something hot to eat before we do anything else. I've been seasick for three days, and I need something under my ribs. The halfling glanced up at Garin and nodded in the direction of the old gray keep looming over the town. Won't they feed you there? They would. With Hullberg's cobblestones under his boots, Garin was beginning to remember why he had come home. Jared Erstenwold was dead, murdered until he'd actually set foot in Hullberg. That news had been something to push off a few days. The difficulties of a four-hundred-mile journey from Tantris had served to occupy his thoughts for the last ten days, but having reached his destination, he could no longer turn away from the tidings that had brought him there. He sighed and ran his fingers through his damp hair. "'Give me an hour by a good fire with a Sembian red in my cup. Then I'll be ready.' "'As you wish,' Hamel gave Garin a measuring look, but he said nothing else. Like any halfling, he seemed to burn food fast and rarely lacked an appetite. He wouldn't turn down a meal to settle his stomach. The two quickly surveyed the collection of taverns and alehouses near the wharves, found the establishments there less than inviting, and turned up High Street and climbed into the Commerce District. The large mercantile companies did their business in the walled trade yards by the harbor, but along High Street, the town's shopkeepers, provisioners, and artisans had their places of business, along with the better taverns and inns of Hullberg. Garin passed two places he remembered well, and settled on one he did not, a tap-house called the Sleeping Dragon, clean fieldstone, dark timbers, and a brightly painted signboard marked it as new. Besides, it hadn't been there the last time Garin had been in Hullberg. "'This will do,' he told Hamel, and ducked into the front door. The common room was crowded and loud. Most of the patrons seemed to be foreigners, Thinchen and Melvontian merchants in the doublets or quilted jerkins and square caps favored in those cities— Mulmasterites with their double baldrics and dueling swords low on their hips, and even a few sullen dwarf craftsmen in heavy fur and iron. A handful of Hullbergans were scattered through the crowd, notable because they tended to be much plainer in dress than the merchants and traders of other cities. Most people in Hullberg preferred a plain hooded cloak and a simple tunic and leggings to the less practical fashions of the bigger cities, since Hullberg was still something of a frontier town, and its people valued warmth and comfort over style. "'Where did all these outlanders come from?' Garin wondered aloud. "'The town's full of them. Doubtless most of the natives had the good sense to leave as you did.' Humph. Garin shook his head. Hullberg had been a sleepy little backwater ten years ago when he had set out to see Faerun, but it seemed that was no longer the case. He realized that he'd seen more foreigners in the streets than native Hullbergans in their short walk up from the docks, men and women in the colors of merchant costers, guilds, and companies from all over the moon sea. "'I wasn't gone that long. It's only been ten years.' Eight, really. You spent too much time with the elves in Mythdranor, Hamel answered him without speaking. He was a ghostwise halfling, and his people could make their thoughts heard when they wished. I think they bewitched you, Garin. Ten years is a long time for humans or halflings alike. You've forgotten how the rest of us reckon the years. Garin frowned, but made no reply. The two companions chose a table in a far corner of the room, and worked their way through a serviceable supper of stew, black bread, and smoked fish. The sleeping dragon charged five silver pennies for their board, but at least they included a flagon of passable southern wine with the meal, though Garin doubted that it had ever been within a hundred miles of Sembia. He poured himself two cups and stopped, not wanting to dull himself before finishing the journey. There would be time for that later. "'You haven't said much about your friend Jared,' Hamel said after a time. "'Jared? No, I suppose I haven't. 
Garin returned his attention to his small companion. He was my closest friend when we were growing up. Once upon a time we were the young kings of this town. We hunted every hilltop and valley for ten miles around. We explored dozens of old ruins. We pilfered and begged and charmed our way through the streets, getting ourselves into more sorts of trouble than you can imagine. We taught ourselves sword-play and picked some fights that we shouldn't have, but somehow we always came through it. Miria, that's Jared's sister, and my cousin Kara, followed after us as often as not. The four of us were inseparable. Garin smiled, even though the memories made his heart ache. Hullberg may not seem like much compared to Tantris or Mullmaster, but it was a good place to grow up. "'Jared remained in Hullberg when you left?' "'He did. I was anxious to try myself against the world. I couldn't stand the idea of boxing myself up in this town, but Jared didn't see things that way. So I went to study in Thentia, and then I traveled to Procamper to study from the swordmasters there, and fell in with the dragon shields, and I even visited Myth Draner and lived among the elves for a time, as you well know.' Jared stayed here and became a captain of the Shield Sworn, the Harmax Guards. More than once I tried to talk him into joining me in Tantris or Procamper, but he never had my restlessness. He used to tell me that he had too much to look after right here in Hallberg, but I think he simply liked it here better than anywhere else. He just didn't see a reason to leave. Garin drained his cup and set it down. All right, I think it's time to call on my family. They left a few coppers on the table and made their way outside. The sun had set, and the wind battered at shutters and doors with bitterly cold gusts. Signboards creaked and swayed. The few street lamps in sight guttered and danced wildly, and people hurried from door to door, clutching their cloaks tight around their bodies. Charming, Hamel said with a shiver. The halfling hailed from the warm lands of the south, and he'd never gotten used to the chill of more northerly lands. I can't believe that people choose to live in places like this. Winter's worse, Garin answered. He turned right and set off along High Street, trying his best to ignore the cold. He was a native Hulbergen, after all, and he was not about to let Hamel see that it bothered him, too. They came to the small square by the assayer's house, a rambling old stone building where the Harmax officials oversaw the trade in gold dust and mining claims, and descended the stairs leading down to the Middle Bridge and Cinder Way. Once that part of town had been given over to several big smelters, but some sixty years ago Lendon Hullmaster had moved the stink and slag of the furnaces a mile to the east, downwind of the town. Afterward a crowded district of workshops and poorly built row houses known as the tailings had grown up in place of the smelters. Garin remembered the tailings as a sparsely inhabited and poor neighborhood, but it seemed it had taken a turn for the worse since he'd last been home. Outlanders crowded every dilapidated house or hovel, dirty and sullen men who gathered around fire pits staring at the two travelers as they passed. Who are these people? Garin wondered again. Miners with no claims to work? Laborers indentured to one of the guilds or merchant companies? or just more of the rootless wanderers who seemed to collect like last year's leaves, blown here and there by the winds of ill fortune? The towns and cities of Faerun were full of such men, especially in the years since the spell plague. Garin, Hamel said silently. The swordsman sensed his small companion's sudden alertness and slowed his steps. He followed Hamel's gaze and saw what the halfling saw a gang of five men watching over the street. Three lounged on the sagging stoop of a dismal alehouse, and two gathered around a fire pit on the opposite side of the street. They carried cudgels and knives, and each man wore a red-dyed leather gauntlet wrapped in chains on his left hand. Crimson chains. Slavers. I see them, Garin answered. A slaving company from the city of Melvaunt. 
The Crimson Chain had a bad name throughout Moonsea. He'd met them a few times in the Vast, but he never would have expected to find them in Hullberg. The Harmax had outlawed slaving long before he'd been born, and it was a law they kept rigorously. Garin's mouth tightened, but he kept walking. The Chainsman might have some legitimate business in Hullberg, he told himself. And even if they didn't, it wasn't his place to object. The Shield Sworn would rouse them out if they intended trouble. Not so fast, friends. One of the chainsmen, a short, stocky man with a shaven head and a long, drooping mustache, stepped down from the alehouse stoop into their path. He grinned crookedly, but his eyes were hard and cold. I don't think I've seen you around here before, hey? You've some dues to pay. Garin scowled. He'd seen this sort of thing more than once, but never before in Hullberg. In any event, he was not inclined to pay off thugs anywhere, as long as he had good steel on his hip. Dues? What exactly do I owe dues for, and who's collecting? The bald chainsman studied Garin with a sharp smile. There are lots of bad sorts about, you know. I'm Raldo. My boys and I keep order in the tailings. Your dues buy you safe passage, my friends. Everybody pays. Hamel rolled his eyes. And how much are your dues? he asked. How much have you got? another one of the slavers asked. More than I'd care to part with. Then hand over your purse, little man, and I'll see how much you can afford, the chainsman Raldo said. He spat on the ground. We're reasonable fellows, after all. Garin studied the chainsmen surrounding them, five on the street and possibly more in the alehouse or another place nearby, and most looked like they knew how to use the cudgels at their belts. It would be easier to play their game and buy them off with a couple of silver pennies, but the thought of paying for safe passage in his own home town did not sit well with him. Besides, he told himself, they're probably not as reasonable as they say they are. Deliberately, Garin let his duffel drop, and shrugged his cloak over his shoulder, revealing the back sword at his hip. Harassing two nondescript passers-by was one thing for a gang of ruffians, but a man carrying a blade might know how to use it. Hoping the chainsman might see things that way, he rested his hand on the pommel. "'I think we'll look after ourselves,' he said easily. "'Now, if you don't mind—' The slaver's face darkened, and his false humor fell away. He scowled and jerked his head, and the chainsmen nearby pushed themselves to their feet and started to close in around Garin and Hamel. "'You don't understand, friends,' Raldo rasped. "'Half the ditch-diggers and dirt-grubbers in this town wear steel, hey? I ain't seen one yet who knows what to do with it. Everybody pays, and your dues are getting steeper.' "'Not so steep as you think,' Garin reflected. He supposed he could simply walk off and see if the chainsmen tried to stop him, or he could wait for one of them to make a move. But he could see where this was going, and if he was right, well, there was no reason to wait for the slavers to start it, was there? He took a deep breath and looked down at Hamel. The halfling glanced up. Now? he asked silently. I'll take care of the alehouse if you deal with the other side of the street, Garin answered. Try not to kill any of them if you can help it. Done, Hamel replied. Then, without another word, the halfling's hands flashed to his belt and came up with a pair of daggers. He threw both in the same motion, sinking each dagger into a chainsman's knee, before either ruffian could even cry out. Hamel had the big fighting knife from his shoulder harness in his hand, and he dashed into the stunned pair by the fire pit without a sound. Apparently neither of the men there had really thought they might be set upon by someone no bigger than a ten-year-old child. To all appearances the halfling had simply gone berserk. "'What in the nine hells?' the leader of the gang growled. He went straight for his own knife, a good piece of fighting iron almost a foot and a half long. 
The two men on the wooden steps of the alehouse yanked their cudgels out and started to clatter down to the street. But Garin was faster. By the time the leader had his hand on his knife hilt, Garin had already swept his sword from the scabbard. The elven steel was etched with a triple rose design, and it was superbly balanced by a pommel in the shape of a steel rose. He'd earned it in the service of Coronel Ilseville soon after arriving in Mithdranor, and the sword suited Garin better than any other he'd ever taken in hand. He swept the point up and across the slaver's knife hand in one smooth motion with the draw, laying open the man's forearm. Raldo cursed and reeled away, holding his wounded hand, blood streaming through his fingers. "'Take em, lads!' he snarled. The two men on the steps came at Garin in a quick rush. He retreated several steps, emptied his mind with the quick skill of long practice, and found the invocation he wanted. "'Cullen em Hariel, he whispered in Elvish, weaving a spell-shield with his words and his will." Ghostly streamers of pale silver-blue light gleamed around him, seemingly no more solid than wisps of fog. Then Garin stood his ground as the first man lunged out at his skull with a knobbed cudgel. The sword mage passed the heavy blow over his head with the flat of his blade, then slashed the fellow's left leg out from under him with a deep cut to the calf. The chainsman went down hard with a grunt of shock. The second man came at him an instant later. Garin spun away from the one blow, batted aside the other with a hand-jarring parry near his hilt, and smashed the rose-shaped pommel of his blade into the slaver's nose. Something crunched, and blood gushed as the fellow staggered back and sat down heavily in the street. A sharp thrum whistled in the street. Garin caught a glimpse of a crossbow's bolt just before it struck him high on the right side of his chest, but his hasty spell-shield held. The bolt rebounded from a sharp silvery flame flaring brightly in the shadows of the street and clattered away across the cobblestones. The chainsman leader stood open-mouthed, a small empty crossbow in his good hand. "'Damn it all, he's a wizard!' the first slaver, by Garin, snarled. The fellow scrambled awkwardly to his feet and quickly backed away, favoring his injured leg. Then he turned and fled into the night. The man with the broken nose followed, lurching blindly after him. On the other side of the street, the remaining two chainsmen were limping away from Hamel as fast as they could, giving up the battle. Garin ignored them. If they thought he was a wizard and wanted no more of him— he wouldn't say otherwise. He advanced on the slaver Raldo. The man was already drawing back the string of his crossbow for another try, but Garin put a stop to that by striking him hard across the side of the head with the flat of his blade. The blow split Raldo's shaven scalp and stretched him senseless on the wooden steps of the alehouse. That was for taking a shot when I wasn't looking, the sword mage growled. He was tempted to give the slaver something more to remember him by, but he held his temper. At least half a dozen spectators were peering through the alehouse's windows and doors, and some might not be friendly. Hamel sauntered up, sheathing his knives one by one as he studied the scene. "'You let yours run off with hardly a mark on them. I'll set that straight if I see them again. Did you find all your knives?' I'm willing to loan them out for a time, but I want them back when all the dancing's done. The halfling stooped down to wipe off one last bloody knife on the tunic of the unconscious chainsman at their feet. So, is this the typical evening entertainment in Hullberg? No, said Garin, it's not. He returned his sword to the sheath and looked up at the old grey towers of the castle, overshadowing the town. Dim yellow lights burned in a handful of the keep's windows. Other towers remained dark. Crimson-chained slavers seemed to think they owned the streets. What in the world had happened to Hullberg while he was away? How long had it been like this? He picked his bag up from the ground and took a deep breath. "'Come on, Hamel,' he said. "'I think it's time to find out just what's been going on around here.' Two, eleven chess, the year of the ageless one. The castle called Griffin Watch was not really a true castle, 
Most of its towers and halls were guarded by the steep bluffs of the castle's hilltop and did not require a thick wall for protection. Only on its lower northern face was Griffin Watch truly fortified, with a strong gatehouse and a tower-studded wall guarding access to the courtyards, barracks, and residences within. Garin had always thought of it as a great, rambling, drafty, partially abandoned house that happened to be made out of stone, with the curious afterthought of one castle-like wall to guard the front gate. "'I have to congratulate the builders of the place,' Hamel said. "'They picked the highest, coldest, windiest spot in this whole miserable town for their masterpiece.' The castle's causeway was completely exposed to the northwest wind once the visitors climbed above the roofline of the surrounding town, and the faded banners above the gatehouse flapped loudly in the stiff wind. Griffin Watch's gates stood open. Hamel's step faltered as they entered the dark, tunnel-like passage through the gatehouse. "'I never liked these things,' the halfling muttered. He had an instinctive aversion to anything that felt like an ambush, and the front entrance of any well-made castle was designed to be a giant stone trap to its enemies. Menacing arrow slits overlooked the approach to the castle and the gate passage proper. They stood dark and empty, but in times of war watchful archers would be posted there, ready to cut down attackers at the top of the causeway. "'Come on, Hamel,' Garin said quietly. He clapped his friend on the shoulder. "'It's out of the wind, anyway.' At the inner end of the gate, the castle's portcullis was lowered into place, blocking most of the passage. The heavy gate was fitted with a small swinging door. Two shield-sworn guards waited there. They wore knee-length coats of mail under heavy wooden mantles and steel caps trimmed with a ring of fur for warmth. Both carried pikes, perfect for thrusting through the portcullis at enemies on the far side, and a pair of crossbows leaned against the wall nearby. "'Hold there,' said the older of the men, a sergeant with a round, blunt face like the end of a hammer. "'State your name and business.' Garin stepped out of the gate's shadow and reached up to draw back the hood of his cloak. "'I'm Garin Hullmaster,' he said. "'And I'm here to call on the Harmac and visit with whatever kinfolk of mine happen to be home this evening, Sergeant Colton.' The sergeant's eyes opened wide. "'Garin, as I live and breathe, it must be five years!' He fumbled with a small door in the portcullis and finally got it open. "'Come in, sir, come in!' Despite the sour mood that had settled over him after the encounter with the crimson chains, Garin smiled. He'd always liked Colton, and he couldn't help but enjoy the man's surprise. Eight years, Colton. I haven't been home since my father died. Lord Burnov was a good man. Things around here might be different if he hadn't fallen. The sturdy soldier's face softened with memories, likely some old campaign or skirmish riding alongside Garin's father. And then Colton's thoughts turned— and a sudden grimace stole over his features. He sighed and looked closely at Garin. "'My lord, I don't know how to tell you this,' he began. Garin cut him off with a small motion of his hand. "'I've heard about Jared, if that's what you were about to tell me. My mother wrote me as soon as she heard. Garin's mother lived in a convent near Thentia now, but she still had many friends in Hullberg.' She'd heard about Jared only a few days after the shield-sworn captain had been found dead on the high fells. Her letter had reached Garin in Tantras half a month ago, and he'd left for Hullberg within the day. "'I'm sorry, sir,' Colton said. "'I knew he was a good friend of yours. He was a good captain, too. We miss him sorely.' They stood without speaking for a moment. The wind moaned across the stone battlements, and the castle's banners crackled sharply. Garin shivered in the cold, and he glanced down to Hamel. The halfling waited patiently, his cloak held tight around his body. "'Forgive me,' Garin said. "'Sergeant, this is my friend and comrade-in-arms, Hamel Alderhart of Tantris. He's a guest of the house.' 
"'Of course, sir,' Colton said. "'Leave your baggage here, gentlemen. "'I'll have it brought up to your rooms shortly.' "'Thank you, Colton.' "'Garin set down his duffel and worked his shoulder a moment. "'One more thing. "'Hamill and I ran across some trouble in the tailings on our way here. "'A gang of crimson chains led by some fellow calling himself Raldo "'tried to extort a toll from us.' "'We objected,' said Hamill. "'Hard words followed, and there may have been a minor stabbing or two. "'And, yes, we crossed steel. "'We didn't kill any of them. "'But I thought the shield-sworn should know.' "'The sergeant grimaced. "'You meant Raldo, hey? "'I'm sorry to hear it. "'But I'll not shed a tear over any cuts or bruises you gave him. "'He and his thugs have been causing trouble in the tailings for months now. "'Why haven't you rusted them out, then?' It's got to be murder or arson before we do, my lord. We're down to a hundred and ninety shields sworn, and that ain't really enough to garrison Griffin Watch, man the post towers, and keep a patrol or two out in the high fells. We leave the keeping of the law in the town to the council watch. The Harmax men only get involved when it's a matter of high justice. Garin looked sharply at Colton. He thought he'd heard the sergeant well enough, but there was very little that made sense to him. One hundred and ninety shields sworn. The Harmax guards should have been twice as strong, and he'd never heard of any council watch. That had to be something new. A town full of foreign merchants, gangs roaming the streets, and now this. It seemed that he had a lot of catching up to do, and suddenly Garin doubted he'd enjoy his education very much. A number of questions sprang to mind, but he settled for just one more. Who or what is the council watch? The law keepers who answer to the merchant council. Colton's blunt face didn't move much, but his voice had a flat, hard tone. They look after council matters and enforce low justice in the city proper, so that we shield sworn don't have to trouble ourselves with such business. Or, so I'm told. If they let the crimson chains walk the streets in the open— "'They can't be very good at their jobs,' Hamill remarked to Garin. "'Either they're hopelessly incompetent, or they're paid not to notice such things. "'I know which side of that bed I'd cover.' "'Who do I talk to in order to set the watch on the chainsmen?' Garin asked. "'Colton snorted. "'Captain Zara, down at Council Hall. "'But you shouldn't expect much, my lord. "'It seems to take a long time for Zara to be certain enough of the facts "'to bring charges against someone.' especially if that someone happens to be on a guild or a house payroll. Maybe it would be different if you said something. You're akin to the Harmac, after all. I'll bring it up with my uncle. Ten days of hard travel were catching up with him, and the whole sorry mess just left Garin tired, with the beginnings of a headache. He glanced up at the banners flying above the gatehouse. The highest was a blue banner with a white seven-pointed star, by the traditions of Griffin Watch, it flew only when the Lord of Hullberg was actually present. Is there any reason I can't see him now? None at all, Colton answered. He looked over to his companion. Orndal, you've got the gate watch. Call Cerisi from the guard room to take my place, and send word to the Chamberlain that Lord Garin's returned with a guest. Lord Garin, I'll show you to the Harmac. Garin nodded, and the shield sworn sergeant led him and Hamill across the courtyard to a wide set of stone steps, climbing up between barracks, stables, armories, and storehouses of the shield sworn. In Garin's experience, a third or more of the soldiers were posted in various watchtowers and patrols along Hullberg's northern marches at any given time, keeping watch for orc raids and spell-warped monsters out of the far north. Others would be on leave, staying with families down in the town, or carousing in the taverns and alehouses. Either way, most of the barracks rooms were dark and empty. Hamill studied it all with interest as they followed the guardsmen. "'I know that the Harmac, Grigor, is your uncle,' he said to Garin. "'Who else lives here?' "'Grigor's daughter-in-law, Erna, and her children.' Erna is the widow of my cousin Isselmar, Grigor's son. He was killed in a duel about four years ago. I suppose Natali and Kerr are the Harmax heirs now, but they're still quite young. They came to a second courtyard above the barracks and storehouses, 
where a large hall stood. Colton trotted up the steps and opened the heavy wooden doors for them. The room beyond was a banquet hall and what served as the Harmac's audience chamber. It was rather plain by the standards of the southern cities, and wind whistled through some unseen draft high up near the rafters. My Aunt Tarina lives here, too, Garin continued. She is Grigor's sister. And your father was Grigor's brother? Yes, Tarina has two children, my cousin Kara and Sergan, who is her stepson by her second marriage. Hamel nodded. His people were very particular about relations. He sorted out family trees and remembered them with an uncanny ease, a useful advantage in the complicated dealings and rivalries of mercantile tantras. Garin, on the other hand, had long since learned that he could never keep straight who was related to whom. He had to rely on notes in a journal. It was one more reason he appreciated Hamel as a business partner. "'Lady Kara rode out to the Raven Hill Watchtower earlier today,' Sergeant Colton said. "'She may not be back tonight. Sergan spends most of his time at his villa out on East Head, but he's here now. This way, gentlemen.' They climbed a staircase at the end of the hall, where two more shield-sworn waited. Colton spoke briefly with them. Garin did not know either man well, but they recognized him and welcomed him home. And then the sergeant led them up another flight of stairs into the third portion of the castle. This was not a true bailey, but simply a small courtyard crowning the hill. The buildings here comprised the Hullmaster residence, and so visitors were not normally permitted to pass beyond the large hall and kitchens below without an invitation or escort. The courtyard was circled by a roofed gallery linking several small buildings, a chapel, a library, a small kitchen, and the Harmax Tower itself, which was a good-sized stone keep sited on the highest point of the hilltop. One moment. Colton said. He knocked on the library door and entered. Garin and Hamel waited for a short time in the courtyard until the sergeant reappeared. The Harmac will see you now. Thank you, Colton, Garin answered. The stocky sergeant briefly inclined his head, which passed for a bow in Hullberg. It's good to see you home, sir. Drawing a deep breath, Garin led himself into the castle library. It was a small, cluttered space, really, but it did hold the largest collection of books for nearly fifty miles. It also served as the Harmac study. When Garin thought of his uncle, he imagined him in that very room. He remembered the smell from his childhood, the musty odor of damp paper and the sharper scent of pipe smoke. He and Hamel passed through the small foyer and stepped into the study proper. "'Uncle Grigor?' he said. "'Well, this is an unexpected surprise.' Grigor Hullmaster sat behind a cluttered desk by a large window of leaded glass. He was a man of seventy-five years, tall and thin, stooped at the shoulder, with little hair remaining on his head, except for a thin fringe that ran from the back of one ear to the back of the other. A knob-handled walking-stick leaned against his chair, and his eyes were weak and watery. He pushed himself to his feet and peered at Garin. "'Is that really you, Garin? How long has it been since you set foot in Griffin Watch? Garin came close and took his uncle's hand. A cold tremble weakened the Harmac's grip. Eight years, last summer, uncle. Not since your father's death, then. Your journeys in the south must have taken you to strange and far lands indeed. But, as they say, the traveller who walks the farthest yearns the most for home. I am glad to see you again, Garin. The older man beamed and turned his attention to Hamel. And who is this lad? Lad? Hamel demanded silently of Garin. To his credit, the halfling kept his outrage from his face. This is my friend and comrade, Hamel Alderhart, Uncle Grigor. He is a halfling of the Chondlewood, lately of Tantras. He and I were both members of the company of the Dragon Shield, and together we run the Red Sail Coster of Tantras. He claims to be thirty-two years of age. 
A halfling, Grigor looked closer and shook his head. I beg your pardon, good sir. I mean no disrespect. My eyesight is not as keen as it once was. Hamel forced a smile and bowed graciously. Think nothing of it, he grated. The harmac does not look well, Garin thought. Grigor had never been a vigorous man, really. He was industrious and well-read, but he had spent his life working with his head, not his hands, and he had never cared much for travel. As a young man, a fall from a horse had left him with a badly broken hip that even the cleric's healing spells had never been able to repair completely. In cold, damp weather, something Hulberg had no shortage of at any time of the year, it pained the old man greatly. Does he ever leave Griffin Watch any more? Garin wondered. The steps must be difficult for him to manage. So you must have heard about Jared, Grigor said quietly. Ill news carries swiftly and far, it seems. I heard about it in Tantras. I've come home to pay my respects. It's a terrible thing, Garin. Jared was a good man, a good captain to the shield, sworn, a valued adviser, and a friend as well. I still can't believe that he is dead. The Harmac sighed and passed his hand over his face. Can you tell me what happened? How did Jared die? No one but his murderers could say for certain. He was found out in the high fells, near one of the old barrows. He was alone. I know Kara rode out to study the scene. She could probably tell you more. I'll ask her when I see her, then. Grigor nodded. Would you be staying long? I don't know. Garin hadn't intended to, but standing in the old castle, listening to the cold, hard wind, and breathing in the sights and sounds and smells of home, he found that old memories were pressing close around him. Strange how he had never let his footsteps turn toward Hullberg in the long months since that last day in Myth Dranor. What was I avoiding, he wondered. Perhaps he had allowed himself to become bewitched in Myth Dranor, as Hamel thought. But that was over. He had lost that long, waking dream that was his life for four years in the city of the elves, ending it in one dark moment he still did not understand. His heart longed for autumn in Myth Dranor, for Allier's musical laughter, but those things were not for him any longer. Garin closed his eyes to drive the image of her face from his mind, castigating himself in silence. It did his heart no good to dwell on her, but he seemed determined to anyway. He must have frowned at himself. Grigor took his expression for disapproval and raised his hand. I only meant that you're welcome to stay as long as you like, the old lord said. There is always room for you here, Garin. Forgive me, it's been a long journey, Garin answered. He mustered a small smile for his uncle. I have no business in Tantras that can't manage itself for a ten-day or so. As long as I'm here, I might as well reacquaint myself with my kin. Good, said Grigor. But Garin, please be careful. The Harmax writ doesn't run so far as it used to in Hullberg. There are people in town who owe the Hullmasters no allegiance at all, much more so than when you were growing up. It was no accident when Isselmar was killed in that tavern quarrel, and I suspect that it was no accident that Jared died alone out in the high fells. When you set foot outside of Griffinwatch's walls, you must watch your back. Hamel sketched a small bow. "'That's why I'm here, Lord Grigor,' he observed. "'I have no use for a dead partner, so it's in my interest to keep an eye on him. Why else would I venture so far from civilization?' Grigor smiled, but his tone was serious. "'If you are a friend of the Hullmaster's Master Alderheart, you may need to watch your own back as well.' He looked back up to Garin and indicated to the study door. "'Now on to happier matters.' Unless I am sorely mistaken, you have two young cousins who will be quite anxious to meet you. I expect they're in the great room, resisting their mother's efforts to put them to bed. 
The old lord took a mantle from a hook by the door, pulled it around his shoulders, and with the help of his short walking stick, made his way to the covered walkway and court outside. Garin and Hamel followed. The wind sighed and hissed among the eaves of the old castle's buildings, and the lanterns illuminating the way rocked in the breeze. Small yellow pools of light swayed and spun lazily beneath the wooden shakes. "'I've been meaning to have this enclosed,' Grigor remarked. "'It's a cold walk on a winter night.' Then he led them into the small tower fronting the high court, a simple square, low building, of somewhat sturdier construction than the rest of the castle's upper works. But as the harmac reached for the door, it opened from the inside, and a dark-eyed man with a pointed black goatee and a crimson cape emerged, two armsmen at his shoulders. "'Ah, good evening, uncle,' the dark-eyed man said with a small nod. "'I was just—' Then his eyes fell on Garin and widened for an instant. He smiled slowly and deliberately and let out a small snort. "'Well, I'll be damned. Look at what the wind's blown up against our doorstep. Cousin Garin, you are the last thing I expected to see when I opened this door.' "'Sergan,' Garin replied. "'You look well.' His step-cousin, if there was such a thing, he wondered was in truth dressed quite well, with a red gold-embroidered doublet, tall black boots of fine leather, and a gold-hilted rapier at his belt. In fact, he looked more like a merchant prince of Sembia or the Vast than a son of a northerly Hullberg. Garin remembered Sergan as a sullen, brooding young man, quick to find fault and take offence. But the man before him stood sharp-eyed and alert, brimming with self-confidence. Uh, this is Hamel Alderhart, my friend and business partner. Hamel, this is my cousin, Sergen Hullmaster. The halfling inclined his head. I'm pleased to meet you, sir. Likewise, Sergen replied, but his eyes quickly returned to Garin's. He stroked his pointed beard and his brow furrowed. I haven't seen you in years, Garin. So where have you been keeping yourself? Tantras, mostly. Hamel and I are proprietors of the Red Sail Coster, dealing in the trade between Termish and the Vast. Timber, silverwork, wool, linen. Ah, of course, I've heard of it. But why did I think that you were staying in Myth Drunner? Garin frowned. The question seemed innocuous, but he sensed a hidden stiletto in Sergan's voice. I lived there for four years— but, as it happened, I left about a year ago. Sergan's eyes widened. Ah, that's right. I remember hearing something about that. A duel of some kind. Love spurned, a rival suitor maimed. Some sordid tale ending in your exile from the elf kingdom. Tell me, Garin, is any of that true? Garin stood in silence a long moment before he answered. All of it. Sardonic humor danced in Sergan's dark eyes. "'Indeed. I would not have believed it if you hadn't said so.' The rakish noble smiled to himself and reached out to clap a comradely hand on Garin's shoulder. "'Well, I am eager to hear your side of the story, cousin. I am certain there were extenuating circumstances. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a late dinner engagement this evening, and I must be going. Garin, you must promise me that you won't leave town without a good long visit.' Sergan nodded to Harmac Grigor before he swept away across the bailey, his bodyguards in tow. Grigor watched him leave. "'A capable man, your cousin Sergan,' he mused aloud. "'Clever and ambitious. He has grand designs for Hullberg. If only half of what he means to attempt works out, we will be well on our way to becoming a great city again.' But he has a cruel turn to his heart, I fear. The dreams of a dragon, Hamel said silently. We know his type well, don't we? Tantras, Calant, Procamper are full of such men. But Hullberg isn't, Garin thought, or at least it never used to be. The Harmac shook himself and motioned to the door. 
"'No reason to stand here in the cold,' the old man said. "'Come, Garin, you must see your young cousins Natali and Kerr. "'They've heard quite a few stories about the Hullmaster who's off seeing the wide world. "'You are something of a marvel to them, even if you don't know it.' "'The sword-mage pulled his gaze away from his cousin's back. "'He had a feeling that he would see more of Sergen soon enough, "'whether he wanted to or not. "'Instead, he summoned a wry smile for his uncle.' "'I'm no marvel, but I suppose I have seen some marvelous things in my travels,' he said. "'I'll try not to disappoint them.' Three, twelve Chess, the Year of the Ageless One Two hours before sunset the orc hold began to stir. Warriors rose from their pallets, stretching and yawning, heavy canines gleaming yellow in the dim light. Females stoked the cook-fires, fed the livestock, and began their long round of drudgery and toil. The young scurried about underfoot, fetching water and firewood, emptying chamber-pots, and tending to the scraggly goats, sheep, and fowl penned within the crudely built fortress. Orcs disliked the brightest hours of the day, and therefore the hold took its rest from shortly after sunrise to the late afternoon. Only the scouts, the sentries, and those young given the job of minding the herds in the fields nearby stayed awake through the bright hours of morning and midday. The war chief, Murren, roused himself from his sleeping furs and his women, and pulled a short hauberk of heavy steel rings over his thick, well-muscled torso. He usually rose before most of his warriors, since he had a strong streak of human blood in him, and he found the daylight less bothersome than most of his tribe did. Among the bloody skulls, a warrior was judged by his strength, his fierceness, and his wits. Human ancestry was no blemish against a warrior, provided he was every bit as strong, enduring, and bloodthirsty as his full-blooded kin. Half-orcs, who were weaker than their orc comrades, didn't last long among the bloody skulls, or any other orc tribe, for that matter. But it was often true that a bit of human blood gave a warrior just the right mix of cunning, ambition, and self-discipline to go far indeed, as Murren had. He was master of a tribe that could muster two thousand spears, and the strongest chief in Thar. Yvelda sat up when he threw off the furs. She was his favorite wife, a tigress with more human than orc in her, much like himself. Slender as a switch of willow by the standards of most of the tribe's women, she made up for her small size and clean features with cat-like reflexes and pure, fierce intensity. With a knife in her hand, she was more deadly than many male warriors twice her weight. Even when he took her to the sleeping furs, Murren never really let his guard down around her. She cuffed his two lesser wives, Sutha and Kansif, awake. "'Rise, you two, Ivelda said. "'See to the kitchens and make sure our guests are looked after. "'They judge our husband by the table you set. "'Do not disappoint me.' The junior wives scrambled quickly out of the furs. Ivelda had shown more than once that she was quick to beat one— the other, or both, if she had to repeat herself. Kansif was a young, full-blooded girl, who was thoroughly cowed by the half-orc woman and desperate to please her. Sutha, on the other hand, Sutha was an older and far more cunning woman, the first of the three to have shared Murren's furs and a strong-willed priestess in her own right. She was a strong, fit, mixed-blood, who was not at all happy about having been supplanted by Yvelda as Murren's favorite. The chieftain guessed that Sutha was well along in several plots against Yvelda, but it wouldn't do to intervene. If the favorite couldn't keep the lesser wives in their place, then she wasn't fit to be the favorite, was she? As she left, Sutha brushed by him with a sly smile and let her hand trail over the thick mail of his broad chest, moving just quickly enough to deprive Yvelda of a reason to chastise her. Murren grinned in appreciation as he watched his lesser wives dress themselves and hurry from his chambers. 
Then he moved over to the slit-like window and brushed the heavy curtain out of the way. The day was bright, and faint hints of green growth speckled the gray hills and moorlands surrounding Bloodskull Hold. Thar was a hard land, barely suitable for a few scrawny herds of livestock, but with the coming of spring the passes would soon open, and he'd be able to send hunting parties to the mountain vales and the open stepland beyond. It would be good for his warriors to have something to do. Too many of his orcs were growing bored and restless after the long winter, and that usually spelled trouble. He glanced to his left and scowled. The camp of the Vossens was still there, perched in the shelter of a rocky tor a quarter mile from the hold's walls. In the center of the human's tents stood a small tower of iron, summoned up out of nothing at all by the Vossen lord's magic. The humans had shown his tribe every respect, sending fine gifts ahead of their emissaries, and his scouts had counted an escort of almost two hundred spears for the lord they sent to speak to him, a sign of the man's importance. But the fact remained that if negotiations were to take an ugly turn, he was not sure that he could drive the Vassen company away from his keep, not with the sort of magic the black-clad humans evidently commanded. "'What do they want with me?' he growled. Yvelda stretched out atop the firs, deliberately not covering herself, to remind him why she was his favorite. She answered him, even though he had not meant the question for her. "'You will find out soon enough,' she said in her throaty purr. "'But if you must guess, then ask yourself this. "'What does the Vossen lack?' "'Murrin grimaced in annoyance. "'Along with her straight, smooth limbs and dusky beauty, "'Yvelda's human blood blessed her with the same sort of fiery ambition "'and quick curiosity he himself possessed.' She had a mind every bit as sharp as his own, and seemed to feel that entitled her to help him rule over the bloody skulls. In truth, Yvelda might just be clever, strong, and ruthless enough to govern the tribe without him, but it was rare indeed for any woman, no matter how exceptional, to rule as queen over orc warriors. "'He's here to bribe me to attack the Skull Smashers,' he guessed. They stupid ogres don't have enough sense to leave the Vassans alone, so they send this man Terov to find my price for an alliance against King Gold and his band of dimwits. What price would you demand for your aid? Gold, furs, wine, good steel, and some assurance that the Vassans will actually fight. I'll be damned if I let my warriors get mashed to bloody pulp by the ogres while the Vassans sit back and watch us kill each other. Yvelda rolled over onto her belly and looked up at him. It depends which warriors, doesn't it? I can think of a couple I wouldn't be sorry to lose. Murren barked a short, harsh laugh. True enough. The warriors grow restless, and it would be good to find someone to fight. My berserkers are ready to turn on each other, but I can't let the tribe think the Vossens played me for a fool. That would look weak. He reached out and slapped her shapely flank. I go to see what he thinks my price is. He buckled on his weapon harness and padded out of his den. Six fierce warriors, with the elaborate facial scarring of the skull guard, waited for him. They grounded the butts of their spears against the stone and shouted, Kai, Kai, when Murren appeared. Without another word, they fell in around him and escorted him through the keep's tortuous passageways and cramped guard chambers, brutally striking and shouldering aside any who got in their way. Murren was as sure of their loyalty as he could be. He made sure that his personal guards freely plundered the rest of the tribe. Should anything ever happen to him, the warriors of the Skull Guard would not long survive his demise. And, just to be sure, years ago he'd had Sutha lay fearsome curses and compulsions on each Skull Guard with her priestess magic. But Sutha was likely not very pleased with him at the moment, not as long as Ivelda was first among his wives. 
he would be wise to have one of the battle sorcerers or priests of Graumpsch test the spells that ensured his guard's loyalty. If, of course, he could find a spellcaster older than Sutha that he trusted. No matter, he told himself. The game was to remain chief as long as he could. Father a son, strong enough to succeed him, and try not to kill the whelp, or let the whelp kill him, before he was ready. But that day was still many long years off. The war chief marched into the keep's great hall, a long, low-ceilinged room with thick pillars holding up a simple masonry vault. Four heavy braziers full of red-glowing coals illuminated the room. The walls were bedecked with the trophies the tribe had taken over the years, the crudely preserved skulls of hundreds of enemies steeped in a crimson dye so that they always looked as if they were fresh and gory. Dwarves, humans, goblins, orcs, ogres, gnolls, even a handful of giants, all were represented among the dangling bones. The tribe's priests knew the story of each one. Some were mighty enemies the bloody skulls had bested. Some were enemies known to have fallen beneath the axe or spear of a legendary blood-skull chief or champion. But most expressed contempt, not respect. The skulls of women and children taken near places such as Glister or Hullberg or Thentia cluttered the walls, mocking enemies too weak to defend their families and homesteads from blood-skull raids. Scores of orc warriors and their women slept in this room, and they were just beginning to stir when Murren and his guards made their appearance. Kai, the war chief, the war chief! shouted the skull guards as they kicked and prodded careless orcs out of the way. Murren threw himself into the throne-like seat on its dais at the end of the hall, one hand resting on a short sword at his side. More than once he'd been attacked in that very seat, and he'd learned to keep steel close at hand. He surveyed the warriors in the hall for a moment, and spotted one that would do. "'Here, Earth, take five spears and bring the Vasan,' he commanded. "'Tell him that I summon him, and that I am ready to hear him out. Give him time to make himself ready, and let him bring two hands of bodyguards if he wants.' If he wants more than that, tell him no. Come back if he refuses. Hewerth, a young war leader, nodded. I go, war chief, he said. Despite his youth, he was quite clever and patient, a rare combination. He gathered five warriors from his band and led them from the hall. Hewerth was smart enough to ignore almost any offense the humans might give, as long as he was doing Murren's bidding. Others among the Bloodskull war leaders and berserkers simply couldn't have walked into that camp without finding some mortal quarrel with a human who met the eye too long, or looked away too quickly, or turned his back, or found some new way to invite a battle. Murren composed himself to wait, brooding with his chin on his fist as he studied the warriors watching him. There was a small commotion off to his right, and the war-priest Tangar appeared with his group of acolytes. To become a priest of Graumsh, he who watches, a priest had to pluck out an eye, so Tangar and his followers each wore a thick leather patch stitched to cheek and brow. Evidently the war-priest had hurried from his chambers, for his acolytes were still busy fitting his armor plate to him as he strode into the room. Doubtless Tangar could not abide the idea of Murren holding court without him present. "'You send for the Vasan? the clerk demanded. The war-chief frowned. "'I will hear him out, priest,' he answered. He didn't like the idea of Graumpsch priest hovering over his shoulder, but there was little he could do about it. He decided to occupy himself by tending to a chief's duties, and looked to the nearest skull-guard. "'I will hold judgment,' he said. "'Does any warrior here have a quarrel to lay before me?' A hale, scar-faced warrior came forward and dropped his spear on the floor. "'I will speak,' he growled. "'I am Berthar.' "'I see you, Berthar,' Murren replied. "'You have set down your spear. Speak.' 
But Urthar nodded and spoke briefly, explaining how another warrior's young sons had shirked their shepherding duties, resulting in the loss of two of his own sheep. I say that Galsh must give me two of his sheep, since his lazy sons were careless of mine. Galsh says that the missing sheep were likely taken by a red tiger, and he owes me nothing. What is your judgment, chief? Marin had to judge over quarrels just like this every day. If a strong chief didn't, one of the orcs in the quarrel would just kill the other, and the brothers or sons of the dead warrior would kill in return, and before long the hold would run red with the blood of the feuding orcs. Galsh, the other warrior, wasn't at Blood Skull Keep, so Murrin decided against him. Hear my word, all of you. Until someone finds some sign of this tiger, Galsh must give two of his sheep to Berurthar. Now pick up your spear and go. The veteran retrieved his spear, grinning in vindication. Murrin doubted that any tiger had made off with the missing sheep, but he did not want to accuse a warrior who was not in front of him of stealing the other's livestock. He heard two more quarrels between his warriors. Then Hewerth and his followers returned to the great hall. Before them strode a tall human in armor of ebon plate, his face hidden beneath a black helm that was fitted with gilded ram's horns curling from the sides. A single servant in a tunic and cloak of dark gray followed, a human woman who wore her reddish hair cut short in a warrior's manner. She had a light mask of black across her eyes, but her face was otherwise bare. Six Vassan knights in fine black mail guarded them. Murrin motioned with his hand, and the orcs before his throne shuffled out of the way, making space for the humans to approach him. The Vassan lord was confident enough. He strode through the ranks of orc warriors filling the room, as if he couldn't care less that he'd just put fifty spears at his back should Murrin decide to have him killed. The black knight halted a few feet before the throne and reached up to remove his helm. Beneath his helmet the man had pale skin, hair of iron gray, and a clean-shaven face. His eyes were a deep, bloody crimson. "'You are War Chief Murrin?' the man asked, in passable orcish. "'I am Murrin. Who are you, Vassan? And what do you want with the bloody skulls?' "'I am Cardell Teroff, and Felthane of the Warlock Knights, and I am here to offer you power, War Chief, the power to make yourself the king of all Thar. Every tribe in this land will call you master and do as you bid them.' "'Why are already the strongest tribe in Thar?' Tangar the priest shouted angrily. "'Who dares to make war against us? No one, human!' Fanaticism was occasionally useful, Murrin reflected. The cleric saved him the trouble of raising his own voice. He held up his hand to restrain the priest from speaking further, since he did not really want to provoke a fight with the Vassans without at least finding out why they were here. "'Power?' "'What power?' Murrin sneered. "'I can deliver to you the burning daggers, the skull-smashers, and the red claws,' Terov said. "'They will call you lord, pay you tribute, and march as you command. I can arm your warriors with a thousand hauberks of good steel mail. I can give you ten warlock knights to wield their battle magic in your service. And I have control over a number of strong monsters from the high mountains.' Manticores, giants, chimeras, even a young dragon or two, they will be yours to command. Tell me, War Chief Murrin, what would you do with an army such as that? Murrin laughed harshly. Raise Glister, smash Halberg and Flan, lay Thentia and Melvaunt under tribute. And if you give us warships too— I suppose we might cross the Moon Sea and burn Mithdranor while we're at it. Why not? The warlock knight's mouth twisted in a cold smile. I don't think we'll have to burn the elves out of their forest yet. But as for the rest, so be it. The cities you named I will give to you to sack or enslave as you wish. They are not yours to give away, human. 
No, but they are yours to take, chief of the bloody skulls. Glister, you might manage without my help. Perhaps Hullberg, too. But the others are beyond your strength. I can change that. Are you interested? Or shall I go to Gold of the Skull Smashers, or Kroshk of the Red Claws, and make one of them king in your place? The war chief's laughter died in his throat. Murren leaned forward in his throne and scowled at the Vassen. You mock me, Vassen, he said slowly. Assume laws, and make one of them king in your place. The war chief's laughter died in his throat. Murren leaned forward in his throne and scowled at the Vassen. You mock me, Vassen, he said slowly. Assuming you can do all that you say, why would you? What price do you demand? Cardell Teroff glanced at the crowded audience chamber and switched to the human tongue. I am told you understand, Vassen, but few of your warriors do, he said in that language. My price is an oath of fealty to the high circle of fell thanes sworn on my iron ring. You come into my keep and expect me to bend my knee to you? Murren hissed in the human language. He surged up from his seat and seized a spear from the nearest of his skull guards. With a fierce cry, he hurled the weapon with all the strength of his rage right at the Vassen's heart. The heavy iron-shod spear flashed through the air, striking Terov in the center of his chest, and rebounded, shattered into kindling. The warlock knight staggered back a step and grunted from the sheer mass of the spear, but he was otherwise unhurt. Murren's sudden fury abandoned him. He knew his own strength. Thrown at ten paces, the spear should have transfixed the human, and carried two feet or more through his back. But instead, the weapon had snapped like a dry twig. The surrounding orcs roared in anger and astonishment at the sorcery revealed in their midst. Some recoiled in fear while others rushed forward to drown the Vassens in a black tide of stabbing blades before any more magic could be used. But the black-veiled woman behind the warlock knight quickly slashed her hand across her body and hissed a few words in some sibilant language. A racing wind-blast of ebon flames appeared around the Vassen party, howling and swirling as it walled the bloody skull warriors away from the humans. A warrior in the back of the room threw another spear, but it was caught by the sorceress's black flames and burned to ash in midair. "'Hold your warriors, Murren!' Terov shouted. "'We are protected by powerful magic, and any who approach will be killed!' Murren was sorely tempted to put the Vassen's threat to the test, but somehow he found the last vestige of his patience. He could always order his warriors to fall on the humans later, but clearly Terov wanted to talk, and he'd been respectful enough of Murren's strength to protect himself with magic before entering the audience chamber. The war chief motioned to the warriors, filling the room, and said, "'Hold, warriors. We will see how long their spells last.' The bloody skulls gnashed their fangs and growled in frustration. But they obeyed, slowly edging away from the whirling black firestorm. A forest of spear points surrounded the small party of Vassens, waiting for the black veiled woman's spell to show any signs of weakening. Murren turned his attention back to Terov and said, I do not know how long your woman's spells will last, but if you want to leave this room alive, convince me to spare you before they fail. Choose your next words with care, Vassen. Terov held up his fist in reply. A heavy iron band carved with dire runes encircled his ring finger. Do you know what this is? he said in Vassen. Your ring, Murren snarled. He'd heard stories of the warlock knights and their peculiar methods for ensuring obedience. It was said that an iron ring could not be removed once the warrior put it on of his own free will. What of it? Everyone knows that warlock knights all wear one. It is a pact ring, 
I am bound by what I swear, and he who swears to me is bound too. If you take me for your liege, you will be accounted a lord of Vasem, and I will give you a ring of your own so that you may bind others to their oaths. Yes, you will rule in the name of the warlock knights. You will send me warriors when I ask you to, and you will render to me the yearly tithes your oath demands. Those are the things a vassal lord owes his liege. But in turn I will be obliged to come when you call, to honor the laws and judgments you levy on your lands, and to respect the vassal oaths you extract from others. And perhaps, most importantly, what you conquer in my name you will keep. Terov let his hand fall to his side and paused, measuring Murren's reaction. The half-orc chief glared at him, but said nothing. So the Vasen continued, "'Today I offer you Thar, but with the power I can give to you, the whole of the Moon Sea North will be yours to govern as you see fit, with only a few small exceptions.' "'Ha! Huh, I thought so.' Murren bared his fangs. "'All right, then. What small exceptions do you have in mind?' The warlock knight shrugged. "'If I take some city or town under my protection, you may not sack it. I will levy suitable tribute against it and pay you your due. But once my word is given to someone else, I will not permit you to break it.' Murren returned to his throne and sat down again. It would be easy to tell this Cardell Terov no, or, better yet, have his warriors draw and quarter the man for his impudence. If, in fact, they could overcome the powerful magic the Vassans evidently wielded. On the other hand, if Terov made good on his offer, Murren would be the strongest chief for hundreds of miles around. "'tribes such as the Skull Smashers or the Red Claws, "'as his vassals instead of his enemies, "'would give him enough power to dominate Thar "'and any city within a ten days' march, "'and the ability to demand unbreakable oaths "'from those around him would be useful indeed. "'What does the human offer us, war chief? "'the priest Tangar asked. "'Does... He insult us. I will gladly spill his blood on the altar of the Mighty One. Murren ignored him and spoke to Terov. I claim the land from the giant's cairn to Salaspran, and Glister to the sea as my kingdom, he said. It was a broad definition of Thar, broad indeed, but Terov nodded. And before I agree to your terms, you will give me a sign of your sincerity— the arms and armor you mentioned, and the services of the Skull Smashers and the monsters at your command, so that I can raise the town of Glister. When Glister falls to the bloody skulls, then I will know that you speak truth, and you and I will swear oaths together. Murren leaned back, satisfied with himself. If the Vasen's promises failed to materialize, well, then he wouldn't take Glister. And if Teroff was as good as his word, and Glister fell into Bloodskull hands, on that day Murren could decide whether he wanted to swear any oath or not. It had been a long time since any orc had been called the King of Thar, and if he brought about Glister's destruction, he would be the greatest of Thar's chiefs in centuries. Maybe a king, indeed. "'It is fair,' Cardell Teroff allowed. "'But you will be obligated to me, King Murren, "'if I give you your arms and armor and glister as well.' "'He bowed slightly and straightened. "'In Orkish he said, "'I will arrange for the arms to be sent from Vasa by the end of the ten day, "'and a warlock knight will come in the next day or two to serve you. "'He will relay your commands to the giants and the other monsters "'who will answer your call.' Murren stood and descended the steps of the dais, approaching the human as closely as he dared, with the sorcerous black flames flickering around the Vassans. He stared closely into the man's face, trying to read something of his intentions. Cardell Teroff returned his gaze without blinking. "'As you say, then,' the war chief said. "'But 
Tell me one more thing. Why are you interested in Thar? What do you gain by making me your ally? Cardell Terov offered a small smile. Vasa is a landlocked country, he answered. Impassable mountains surround our land on all sides save the southeast, and there the land of Damara stands astride our natural path of expansion. Most of my peers have their eyes fixed on the conquest of Damara, but I am more patient than they are. I believe Vasa will grow more quickly by opening up trade with the lands of the west and filling our coffers with gold. The Moon Sea is only forty miles from our southern plains. Should I secure a safe trading route across the mountains and moors of Thar to Hullberg, or Thentia, or Melvaunt, I would vastly enrich my land. To do that, I need a single strong chieftain in Thar, who can guard Vasan trade from any other chieftain or monster that might be tempted to interfere. And I am the chieftain you have chosen for this? Honor? The bloody skulls are my first choice, but I will raise up another chief and another tribe if I have to. I am willing to pay that chieftain very well indeed for serving my purpose, but in turn I will demand loyalty. Terov's eyes were as cold as stone. Our oaths of fealty are inescapable, King Murren, both from lord to liege and liege to lord. You will help to make Vasa rich, and in turn we will help you to build up a kingdom that will last for centuries, not a single lifetime. Murren thought for a long moment. His eyes narrowed. Very well, he finally said, returning to Orkish so his warriors could understand him. I do not trust you, Vasen, but there may be something in what you promise me. I will weigh the truth of your words at the walls of Glister. Four, twelve chess, the year of the ageless one. When the clock tower in the assayer's house struck nine, Garin left Griffin Watch and descended the winding causeway to the town. Morning mists lingered in the lower streets, but the sunshine was bright and clear overhead. The fierce wind had finally died away, and the day promised to be mild and fair by the standards of the moon sea spring. He'd left Hamel to look after himself for the morning. The halfling intended to spend the day looking into red sail business. Garin was content to leave it to Hamel for now, since he intended to put every street in the town under his boots at some point during the day. He wanted to see everything that was new or different, or simply missing in Hullberg, and more importantly, he wanted to see everything that had stayed the same. He had exhausted his memories in the years he had been away, and he needed to collect the familiar sights and sounds and voices again. Garin breathed deeply and threw his shoulders back as he walked, enjoying the cool, fresh air. He'd spent a good two hours of the previous evening reacquainting himself with his young cousins, Natalie and Kerr, before their mother had ushered them off to bed. And not a moment too soon, because he was almost reeling from exhaustion by the time Erna put an end to their endless questioning. Natalie was a slender girl of ten years who took after her father, Isselmar. She had the black, straight hair of the hull-masters and a cat-quick sense of curiosity. Kerr was a rambunctious young fellow of seven, whose reddish-gold hair favored his mother, Erna. Unlike his older sister, he seemed more inclined to measure his world by trying to break it one piece at a time. And, as Grigor had warned him, they wanted to know everything about every place he'd ever been and anything he'd ever done that might be considered adventurous, magical, or dangerous. Isselmar would be proud of them both, Garin reflected. It was a heartbreak and a shame that they'd lost their father while so young. But that was hardly an uncommon thing in the Moonsea lands. Wars, monsters, feuds, and hard toil in hard lands orphaned many children and left most of those in much grimmer circumstances. At least Natalie and Kerr had their mother and their father's kinfolk to look after them, as well as a castle full of men and women sworn to the Hullmaster's service. 
As far as he could tell, the servants and maids who worked in the castle loved the two young hallmasters as if Natalie and Kerr were their very own children. He reached the bottom of the causeway, which was a small square called the Harmac's Foot. Mule-drawn wagons clattered over the cobblestones, a steady stream passing both north and south. Those heading north were bound for the mining and woodcutting camps beyond the Winter Spear Vale, with provisions of all kinds. Salted meat, sacks of flour, casks of ale, wheels of cheese, blankets, tools, all the things that men living out in the field would need. Those heading south were coming into town from the valley farms. At that time of year, all they had were eggs, dairy goods, and meat to sell in the town's markets. It would be months before the summer crops came in. He didn't recognize any of the drivers heading out to the work camps. If their accents and manner of dress were any guide, most were from other Moon Sea cities. He saw more Mulmasterites and Melvontians, and even a few Tessians. Garin shook his head, struck again by how crowded the town seemed. "'Well, where to?' he asked himself. He thought for a moment, then struck out north along the Vale Road. Once he left the Harmac's foot, the area between Griffin Watch and the Winterspear reverted to old, brush-covered rubble, with only a few buildings standing amid the remains of the old city. Most of the living town clustered close to the harbor, and the northern and western districts of old Hullberg remained ruins except for the best sites, such as the Troll and Tankard, a tap house on the edge of town. When the Vale Road finally emerged from the ruins of old Hullberg and headed north into the Winterspear farmlands, Garin turned west to the burned bridge. Centuries ago, a fine and strong bridge had crossed the Winterspear on five stone piers. In Lenden Hallmaster's time, a simple trestle of wood had been laid across the remains of the ancient stone piers to link Griffin Watch more directly with Dagger Guard Tower, a small barracks and watchtower on the west bank of the river. Garin paused at the top of the bridge to lean on the rail and watch the water race by below. The snowmelt of spring was just beginning. In a few weeks the winter spear would be ten feet higher, roaring with the voice of Thar's high snowfields and the distant glaciers of the Galenas. He made his way from Dagger Guard along Keldon Way, heading south as he circled the town. Above him rose the strange stone forest the folk of Hullberg knew simply as the Spires. Soaring, club-shaped columns of pale green stone stood embedded in the flanks of the ridge marking the western edge of the town, in some cases bursting through the old foundations of the ancient ruins. The spires were changeland, too, just like the spectacular arches that guarded the eastern side of Hullberg's harbor. Both were inexplicable legacies of the spell plague that had swept Faerun nearly a century ago. Odd landmarks, such as the spires or the arches, were commonplace in many lands, rock and root of alien a beer, piercing Toril's flesh when the two worlds, long separated, had merged in a decade of unthinkable catastrophes following the year of blue fire. Garin had heard that many such eruptions of a beer and landscape in other lands were infested with all sorts of strange planar monstrosities, or held undreamed-of marvels of living magic, but the spires were simply tangled, fluted pillars of malachite, silent and inert. No alien perils or deadly magic were hidden within. From the shadow of the spires he descended quickly into the trading district at the foot of Keldon Head, where half a dozen trade yards clustered near the wharves of the harbor. Here Garin slowed his pace and began to pay attention. The storehouse compound belonging to House Sokol of Flan had stood in Hullberg for many years, but large new yards belonging to House Varuna of Mulmaster and the double moon coster of Thentia were new. He turned eastward on Cart Street and found a striking new building, the Merchant Council's Hall, standing not far from the Merchant Yards. 
A pair of armed guards stood in front of it, men who wore cuirasses of iron and carried short pikes. The council watch, or so he guessed. He didn't like the idea of an armed company in Hullberg other than the shield sworn, but the town seemed full of mercenaries and cell swords. Garin threaded his way through heavier crowds along Cart Street. The triangle of tangled streets between the harbor, Angar's Square, and the low bridge was the heart of Hullberg. Clerks hurried from place to place, carrying ledgers and quills. Porters threw barrels of ale or sacks of flour over the shoulders and carried them off. Children ran and shouted among the ox carts and porters. It seems that Hullberg isn't a backwater any more, Garin muttered to himself. Was this what the Harmac had meant when he mentioned Sergen's designs for the town? He turned the corner to Plank Street, and his footsteps faltered. He hadn't even realized where he was allowing his feet to carry him. But now he was here, not more than ten feet from a familiar hammer and grain sheaf emblem hanging above a door. The signboard was old and battered, but he could still make out the faded lettering, Erston Wold Provisioner. The storefront was old and weather-worn, too, but it was tidy. Barrels full of last fall's apples stood by the wooden steps. To his right, a large workyard and storehouse adjoined the store. The Erstenwolds had made a decent living for two generations by supplying foodstuffs, rope, canvas, woolen blankets, and iron tools to the ships that called on Hallberg, and the miners and woodcutters who worked the hills to the north and east. Jared's family could still look after themselves, and that was a small comfort at least. He hesitated for a moment, studying the storefront while passers-by made their way around him. "'What are you waiting for?' he wondered. His mouth twisted with a grimace of irritation, and he deliberately set foot on the wooden steps leading to the door. Two quick strides, then he pushed it open and let himself inside." The Erstenwold store consisted of a single, long, wooden counter that spanned the width of the room. Thick, smooth planks of hardwood gleamed underfoot, old and stained. Dim daylight filtered in through a row of thick, glass-paned windows high on the opposite wall. Tack and harness filled the room with the rich smell of fresh leather, and rows of barrels, sacks, and crates lined the walls. A couple of customers, woodcutters in town to stock up on supplies, Garin guessed, negotiated with a clerk behind the counter. It looks pretty much the same as ever, Garin decided. He knew the Erstenwold's place of business almost as well as he knew his own rooms in Griffin Watch. Not terribly busy at the moment, but that was not unusual. If no ships or big supply trains were stocking up, a day could be surprisingly slow here. Can I help you, sir? A dark-haired woman bustled into the room from a doorway behind the counter, brushing her hands against her apron. She was tall and slender, with strong, sharp features, and wide-set eyes of a striking glacial blue. She wore her hair pulled back in a single stern braid, but a small spray of freckles danced across her cheekbones and the bridge of her nose in defiance of her unsmiling expression. When Garin didn't answer immediately, she gave a soft snort of annoyance and took a step closer. Hey, I said, can I? The shopkeeper began, then stopped. She looked again and shook her head as if to clear it of confusion. It's you, she finally said. It's me, Garin said. Hello, Miriam. Garin Hullmaster. Miria Erstenwold crossed her arms, fixing him with her sharp, bright gaze. "'What are you doing here?' "'I—I I heard about Jared. I had to come.' He rested his hands on the well-worn wood of the counter and lowered his eyes. "'Miria, I'm sorry. I loved him like my own brother.' Miria said nothing for a long moment. Then she sighed and smoothed her apron. "'I know you did, Garin.' "'Is there anything I can do?' "'No,' she said. "'We buried him last fifth day, alongside my mother and father. "'It's done. You've no cause to worry on our account.' Garin winced. "'Once upon a time, Miria wouldn't have used such a tone on him. 
Sometime in his seventeenth summer he'd finally noticed that the sister of his best friend, a girl who had followed the two of them all over Hullberg and the wildlands nearby, was clever, strong, slender, and graceful as an elf princess, and that something in her eyes danced like sunlight on water when he was around her. She'd been his first love, and he'd been hers. But that carefree girl with the easy smile and the soft laugh was just a memory, just as much as the restless boy he'd once been. "'He didn't leave anyone behind, did he?' he asked. "'I mean, I don't remember hearing that he'd ever married.' "'Jared was promised to Nyamini Tresterfin. They meant to marry at midsummer. "'Burkle, Tresterfin's daughter?' I, Garin, remembered Nyamini, a pretty little slip of a girl, perhaps five or six years younger than Jared. The Tresterfin farm was a good piece of land in the Winterspear Vale, three or four miles north of town. She'd been a young teenager when Garin set out from Hullberg, but it seemed that she'd grown up while he'd been away. Strange how ten years changed such things, he mused. How is she? he managed. Heartbroken. What do you think? She and her whole family, too. Burkle and his wife liked Jared a lot, and he liked them as well. It would have been a good match. I didn't know. No, you wouldn't have heard. Miria glanced down the counter. The woodcutters were finishing their business with her clerk, who was busy writing out their order in a ledger. Satisfying herself that it was nothing she needed to worry about, she took a deep breath and looked back to him. "'Where do you keep yourself now, anyway?' "'Tantras. A few years back I joined an adventuring band called the Company of the Dragon Shield. Timora smiled on us, and we won a small fortune before we went our separate ways. My comrade Hamill and I bought owner's shares of a small trading company, the Red Sail Coster. We buy and sell cargoes in the vast.' I thought I'd heard that you were living in Myth Dranor. His hand tickled, remembering the feel of brushing dry leaves of orange and gold from Allier's midnight hair, as she laughed and ducked away from him. Strange that his fingers recalled something his heart had no wish to, he mused. He looked down again to banish the memory from his mind. I did for a time, but I've been in Tantras for more than a year now, he said. He paused and changed the subject. Listen, Miria, I know you said that there isn't much I can do, but... She crossed her arms and fixed her gaze on him. You don't need to worry about me, Garen Hallmaster. You've not been home in years, and you're sure to be on your way again soon. Spend an hour by Jared's grave if you feel you should. Visit with your family. Take a ride to the High Fells if you still fancy the scenery. Then go back to whatever place you call home now. You've nothing more to do here. Garin retreated a step. Miria had good cause to be angry with him after all. He'd broken her heart when he left Hullberg ten years past. He'd always meant to come back after seeing more of Faerun. But after those first few years with the dragon shields, he'd found himself enchanted in Myth Dranor, swept up in a dreamlike life that had made him feel like one of the fair folk himself, and the memories of his boyhood had seemed so faint and far away. He was still waking up from that strange dream. Miriam, I don't know what to say, he sighed. He couldn't think of anything more. Mother, mother, I finished my letters. Can I go play kickstones with Dory and Kinda? Garin looked to the doorway leading back to the family quarters, where a young, dark-haired girl stood. She wore a long-sleeved dress of blue wool, and was already pulling a brown hood over her shoulders, expecting to go outside. She gave a quick smile and dipped in a shallow curtsy when she noticed him looking at her. "'Well, can I?' she repeated. "'Miria has a daughter?' Garin blinked in surprise." Of course, Miria was wearing her hair in a long braid. In Hullberg, that was something married women did. When did that happen, he wondered. He knew he shouldn't have been surprised. What did he expect after ten years, after all? Miria's face softened for a moment. Aye, go ahead, Selsha. 
but you be back here by noon. We're taking a big delivery from the brew house, and you're to help mind the store while I'm seeing to it. Thank you, mother. Selcia bolted back the way she had come. Her footsteps clattered in the hallway, and a door slammed shut. You have children? Garin asked. I never knew. Only Selcia, she replied. She stared after her daughter with the same mixture of love and just a hint of worry that mothers everywhere seem to have. Saloon knows that she's enough. She's a wonder and a trial to me every day. How old is she? Eight last month, Miria glanced back at him. She came about two years after you left Hullberg. He nodded. In other words, Miria was saying, She isn't yours. That would have been a few months after he'd returned home for his father's funeral, but Garin had stayed in Hullberg only a couple of days before leaving again. He hadn't seen Miria then. She's beautiful. Are you... I mean, who is... No, I'm not married. Her father's no one you know, and no one that we'll ever see again. Darkness flickered across her face, and she looked away from him. But we've got each other, and we make do. There's more to it than that, Garin thought. Had she fallen in love with someone else after he'd left, only to have her heart broken again? Or, well, there was not much point in speculating about it. Miria had made it clear that it was none of his business. Strange, but the idea that she'd evidently moved on after he'd struck out on his own woke a small, bitter swell of resentment in him. You have no right to feel that way, he told himself. You left her, after all. Was she supposed to remain chaste and forlorn until the day you decided to wander back into her life? And Allier's ghost still haunted him every day. I should be going, he finally said. I'd like— well, I'll stop in to say goodbye before I leave town. She shrugged and started to say something, but then someone pushed the door open. Three men in male shirts and tabards of green and white sauntered in. One ran his hand along the wooden counter as he paced toward Miria. One closed the door behind him and leaned against it with arms folded, and the third wandered by the barrels and sacks stacked along the opposite wall. He studied Garin while feigning interest in the goods offered for sale. "'Well, now, Mistress Erstenwold,' the first man said, "'you seem to have neglected this month's council dues. We're here to offer a friendly reminder.' Miria's face tightened. She stood her ground, not moving. "'I've not paid any dues because I haven't joined the Merchant Council,' she said. "'Nor do I mean to.' so you and your men can see yourselves out any time you fancy. You certain about that, Mistress Erstenwald? the first man asked. He was a big, round-faced fellow with the complexion of a ruddy ham. These are dangerous times. It'll be difficult to do business without council protection. He nodded toward the man along the back wall, who drew a dagger from his belt and slashed open a sack of milled grain. It poured out onto the floor with a soft hissing sound. Enough, Garin said. He turned to face the men in green and white. She asked you to leave, so leave. This isn't your problem, Miria snarled under her breath. Mistress Erstenwold is right. This ain't your problem, stranger, the leader of the three said. He shifted his attention from Miria to Garin and squared to face him. He rested one hand on the hilt of the long sword at his belt. Why don't you shut your damned mouth and think of some other place you want to be? Garin smiled coldly, but his eyes were hard. This was something else that he hadn't seen in Hullberg before. This makes twice in two days that I've faced foreigners wearing steel in my own hometown, he thought. Whose colors are you wearing? he asked the man. The ruddy-faced man measured him for a moment before answering. "'How's Veruna? Lady Darcy's helping the Merchant Council to establish order in this miserable town. Everyone who wants to do business in Hullberg is going to join, one way or the other. Now, you're starting to annoy me, stranger. I'm telling you for the last time. Stand aside and let me finish my conversation with Mistress Erstenwold here.' 
or things won't go well for either you or her. Garen, you're not making things any better, Miria hissed. He ignored her. I'm not moving, Garen said. Ignoring the dark looks the Varuna men shared with each other, Garen emptied his mind of distractions and concentrated on the secret arcane syllables he'd studied for so many months in the starlight glens of Mithdranor. It was not enough to know the words, to invoke their magic. One also had to understand the strange associations of thought that gave the ancient words their power, then hurl the focused might of one's will at the combination of symbol and meaning. The Layla, na, Drendir, he said aloud, clearly his voice strong and confident in the ancient Elvish. A faint veil of violet mist coalesced around him, growing stronger and brighter, shaping itself into hundreds of scale-like shards of diamond-bright force that rippled and cascaded from his shoulders to his knees. The elf sword-mages knew the incantation as the scales of the dragon. It armored him as well as the finest dwarf-wrought plate. "'Did you hear that, Ben?' said the Varuna armsman by the back of the store. The man recoiled two steps. "'It's elven witchery. He's a mage of some sort.' "'Steady, lads,' the lead armsman, Ban, or so Garin guessed, said. His voice was steady, but his eyes narrowed, and he suppressed a small shiver. Slowly he drew his blade, a sturdy, basket-hilted broadsword, careful to keep the point to the gleaming wooden floor. "'Wizards are just men. They can bleed and die like anyone else.' "'We'll see,' Garin replied. "'Ilyith, son of gun. He swept out his elven blade as he spoke the spell, and the subtly curved steel began to crackle with dancing sparks of yellow-white almost as if he'd parried a bolt of lightning. In a voice as quiet as death, he promised, "'The next man who damages Erstenwold property will regret it for the rest of his life.' The Varuna armsmen exchanged glances and hesitated. None seemed willing to be the first to try Garin's steel, not while shimmering veils of magic shrouded him and brilliant sparks danced like fireflies along his blade." The armsman Ban met Garin's gaze with a fierce glare. "'Fair is fair,' he grated. "'We told you our colors. So whose colors do you wear, wizard?' "'None but my own,' Garin snarled. He shifted his feet and raised his blade into a high guard. "'Stop it!' Miria barked. "'I'll not have this nonsense in my store. Take your quarrel to the street, all of you.' No one moved. Miria snorted in disgust, slid a few steps along the countertop, and pointed to Garin. "'Oh, by all nine of the screaming hells! He wears no colors because he's Garin Hullmaster, kin of the Harmac,' she said to Ban and the other Varuna men. "'Think on that before you strike.' Garin scowled and moved away. "'Stand aside, Miria. I know what I'm doing. This'll be over with soon enough.' "'The Harmac's nephew?' the armsman by the door said. He frowned. "'Ban, I'm not sure about this. Someone cut up the chainsmen last night. I heard it was him. And what'll the townsfolk do if we hurt him?' "'If he chooses the quarrel, we've broken no laws,' Ban said. "'Aye, but Lady Darcy'll have your heads if you lay a finger on him without her permission,' Miria retorted. That dart found its mark. The Varuna man winced, and uncertainty flickered across his face. He glared at Garin a moment longer, and then he contemptuously spun on his heel and slammed his sword back into the sheath. "'You might be surprised, Mistress Erstenwold,' he said to Miria. He angrily jerked his head toward the door. "'Come on, lads. We'll just come back sometime when Mistress Erstenwold isn't so busy.' The Varuna man strode out of the store, sparing Garin one more look before he bowled his way into the street. The other two blades followed him. Garin watched them pause and speak together for a moment out in the street before they turned and left together. He sighed and released the spells he'd been holding. With a simple flourish, he returned his sword to the scabbard. "'I suppose that's done for now,' he said. 
Miria watched the Varuna armsmen leave, her face a tight mask of disapproval. And when did you become a wizard? she demanded. Garin shrugged. I know a few shields and evocations, but I'm no wizard. Sword magic is all the magic I can muster. Her eyes fell to the blade at Garin's hip, and she studied him more thoughtfully. I've heard stories of elven sword magic, Miria finally said. I thought the elves weren't in the way of sharing their magic with outsiders. Is the sword enchanted? The lightning was a spell of mine, not the sword. But, since you ask, yes, the blade's enchanted. I earned it in the service of the coronal. He halted, unsure what else he could add. The people of Hollaberg knew elves and elven ways only by what they heard from merchants of Hillsfar or Mullmaster, and the folk of those cities had good reason to fear the wrath of the elves. Consequently, elves were likewise regarded as mythical and perilous in Hullberg, too. I'm going to have to be careful about saying too much about my time in Mythdranor, he realized. He grimaced and moved on. The Varuna men shouldn't trouble you for a while. I've dealt with their kind before. Well, that's helpful, Miria said in a sarcastic voice. And what do you think's going to happen when they come back after you've gone away again? I'll tell you, Garen Hallmaster, they'll hold me to account for your nonsense. That's what. If you have to, tell them that I interfered without your blessing, he said sharply. He'd expected at least a little gratitude for his trouble, after all. It's true enough. It's not so simple, and you know it. Miria clenched her fists in her apron. You've been gone for ten years, and you're sure to be gone again before the month's out. I don't need you to pick a fight and then sail off, leaving it to me. Garin snorted. If you beg forgiveness for standing up to a bully, you're asking him to rob you again. You should know that, Miria. You've not been here, Garin, and you don't have half an idea of what's going on in this town, Miria snapped. And it's not just my own neck that I'm worried for. What if those black-hearted scoundrels thought to teach me a lesson by hurting Selsha? Now how could I live with myself if I ever let her get hurt on account of my stubbornness, or yours? All right, then. I'll make sure that I don't involve you in my quarrels, Miria. But I'll be damned if I'll stand still and watch some Mulmasterite thugs threaten my friends right in front of me. I promise you, I'll make sure my fights are finished before I go. Garin shook his head and stormed away. He tried not to slam the door behind him, but he didn't quite succeed. Miria shouted something after him, but he turned back toward Griffin Watch and set off without looking back. Slavers in the tailings, the shields worn, keeping no laws within the town's walls, and thugs dressed in the colors of foreign companies extorting native-born Hulbergans. Somewhere at the back of it all, Jared Erstenwold had been murdered in the high fells by tomb robbers. Garin fumed silently as he shouldered his way through the narrow streets. It seemed that looking after Jared's affairs might take longer than he'd thought. Five, thirteen chess, the year of the ageless one. The day after the encounter at Erstenwold's, Garin rose early and spent half an hour practicing his weapon forms in a little used court on the castle's south face. When he finished, he returned to his chambers, splashed himself with cold water for a teeth-chattering bath, and dressed. Then, before leaving his rooms, he took a large book written in Elvish from his baggage. Garin spent an hour studying the words and symbols from the spell book, pressing into his mind the arcane phrasings and signs he would need to unlock his magic quickly and surely should he need it. Given what he'd seen of the state of affairs in Hullberg so far, it seemed wise to be ready for anything. With the sword magic spells fixed in his mind, Garin took a few moments to renew the protective charms he usually maintained from day to day. He quickly rewove wardings of keen perception and deflection, defenses that just might save him from a dagger in the back or see him through an unexpected skirmish. 
His battle shields were much more powerful, of course, but he couldn't maintain them for long. The wardings he could wear all day, like an invisible shirt of light mail. He returned his spellbook to the trunk at the foot of his bed and whispered a locking spell out of habit. All right, he said aloud. Now for some breakfast. He trotted down the stairs leading from his old bedchamber to the great room in the Harmax Tower, where the family normally took their meals. Hamel was ahead of him, already finished with his own breakfast. The halfling was engaged in a game of dragon's teeth with Garin's young cousin Kerr, who chortled with delight every time he found an opportunity to put one of his own markers on top of Hamel's. Somehow the halfling never failed to provide the young lad plenty of opportunities to take his pieces. Hamel looked up at Garin with a doleful frown. "'It seems I've fallen into the hands of a master strategist,' he said. "'I don't doubt that this young fellow will grow up to be the greatest general since Azun of Cormir. "'Neighboring lands should sue for peace now, while his terms remain generous.' "'That's right!' Kerr declared. "'Ha! You missed another one, Hamel!' "'He plunked a red tile down on top of one of Hamel's white ones. "'What?' "'But how, you fiend, you have captured my last white!' "'The halfling spluttered in feigned outrage. "'The young boy cackled in reply, "'almost helpless with delight at his own cunning. "'His older sister, Natali, studied Hamel suspiciously "'while she arranged her own pieces for the next match, "'clearly aware that the halfling was throwing the game, "'but wise enough not to say so "'right before she got a chance to play him. Garin shook his head. In a hundred years he never would have guessed that Hamel had a weakness for children. He helped himself to a broad plate of honey cakes, bacon, and eggs from the breakfast service, and sat down near the game to watch as he ate. "'A word of advice, Kerr,' he said between mouthfuls. "'If Hamel loses again, but suggests that maybe you should play for coin next time, say no.' The halfling snorted. "'Even I am not that underhanded, Garin.' "'Do they play dragon's teeth in Tantras, Garin?' Natalie asked. She was quieter than her younger brother, but in two brief evenings Garin had already learned that she had a quick and lively sense of curiosity, and never forgot a word she heard. Where Kerr was constantly in motion, fidgeting and standing and sitting and pushing tiles together when it wasn't his turn, Natali held herself as still as a falcon watching a mouse. Garin nodded. Yes, indeed. And people play dragon's teeth in most other places I've visited, too. In the Moon Sea, it's regarded as a children's game. But if you go down to Termish or Airspur, you'll see grown men playing all afternoon. They take tremendous pride in playing well, and sometimes they gamble bags of gold on games. The marks on the tiles are different, but the game's pretty much the same everywhere you go. Where do the marks on the tiles come from? He smiled at that, wondering why in the world she thought he might know. I've heard that long ago they were runes in Dwarvish, but they've changed over the years. Dragon's Teeth is an old dwarven game. It's said that once upon a time dwarf merchants used the runes and tiles to strike bargains and keep accounts with each other. The young girl studied the ivory tiles intently, her brow furrowed. How could you make trades by playing dragon's teeth? I don't know, Natalie. Maybe a dwarf could tell you. He heard a light, quick step approaching, and looked up to see a blonde woman in a male shirt trotting up the steps. Garin swung his legs over the bench and stood. "'Kara, it's good to see you.' Kara Hullmaster smiled broadly when she caught sight of him, and quickly crossed the room to throw her arms around him in a rib-cracking hug. "'Garin, you're here!' she laughed. She was not much more than about five and a half feet in height, but she had wide, strong shoulders and an acrobat's compact build. And when she squeezed, Garin had a hard time taking a good breath. It's been years. Too long, I know, he admitted. He returned her embrace and then stepped back to look at her. Her hair was paler than he remembered, 
bleached by long months spent outside beneath the sun every year, and laugh lines gathered at the corners of her eyes. Kara had the squarish face and fine, narrow nose of the hullmasters, but her strikingly luminous eyes glowed an eerie azure with the spell scar she had inherited from her father. The serpent-like blue mark entwined her lower left arm and covered the back of her left hand beautiful and sinister at the same time. Two or three generations passed. Someone in her father's line had come in contact with the virulent, unchecked spell plague and had been changed by it. As far as Garin knew, Kara's father had never even known it himself. The spell plague was capricious that way. Certainly, Harmac Grigor never would have permitted his sister Turina to marry a man known to carry the defect of a spell scar. But no one had known the danger until Kara's spell scar had manifested early in her thirteenth year. I heard about Jared, he told her. I've come to pay my respects and look after anything that needs looking after. I should have known you'd come home, Kara said with a sigh. I'm sorry, Garin. I wish you were here for a happier reason. She glanced over to the table and noticed Hamel with Kerr and Natale. Who's your friend? My apologies. Kara, this is Hamel Alderhart. Hamel, this is my cousin, Kara Hullmaster. Hamel slid off the bench, took Kara's hand, and kissed it lightly. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Lady Kara he said. If he was startled by her spell scar, he was careful not to show it. Garin has told me a lot about you, but his reports simply don't do you justice. I am your servant. Kara raised an eyebrow. Why, thank you, Master Alderhart. Garin rolled his eyes. Hamel had never met a handsome woman he didn't try to charm, regardless of race or station. It was simply Hamel's nature— Garin had even known Hamel to court human women before, although the halfling preferred ladies not much more than five feet or so in height. Kara was really a little too tall for him. The sword mage cleared his throat and said, "'Kara, I heard you were checking up on the border posts when we arrived. Is everything well?' Kara shrugged. "'It's been surprisingly quiet.' I spent three days prowling around the watchtowers, and I didn't see or hear anything. Usually the tribes send out their scouts and hunters as soon as the snows melt. In any event, until the Harmac names a new captain for the shield sworn, I'm standing in. So I wanted to take a good look for myself. I've been doing some of that, too, over the last couple of days. The town isn't what I remember. A lot's changed in the last few years. Kara started to say more, but thought better of it. Instead, she asked, "'So what are you doing today?' "'I'm going to drive out to Kelton Head and visit Jared's grave. I should have done it yesterday.' Kara gave him a small nod. "'I'll ride with you, if you like. I can show you where it is.' "'I'll be glad for your company,' Garin told her. He quickly finished his breakfast and said his goodbyes to Natalie and Kerr. Then he, Hamel, and Kara threw on cloaks and headed down to the stable. They harnessed a pair of horses to an old two-wheeled buggy they found in the musty carriage house. Hamel scrambled onto the quarter bench behind Garin and Kara, since it would have been a tight fit with all three of them in the single full seat. Kara took the reins and drove out under Griffinwatch's gates into the bright morning. It was another cold and cloudless day with a brisk westerly breeze raising whitecaps on the moon sea. The clip-clop of hooves on stone and jingle of the harness preceded them as they rode down the causeway winding around Griffinwatch's crag. Garin watched the town clatter past as Kara followed the same route he'd taken the previous day. The town seemed just as full as before. "'What are all these people doing here?' he wondered aloud. Is there a gold strike I haven't heard about? A war somewhere that people are fleeing from? It must be something. Kara glanced sharply at him. 
Mostly it's the timber concessions, she said. My stepbrother's idea. A few years ago, he urged Harmac Grigor to rent logging rights in the Holmaster forest land to foreign merchants. All the Moonsea cities are desperate for wood, especially since Myth Dranner put the woods of the Elven Court under its protection. We deal in timber sometimes down in the vast, Hamel observed. It doesn't hurt that Sembia's demand is driving up the prices everywhere. Garin looked back to Hamel, and the halfling shrugged. While you were strolling around the town, I spent my day talking to the clerks and superintendents of the merchant yards. I was curious about whether the red sails ought to do some business up this way. Sembia is ten times as big as the whole moon sea together, and just as hungry for wood, shades or no shades. We should think about it. Which costers are here now? Garin asked Kara. House Varunas of Mulmaster, the Double Moon Coster, House Janarsk of Flan, and a few others moved into town to handle the trade in timber, said Kara. They shipped in poor laborers from the larger cities to cut timber, drive wagons, work in the yards and on the docks. And, of course, those laborers bring others with them, tailors and grocers, smiths and wainwrights, brewers and cooks. In the last year or two, the Harmax let out some mining concessions, too, and the big merchant houses and costers are taking advantage of those as fast as they can. They seem to be doing well, Hamel observed. The Harmac must be making a fortune on his rents. Kara shook her head. Not as much as you might think. To pay off old debts, the Harmac borrowed heavily from the merchant guilds and he had to rent out the concessions for a pittance by way of payment. The foreign merchants are keeping the better part of what they're cutting down in our forests and digging out of our ground, except, of course, for the so-called licensing fees Sergen and his merchant council capture from the whole business. They came to the burned bridge and drove over the rickety wooden decking. It was covered by a dilapidated roof, and the hoofbeats echoed in the shadows of the bridge. Garin scratched at his jaw, thinking. He didn't like the idea of using Hullmaster land in such a way, especially if the Harmac saw little return on the rights he rented out, but it wasn't really his place to say if it was a good idea or not. What's Sergen's connection to the Merchant Council? He's the keeper of duties, the Harmac's representative on the council. Uncle Grigor put him in charge of releasing concessions, negotiating their prices, and administering the resulting trade. So your cousin decides which properties will be up for bidding, who can purchase a concession, how much they'll pay the Harmac, and how much they'll pay the council he presides over? Hamel observed silently. If he were a corrupt man... That would be an awful temptation. I'm sure that isn't the case, though. Garin glanced back at his friend, but didn't reply. He was not at all sure that Sergen wasn't corruptible. A younger, more vigorous Harmac might have been vigilant enough to check any ignoble impulses someone in Sergen's position could fall prey to. But Grigor was not a young man any more and it seemed he relied on Sergen to look after his interests for him. They drove on in silence for a time and began to climb again. The road wound through the mournful spires on the town's western side, then followed the flanks of Keldon Head, the windswept promontory that sheltered Hullberg and its bay. The town's cemetery was atop the long, bare hill— a long time ago, the ruins surrounding Hullberg had been plagued by undead, and so the townsfolk chose to bury their dead in the safe ground of the hilltop, well outside any lingering influences from the days before the town's refounding a hundred years ago. The cheerless stone markers and weathered mausoleums of the cemetery rose into view as the carriage neared the hilltop. Kara, Garin said quietly, what can you tell me about Jared's death? The Harmag said that he was found alone in the High Fells. But that's all I know. Kara briefly met his eyes, then sighed and returned her gaze to the road. A shepherd found him by the door of a barrow mound up in the East High Fells, perhaps five or six miles from town. 
We've had a rash of crypt breaking in the last few months. Someone's been opening barrows and tombs, looking for funereal treasure, I suppose. You know how dangerous that can be in Hullberg. So Jared began to search for those responsible. We think he finally managed to catch the tomb robbers in the act, but he was overpowered and killed. He took no one with him, Hamill asked. No, he was alone. I don't know if he just chanced upon the tomb robbers, decided to set watch on a barrow he thought they might visit, or heard some rumor that led him to that spot. The halfling nodded, thinking. Kara drove the carriage up to the cemetery gates and halted the team. She set the brake and hopped down. Garin and Hamel followed. This way, she said. The sunshine was bright on top of the hill, and the wind rustled and hissed through the long grasses. They followed Kara through rows of plain stone markers, some crumbling beneath decades of moss and weathering, others bright and new. She stopped by a raised stone bier surmounted by a heavy sepulchre of new white stone, its lid inscribed with a monitor's sunburst emblem. Lettering, chiseled carefully at the foot of the tomb, read simply, Jared Erstenwold, Captain of the Shield Sworn. His valor, compassion, and faithfulness shall not be forgotten. Uncle Grigor paid for the monument, Kara said quietly. He thought the world of Jared. It's been hard for him. Garin stood silent for a long moment. He reached out and rested his hand on the cold stone. It simply didn't seem possible that Jared truly rested under that heavy slab. Behind him, Kara and Hamel exchanged looks and retreated a short distance, leaving him alone with his old friend. Jared, he whispered. He felt as if he should say something more, maybe give in to tears, or try to find some shadow of a smile in a good memory. But there was nothing in his heart except a dull, cold ache. He let his fingers brush over the sun symbol atop the tomb, following the design aimlessly. I never knew he thought of himself as a follower of Amontor, Garin reflected. Jared was not a particularly religious man. Was it something the Harmac had picked out for him? Or Myria? Or the Tresterfins? He was engaged when he was killed, after all. I wonder if I would have come home for his wedding. Garin thought dully. He hoped he would have. But ever since the terrible day when he'd left Mithdranor, he'd avoided things that reminded him of who he used to be. Maybe he wouldn't have shown up after all. I'm sorry for that, Jared, Garin said to the cold stone. You deserved better from me. Everyone here did, I think. He heard the steady rhythm of hooves on stone and looked up. Someone else was driving up to the cemetery in a simple wagon. He put it out of his mind and let his hand fall from the stone. Ten years ago I would have followed the men who killed you to the ends of the world, he murmured softly. I think you'd want me to look after things before I set out again. I'll see what I can do. And if I happen to run across the men you met out in the high fells while I'm at it, well, so much the better." Footsteps swished through the long grass. Garin looked up again. Mirja Erstenwold stood watching him, a small bunch of wildflowers in her hands. She dropped her gaze to the ground and said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's nothing. Garin noticed a small stone vase at the foot of the tomb near where he stood. A small spray of wildflowers rested there, faded with the weather. He retreated a few steps and made room for her. I'll leave. There's no need for that. She knelt by the foot of the tomb and began to remove the old flowers from the vase. I met your friend Hamel. He seems a good man. You don't know him very well yet, then. Mira gave him a bleak smile. She replaced the old bouquet with the fresh one and took a moment to arrange the flowers. I've come up here once a month since my mother passed she said, without looking at him. It's a fair spot in the summer time. Sometimes I'll bring Selsha for a picnic. Did she know Jared well? Garin asked. 
Miria closed her eyes and nodded. I he supped with us once or twice a ten-day, and was always stopping by the warehouse. She cried for days when I told her that he was gone. Garin's stern resolve cracked at the idea of a heartbroken little girl who'd never see someone she loved again, and couldn't understand why he wasn't coming home. It ached like a cold knife in the center of his chest. He was a grown man, and he'd seen his share of death and misfortune. But the grief of a child was a damned hard thing to dwell on. He sank down against an old moss-covered tomb next to Jared's, with his hand over his eyes. Ah, oh, Miria, I'm so sorry, he breathed. If I'd been here— Miria watched him in silence, and her stern expression softened. Garin, what happened to Jared was no fault of yours. I things might have been different if you'd been here in Hullberg. But if you hadn't gone off to find your fortune in the South, who's to say that someone else wouldn't have died because you weren't there to stand by their side? Who, in turn, might have died because those people didn't live? And even if you'd come home to Hullberg before now, well, fate might have called you and Jared to some ill end years ago. Why, if I hadn't... Miria stopped herself abruptly and sighed. She rose and brushed her hands against her skirts. Anyway, there's no point to wishing on might-have-beens. He looked down between his boots at the wiry grass, growing by a weathered stone marker so old that its inscription was only a set of illegible dimples in its surface. He knew that Miria was right, and that there was no telling how things could have turned out if he'd made different choices— the duel against Rovan in the glades of Mithdranor, for example. He knew that he had no real cause to blame himself for failing Jared, but it was the simplest and straightest course for his grief. "'I know you're right,' he said. "'I know it. But somehow I can't help but feel that this didn't have to happen.' He kicked idly at the grass, pushed himself upright, and rubbed his hand across his eyes. "'I'll be on my way.' She met his eyes briefly, and found a small smile for him. "'Take care of yourself, Garin Hullmaster.' Garin took a deep breath, turned, and made his way to the carriage where Kara and Hamel waited. They watched him pull himself up into the seat, adjusting his cloak to keep his sword-arm free. "'I'm ready to go,' he said to Kara. Kara nodded and said, "'We can come back any time you want.' She took the reins in hand. "'Garin, wait!' Miria hurried up to the carriage, holding her skirts. She stopped and studied him, evidently considering what she wanted to say. Finally she spoke, "'Listen, likely there's nothing at all to what I aim to tell you, but I thought you ought to know.' "'What is it?' he asked. "'Several days passed. I thought I saw something.' Jared had an elf-made dagger that he often wore. It was a handsome thing with a hilt of silver wire and a pommel in the shape of a sprig of holly. I think he got it from you. Garin leaned forward in the seat. Yes, he did. I sent him that blade shortly after I arrived in Mithdranor. It was nothing, really, just an ordinary dagger of a coronel's guardsman. But I wanted to send him something elf-made, something to show that I'd visited the city of the elves. When we were boys, we always talked about going there some day. It was not to you, perhaps, but Jared treasured it. He wore it at his belt always. Miria's voice grew flat. I think I saw that dagger on the hip of a hired sword by the name of Anfel Erdinger. He's in the pay of House Varuna. He and a few other Varunas were keeping watch on Erstenwolds from across the street. Like as not, they were keeping count of my business to work out the Merchant Council's cut. Hamel looked at Garin. If it's a common design, as you say, it may not be the same dagger. Or, even if it is, it's possible that this man Erdinger simply got it from someone else. Wanted throwing dice. Traded for it. Stole it. Who knows? I, your friend, may have the right of it. "'Miria acknowledged. "'But this I do know. 
Jared wasn't afraid to interfere with Merchant Council business when he had a mind to, and interfering with Merchant Council business means interfering with Varuna business. If you mean to start asking questions, then you might start with asking whether House Varuna is interested in tomb-breaking out in the high fells. Miria, you should have told me about this, Kara said with a frown. If there's any reason to suspect Erdinger, I need to know. Do you realize what you're suggesting? If you're right, House Varuna's armsmen ambushed and killed the captain of the Shieldsworn. That's a direct attack on the Harmac. You were away up at the northern posts, Kara, Miria replied. Besides, what I saw is no proof of anything, even if I got the right of it. Well, as Hamill said, Erdinger could claim that he came by that dagger in any number of ways. All I've got are my suspicions. Garin met Mirya's eyes. I take your suspicions seriously, Mirya. I'll remember what you've told me, and I'll keep my eyes open for this fellow Erdinger. He's got some questions to answer. Kara shifted in her seat to look at both Garin and Mirya. Her armor rasped and jingled. Garin, you've got to move with care, she said. You can't just challenge this man in the street, regardless of Miria's suspicions. The Harmax law applies to you as well as everyone in Hullberg, especially to you, since we can't afford to have anyone say the Hullmasters are above the law in this city. Besides, you might be playing into House Varuna's hands. Someone arranged for Isselmar to meet a professional duelist four years ago. Whoever arranged that for Harmac Grigor's own son wouldn't hesitate to arrange something similar for you. I hear you, Kara. I'll choose my steps carefully. Never you fear. Garin leaned back in his seat and motioned at the road leading back down to the town below. Now, before I go looking for this Varuna man, I want to take a look at the place where Jared was found. Could you take me to the barrow? Kara nodded once and flicked the reins. The horses wickered and leaned into the traces, trotting on the mossy old cobblestones, as they turned out of the cemetery gate and began to descend. Garin glanced back up the hill at the lonely stone markers amid the long grass. Miria stood there with the dead, faded wildflowers in her hands, watching him drive away until a bend in the road hid her from his view. Six, thirteen chess, the year of the ageless one. Noon was approaching when Sergeant Hullmaster's chamberlain informed him that Lady Darcy's carriage was hurrying up the long drive leading to the broad porch of his villa. Sergeant arose from his bath, allowed the bath attendants he'd chosen for the morning to dry him and drape a robe over his shoulders, and dismissed them with an absent wave. As the girls hurried away, he belted his robe, stepped into slippers warmed by the fire, and donned a plush lounging coat against the cold. Then he went to see his guest. Darcy Varuna waited in the house's great room, sipping from a goblet of mulled wine already provided by Sergan's servants. She wore a long green winter dress with a subtle trim of ermine fur at collar and cuff, with a matching fur-trimmed hat over her long golden hair. "'Ah, there you are, Sergan,' she said in a rich, melodious voice. "'Have I taken you from your morning sport?' Sergan made a small gesture of dismissal. "'It's nothing, my dear. To tell the truth, I am rather bored with my attendance.' He drifted over to the smorgasbord, which his servants set each day, whether he intended to eat or not, and helped himself to a goblet of the warmed wine as well. A large, well-fed fire and bear-hide rugs helped to keep the early spring cold at bay, but a warm goblet of wine was just the thing to chase away the last hint of a chill. He shook out his still damp hair and said, "'Tell me, what brings you to my humble home?' "'How may I be of service to you, my lady?' Darcy smiled at that, and seated herself on a fine termitian couch by the fire. She removed her hat. Her maidservant silently took it from her hand and withdrew again. 
Her hair was her best feature, a splendid cascade of molten gold that fell in soft waves to a handspan below the nape of her slender neck. Twenty years ago she had been a stunning beauty, a green-eyed enchantress with a heart-shaped face and perfect features. Men had killed to win the chance to woo her. She was still an exceptionally attractive woman, but the girlish softness had worn away from her features, and the barest hint of frown lines had crept into her face. "'Well, my lord Hallmaster, it seems that your long-lost cousin Garin saw fit to stop my armsmen from collecting council dues from a small provisioner on Plank Street, Erstenwolds, in fact.' "'And I just received a note from your sister "'requesting an explanation for my armsman's behavior. "'Sergan grimaced. "'I heard the same story. "'What will you tell my dear sister? "'I'll tell her that armsmen in my employ "'are under strict instructions to follow all local laws, "'and that if in fact these three men conducted themselves as reported, then it was purely on their own initiative and for their own personal gain. Should their misconduct be proven, I will of course discharge them from my service immediately. Indeed, Sergan allowed himself a long, low chuckle. The situation was not amusing at all, really, but the audacity of Darcy Varuna's lies deserved some measure of approbation. Of course she'd known exactly what the three armsmen were up to, but Kara could never prove that she did. And without ironclad proof, well, the Harmac and his agents simply lacked the political strength to accuse a powerful merchant company, like House Veruna, of unsavory conduct. Oh, Kara could lay out charges on behalf of their uncle, and in all likelihood she would be widely believed— but Darcy Varuna would simply hand over a scapegoat, or three, and House Varuna would carry on with its business. "'I wonder what my stepsister will say to that,' he asked aloud. "'I doubt she'll be pleased,' Darcy replied, though her manner was cool and calm. Sergan knew her well enough to recognize the subtle sharpness of her tone as a sign of intense annoyance.' "'Perhaps I should curtail my efforts to enforce council edicts, "'if my men are discovered in the very act of extortion, "'or discovered in some of our less savory activities. "'Even your feeble old uncle will have to do something.' "'Sergan's amusement vanished. "'The council business is not that important, Darcy, "'but the search for the book must not be delayed. "'Need I remind you whom we are dealing with?' "'A reckless gamble, in my estimation. "'House Faruna is deeply invested in opening this rude little backwater of a town, Sergan. "'We've done well here, but we've spent a fortune to get to this point. "'If your uncle decides to slap my wrist, it could be extremely costly for my family. "'When I am Harmac, any such costs you suffer will be repaid, dear Darcy.' "'Now Sergan understood her true concern.' The Varunas were nobles of Mulmaster, the powerful city-state across the Moon Sea from Hullberg. Like several other important families of Mulmaster, their power was counted in the profitability of their trading ventures throughout the region. Setbacks Varuna experienced in Hullberg would reflect poorly on Darcy and damage her standing among her well-born but viciously competitive relations. It was time to remind her of the stakes of the game. How much gold would pour into House Varuna's coffers if your rivals were suddenly subjected to a ruinous tariff, or if you were given the opportunity to buy out the leases on their logging and mineral rights? A great prize is worth a modest risk, my dear. Fortune favors the bold. Should my ploy work, you will make House Varuna the most powerful merchant company in the Moon Sea by the end of the year. "'But first you must become Harmac.' Darcy Varuna folded her hands in her lap and regarded him with her cat-like eyes for a long time, weighing his chances. Sergan met her gaze without flinching. Finally she inclined her head subtly, acknowledging his point. 
Varuna was the strongest coster in Hallberg, but it was only one of many in Mullmaster. It might cost her a small fortune to put Sergan on the throne, but it would give her a tremendous advantage over her rivals if she succeeded. Speaking of which, tell me about your cousin Garin. A thick-headed fool, who never had to work for anything in his life, Sergan said. He had no use for any of the so-called true Hallmasters, even though he'd claimed the Hallmaster name from the time he'd been twelve. Don't worry about Garin. He left Hullberg ten years ago. He'll soon enough be on his way. Where has he been for all this time? Darcy asked. What's he been doing? Supposedly, soon after he left to see the world, he fell in with a band of adventurers who called themselves the Company of the Dragon Shield. He won himself a small fortune by plundering some dismal dungeon in the vast. Sergan swirled his wine in the goblet, stirring up the spices. He'd made inquiries over the last few years to find out more about where his so-called cousin had vanished to— Seven years ago, he bought an owner's share in the red sail coster of Tantras, and enjoyed some small success as a merchant speculating in various cargoes on the Sea of Fallen Stars. The red sails, Darcy murmured. Yes, I know them. Go on. Garin's father, Burnov Hallmaster, was killed in a skirmish about eight and a half years ago. Garin came home for the funeral, but stayed only a few days before returning to Tantris. His mother retired to an Ilmateran convent near Thentia soon after that. Then Garin simply vanished for several years, leaving the red sail coster in the hands of his partners. No one knew where he'd gone. But a year ago, last Octar, he resurfaced in Tantris. I learned that he'd been in Mithdranor, where he'd won the favor of the coronel. There were rumors that he was suddenly exiled. I heard stories of a feud with a rival, a duel fought for the favor of an elf princess, even whispers of some black curse hanging over him that forced the coronel to send him away. Sergan smiled darkly. I still don't have the whole tale, but it seems clear that Garin left Mithdranor under a cloud. You should have seen his face when I asked him about it. My armsmen told me that he used magic when he confronted them in Erstenwold's shop, Darcy said, gazing thoughtfully down at her goblet. They said he carried a blade of elven steel, and I've heard that he used the same sort of sword magic against the crimson chains he and his little halfling friend cut apart in the tailings. Is that something he learned in Mythdranor? Sergan shrugged. I suspect the reports are exaggerated, since I've never known him to demonstrate any such ability. I doubt that Garin would have the aptitude or discipline to learn magic, but I suppose he might have found an enchanted sword during his travels. So what does his return signify for you? Darcy asked. Most likely nothing. I expect that Garin will tire of Hullberg and go back to Tantris, Mithdranor, or anywhere else but here soon enough. There is little to hold him here. He'll be gone within a ten-day. Most likely, Darcy agreed in a pleasant voice. But what if he decides to stay? What happens if you find yourself sharing your family responsibilities with another capable hullmaster who's not a spell-scarred bitch? Is there any chance that Grigor might decide that Garin would make a better regent for his grandson, Kerr? Than you? Or, for that matter, a better harmac? Her eyes glittered cruelly as she delivered the barb. Unthinkable, Sergan snapped. I've stayed in this miserable, sodden dung heap of a town for years, looking after all the business Grigor was too stupid or inattentive to look after for himself. Without me, the family would be penniless, and Hullberg would still be a wretched little backwater. Garin is of the Hullmaster blood, and you are not. You need not remind me. Sergan paced away from the fire, glaring at the row of bright windows that faced out over the town. He'd come to Hullberg as a boy of twelve, when his father, Kamoth, 
a merchant and adventurer from Hillsfar, married the Harmac's widowed sister, Tarina. The marriage had not gone well. Camoth was caught plotting against the Harmac and fled Hullberg to escape death or imprisonment. Sergen had been left among his stepfamily, an unwanted interloper in Griffin Watch. No one had ever accused him openly of disloyalty, but he'd heard the whispers and felt the suspicious stares throughout his adolescence. He'd resolved years ago to succeed where Camoth had failed, but to do that he'd had to embrace the name of the family that had ruined his father. He was long since ready to shed those pretenses and take what was rightfully his. Would it be useful if Garin met with some misfortune? Darcy asked. Sergon shook his head. Too obvious, he said. Everyone remembers all too well how Isselmar Hullmaster met his end, and now that Jared Erstenwold has been removed, how would it look if someone else close to the Harmac died under mysterious circumstances, even if I had nothing to do with it? Suspicion would naturally fall on my shoulders. Darcy rose from the couch and drifted over to where Sergon stood, resting a hand on his shoulder. It may become unavoidable if Garin continues to stumble into affairs that are none of his business. Sergon glanced over his shoulder at her. Perhaps we should set a spy on him to watch his movements. Hmm, I believe I have just the spy. Darcy slipped her hands around Sergon's chest and pressed herself close behind him. I will summon Umbril and set her on your cousin's trail. And, should Garin prove troublesome, he will never see her claws before she strikes. Make certain that your pet knows that she is not to kill Garin unless you order her to, Sergon answered. He turned to face Darcy and slid his hands around her waist. He leaned forward and nuzzled her neck, kissing the base of her throat. Hmm. Are you certain that you came here to talk about my cousin? Or did you have some other purpose in mind? Darcy let her hands slide inside his robes and caressed him. I interrupted your bath. The least I can do is to help you finish it. 7. Thirteen Chess, the Year of the Ageless One since it was still early when Garin, Kara, and Hamel returned to Griffin Watch, they sent to the kitchens for a small sack of food to take with them. They returned the buggy to its house and the horse team to the livery, since no roads led up into the high fells, and the few tracks that did returned to Griffin Watch. They sent to the kitchens for a small sack of food to take with them. They returned the buggy to its house and the horse team to the livery, since no roads led up into the high fells, and the few tracks that did wind up into the hills and moors were far too difficult for a wagon or carriage. Instead, they chose horses from the shield-sworn stables and saddled their mounts. Kara kept a horse of her own in Griffin Watch, a big roan mare named Dancer, that she'd trained for years. Garin chose a strong bay gelding, and for Hamel they found a small, sure-footed mare. Halflings generally found ponies better suited to them than horses, but Hamel had spent enough time around the larger animals to handle them easily enough, despite his small stature. An hour before noon they set off again. This time, instead of turning at the burned bridge, they followed the Vale Road north from Hullberg, keeping on the right bank of the Winter Spear. The river was shallow and swift, rushing over a stony bed in a broad, braided stream that narrowed quickly as they headed inland. Farms clustered close by the southern end of the valley amid stands of birch and ash, but as they continued northward the farms grew fewer and farther between. About three miles from Griffin Watch, the road passed through an old ditch and berm of earth, now grassy and overgrown. Lendon's Dyke! Garin told Hamel. My grandfather raised it more than fifty years ago, back when orc raids in the Winterspear Vale were common. He pointed toward the far side of the vale. Lake Hull lies under the western hills there, so the earthworks run less than two miles. Hamel studied the old fortifications. 
seem to have had little use of late. Garin nodded. Orcs haven't come into the Winterspear Vale in numbers since my father was a young man. The high fells make for good walls. A short distance beyond the old dike, Kara turned eastward along a cart track that ran past the long fieldstone cowsheds and hay cribs of an old dairy farm. The track petered out into a footpath and began to climb steeply up the side of the valley. Trees and brush thinned out quickly as they gained height, and soon they were picking their way through the steep meadows and mossy rock outcroppings of the hilltop. From their vantage they could see the broad path of the winter spear all the way to Hullberg's distant rooftops. Then they crossed over the crest, and they were in the high fells proper. To the north, a long line of low gray downs stretched off until they simply melted into the distance. Eastward, the rolling downs marched for miles until they began to climb up to meet the wooded ramparts of the Galena Mountains, perhaps twenty miles distant. Raw, blustery wind whistled through the grass and heather, pushing the brush first one way and then the other. The sky was blue and cloudless, marked only by a distant earth moat drifting aimlessly against the wind. Hamel surveyed the view. This is the so-called Great Grey Land of Thar. There doesn't seem to be much to see. Here, near the Moon Sea, the moorlands break up into the steep glens and valleys that we call the High Fells, Kara answered him. The wind blew her hair into her face, but she shook it off, paying no attention to the raw cold. But if you ride a few more miles north or west of here, yes, you'd be in Thar. "'How far does it run?' the halfling asked. "'From here west to the Dragonspine Mountains, and the ride beyond, close to two hundred miles.' Kara turned and pointed off to their right, where the mountains fenced the horizon. "'To the mountains? Not more than another twenty miles or so. Vasa's about seventy miles east of us, on the other side of the Galenas.' Hamel waved his hand at the downs ahead. "'And to the north?' For the most part, more of the same until you reach Glister, a hundred and fifty miles away, Garin said. There's a shifting stretch of dangerous, spell-plague-riddled changeland in the middle of the moor returned to Griffin Watch. They sent to the kitchens for a small sack of food to take with them. They returned the buggy to its house and the horse team to the livery, since no roads led up into the high fells, and the few tracks that did wind up into the hills and moors were far too difficult for her, and a couple of days' ride past Glister. There is a much wider stretch of changeland that runs for hundreds and hundreds of miles. All sorts of plague-changed monsters roam those lands, and sometimes they come down into Thar. No one I know of has ever found out what might be north of that, will return to Griffin Watch. They sent to the kitchens for a small sack of food to take with them. They returned the buggy to its house and the horse team to the livery, since no roads led up into the high fells, and the few tracks that did wind up into the hills and moors were far too difficult for will return to Griffin Watch. They sent to the kitchens for a small sack of food to take with them. They returned the buggy to its house and the horse team to the livery, since no roads led up into the high fells, and the few tracks that did wind up into the hills and moors were far too difficult for her, and a couple of days' ride past Glister. There is a much wider stretch of changeland that runs for hundreds and hundreds of miles. All sorts of plague-changed monsters roam those lands, and sometimes they come down into Thar. No one I know of has ever found out what might be north of that come down into Thar. No one I know of has ever found out what might be north of that, but sooner or later I imagine you would run into the great glacier and snows that never melt. And no one lives up here? None but orcs and ogres, and their tribes generally keep to the northerly parts of the moorland, Garin answered. Shepherds and goat herds graze their flocks up here in the summer time, but other than that, the land's not good for much. The soil's thin and poor and doesn't drain well. 
You'll want to be careful of your mount. This isn't good ground, and there are a thousand places where a horse can snap its ankle. The halfling silently absorbed the view for a moment. Garin could guess what he was thinking. The idea of so much land that was so wide, so open, and yet so desolate— was likely foreign to his experience. Hamel had grown up in the warm forests south of the Sea of Shining Stars. The Moon Sea's northern shores must have seemed like the very end of the world to him. For his own part, Garin found the cold, clean air and long views bracing. It was a hard land, to be sure, but it was a simple land. The complexities and confusion of life held less of a grip on his spirit here. He glanced over to Kara. Since her thirteenth summer, the summer when her spell-scar had manifested itself, she'd found a refuge up in those barren and lonely places. Garin and Jared used to come to the High Fells to savor the independence and freedom the wild country offered. But Kara had taken to spending as much time as she could in the wild land around Hullberg simply because there was no one there to shy away from the deformity of her spell-scar. He'd long since learned that Kara's spell-scar was not dangerous, but all too many people around Hallberg, or any place, really, regarded the spell-scarred with fear and suspicion. It didn't surprise him to see that Kara had continued to seek solitude in the high country in the years that he'd been away from Hallberg. They continued on, riding more east than north, keeping a cautious pace, no trees grew in the high fells, of course, but in small hollows or sheltered spots, thick, low gorse grew, and sometimes they found small shelters of fieldstone and turf in these places, lodges used by herdsmen in the warmer months. From time to time they came across sudden steep-sided stream beds, narrow and deep, or passed by old cairns and low, rounded barrow mounds and on one occasion they rode along the rim of a sharp, steep-sided bowl of changeland, easily two hundred feet deep, its sides made of glistening blue stone grooved with strange whorls. Garin remembered the place well. One summer afternoon in his fifteenth year, he and Jared had explored the sinkhole by roping themselves down to its floor, only to find that its lower reaches were honeycombed by crevices where repulsive, silver-winged, eel-like creatures laired. They'd had to climb back up with smoking torches clutched in their hands to keep the nasty things from chewing them to pieces. Another half-hour brought them to the edge of a barrow field, a wide expanse of small burial mounds. The southern borders of Thar were strewn with the ancient tombs left behind by people long since lost to history. Hundreds of the mounds lay within a day's ride of Hallberg. Sometimes dozens stood together within a few hundred yards of each other, and sometimes a single barrow stood all by itself, a dismal and lonely sentinel on the open downs. Garin had never learned why that was so. Kara stood up in her stirrups, taking a moment to gain her bearings as she studied the barrow field. This one was well ordered. The barrows stood in low rows, serried ranks of weary soldiers standing watch against the cold north wind. She looked left, then right, and nodded to herself. "'We're here,' she said. "'This way.' They followed behind Kara as she rode up to one of the larger barrows. Long ago someone had excavated its door, revealing a low, black opening in the hillside. The whole thing was better than a hundred feet across and almost twenty feet high, which suggested to Garin that someone important had been buried in the mound. Most barrows were quite a bit smaller. Kara slid out of her saddle, patted Dancer's muzzle, and made her way slowly into the open space before the barrow's black doorway, her head down and her eyes on the ground. Garin and Hamel dismounted as well, and waited for a moment as the rangers studied the moss-covered rocks and wiry grass of the hollow. Here, she said over her shoulder, this is where Jared was found. Garin felt a cold shiver in his heart, but he forced his feet into motion. He came up beside Kara, looking at the ground where she pointed. He couldn't see much, 
but that didn't surprise him. Kara had always been much better at reading tracks than he. Hamel joined them a moment later, squatting to run his fingers lightly over the ground. The shield sworn sent for me as soon as they learned Jared had been found, Kara said quietly. I had a good look at the scene later that day. You can't see much, since it's been almost a month now, and we've had a lot of rain since. But you can still make out the impression in the heather, there, and just a bit of rust from his mail. He'd been here for about two days before he was found. Garin took a deep breath and straightened up to look around the hollow. What do you make of it, Kara? Jared rode up from the south side of the barrow and hitched his horse back behind those boulders there. She pointed at a jumble of grey stone and gorse, a couple of bow-shots from the door, more or less back in the same direction from which they had just approached. He approached the barrow on foot, circled the area briefly, and chose a spot where he could lie low and watch the door, over there in the gorse. There's a depression that would make for good cover. I'll show you. She led them away from the barrow door about forty yards, angling away to the side, until they stood by a tuft of wiry brush. He waited here for a short time, perhaps an hour or so. Then a party of five riders approached the barrow from the south and dismounted right in front of the door there, four men and a woman. A fight followed. I think Jared wounded two men before he was cut down, right where his body was found, no one moved him. "'You're certain of all that?' Hamel asked. "'I told you. I had a good look at the scene.' Garin smiled humorlessly. "'What Kara isn't saying, Hamel, is that she's the best tracker between Melvant and Vasa. I'll say it for her. You can consider everything she just said ironclad fact, though I wouldn't be surprised if she's read a few more pieces of the puzzle she hasn't shared yet.' because she can't quite put them together. All I have left are guesses, Kara said. For example, I can't tell you why he rode to this particular barrow and waited here, nor can I tell you if the riders were the people he was waiting for. He might have guessed which barrow the crypt-breakers were likely to try next, Hamel suggested. Or, more likely, someone told him. He came to this barrow because he expected someone to be here. I think you're right, Hamel. Kara gave the halfling a long look. But that begs the question of whether Jared's source was sincere or lied to him in order to lure him to a place where he could be ambushed. Either way, it doesn't explain why Jared broke cover. From this spot, he could easily have seen he was outnumbered. With five riders to deal with, Jared should have stayed in his hiding place. You can see for yourself. If I get down under this brush, you can't see me from in front of the barrow. You would have to be right on top of me to know I was here. Garin closed his eyes. He found himself imagining the encounter. The black doorway and the low, rounded hillside, nervous horses tethered on a line, a sky of sullen gray-black rain, cold wind making the long grasses ripple and hiss. Jared, lying flat beneath the gorse, cold and wet, a big, strong man, with a long braid of straw-colored hair, scowling fiercely at himself as he debated whether to go for help or deal with matters himself. Was it a sudden, furious skirmish in the dell when he gave his location away? Or had he challenged the intruders, demanding their surrender? And who were the killers? A band of adventurers passing through? A reckless gang from town? Or men sworn to some guild or merchant company? Jared was always confident of his sword arm, Garin finally said. Maybe he was afraid the tomb robbers would elude him again if he rode away to gather more men. Or maybe he thought he could spy them out, mark their faces, and apprehend them later in town. Or maybe he didn't think the riders were enemies, Hamel said silently to Garin. To Kara, the halfling spoke aloud. Kara, earlier this morning you said that crypt-breaking was especially dangerous in Hullberg. Why is that? Isperus, the king in copper, Kara answered. He was a fearsome necromancer who ruled over this part of the Moon Sea hundreds of years ago. 
He survives as an undead lich who commands the dead of the barrow fields. Too many things that should lie dead and buried under stone rise and walk the high fells once their tombs are breached. It's one of the few laws the Harmax enforce without mercy, Garin added. No one is to open a tomb anywhere within land claimed by Hulberg, and it's considered high treason to collect anything of value buried in a barrow. Sensible enough, I suppose. Hamel glanced at the barrow and the moorland surrounding the old mound. He shook his head. A damned lonely place to die. They stood in silence for a moment, quietly surveying the scene. It was the middle of the afternoon. Garin guessed that they'd need to turn for home in an hour or so if they hoped to reach Hullaberg before dark. If there was anything to find here, he couldn't imagine what it might be. Kara had been over the ground more than twenty days ago, and if she hadn't found anything more then, he certainly wouldn't now. The wind shifted again and streamed the long grass atop the barrow to the other side, revealing a silver-green underside to the stalks. He shivered, and then his eye fell on the cramped, dark doorway leading into the barrow. Kara, he said, did anyone enter or leave the barrow? The ranger nodded. Yes, the riders did, after they killed Jared. But there isn't much inside, just a short passageway ending at a fieldstone wall. If they were tomb-breakers, they didn't do much to the place before giving up. Let's have a look anyway, Garin suggested. He led the way to the low, overgrown opening. It was half sunken into the side of the barrow, more like a storm cellar than an actual door. A cold, stale smell clung to the passage. He felt in his belt pouch for a copper coin and whispered the words of a simple light spell, one of the more elementary spells he happened to know. The coin began to shine with a bright yellow radiance, driving the darkness back into the hill. Holding the coin before him, Garin ducked under the heavy stone lintel, his right hand on his sword hilt. Hamel followed close behind him, and Kara hovered in the doorway, a tight frown on her face. As she'd said, the passage ran straight for a short distance, took a sharp right turn, and ended in a rough wall of stones piled high across the narrow corridor. Garin studied it for a moment, thinking. Something was odd here. He was sure of it. Many barrows were sealed by similar walls across the entranceway. The people who'd interred their chiefs and heroes in such places simply walled them up when the burial rites were over, and then buried the passage they'd used to carry the dead man and his belongings into the burial chamber. He knelt and felt at the floor by the base of the wall. Rock chips and discarded stones littered the ground atop a thin layer of damp dirt. Hamel, have a look at this, Garin said. I think this wall's been taken down and put up again. The halfling leaned close, studying the loosely piled fieldstone. You're right. All the dirt and mold from between the stones is knocked out. Kara leaned over his shoulder. Yes, I noticed that before. It didn't make sense to me. Why would tomb-breakers put the wall back behind them? Why, indeed, Garin murmured. Because they wanted to keep people out? or had they wanted to seal something inside? He found a deep, dirt-filled crevice between stones and the wall beside him, and wedged the illuminated coin into it to free his hands. All right, be ready. I'm going to move a few stones and have a look at what's on the other side. Garin, that might be dangerous, Kara warned. You know the Harmax law. I know it, but someone knocked this wall down and rebuilt it not too long ago, so it's hardly like we're the first people to open this barrow. Garin found a loose stone near the top and began to pry it out. Besides, if someone wanted to keep something dangerous inside, I doubt they would have taken the time to pile up rocks here. They'd have run for their horses and ridden off across the high fells. I think that this wall was piled up here to keep us out— "'possibly by the men who killed Jared. "'I want to know why.' "'Kara gave him an unhappy look, "'but she came forward and helped him pry stones away from the wall. 
Hamel stayed back out of the way, moving the rocks they dislodged back down the passage to keep the way clear. In a few minutes, Garin managed to open a sizable hole near the top of the wall. A cold breath of air with the distinct smell of stale meat sighed through the opening. "'I can smell something dead in there,' Kara said, grimacing. "'Maybe we shouldn't take out any more stones.' Garin paused and listened carefully. It felt cold, and the air was tainted. But he could not feel anything unnatural waiting in the darkness beyond. He and Hamel had plenty of experience with old crypts and tombs, including some that were haunted by the restless dead. He thought he knew the feel of such creatures close at hand. But, to reassure himself, he retrieved his shining coin from the crack where he'd wedged it, and held it close to the opening they'd made to peer through to the other side. He couldn't see much yet, just the hint of more passage beyond. Just a few more, he decided. If a white lunges out and claws off your face, it won't be my fault, Kara muttered, but she returned to the work, worrying free another stone. Garin did the same, and then he was able to put his shoulder to the remaining mass and shove over most of what was left with a terrible crash and a great cloud of dust and dirt. Coughing, he backed up to let the dust settle. In the dim yellow light of the spell, they found that the passage ran a bit farther to a burial chamber. Once it might have hidden the funereal wealth of an important chieftain, but it was clear that it had been emptied long ago likely by the same men who'd originally excavated the mound's doorway, Garin figured. The grave itself was a simple depression in the loose flagstone floor, covered by a chipped slab of roughly cut stone. The three companions spread out through the chamber, silently taking in the scene. "'I don't like this, Garin,' Hamel whispered in his mind. "'You say that the dead in this land don't rest well. We shouldn't be here.' "'Something isn't right here,' Garin answered him. He'd been in a few barrows long ago, mostly ones long since opened and home to nothing but mice and dust. The Harmac's prohibition did not apply to tombs that someone else had already opened, after all. But something in this burial mound was out of place. The air was cold, and the smell of death lingered more strongly there. Why does it still smell that way, he wondered. It was hundreds of years old. Someone has been in here recently, Kara said. She knelt, her fingers spread over the rough stones of the floor. Black earth and mold filled the crevices between the stones. The same men who were outside when Jared was here. I can tell by the boot prints, and there's a lot of old blood here. The tomb slab, Garin realized. He moved over and crouched beside the heavy stone that covered the grave. So some old party of tomb-breakers dug out the barrow and removed everything from this chamber, he mused aloud. But either they didn't take anything from the body under this slab, or they put the slab back when they were finished. Neither seems very likely to me. Kara glanced over from where she knelt, and she frowned. "'No, it's not,' she agreed. She moved beside him and looked for herself. "'This slab was dragged over and set here not long ago.' "'I thought so,' Garin answered. He glanced up at Kara and Hamel. "'Be ready in case I'm wrong.' Then he shifted to get his fingers under the edge of the slab, tested its weight briefly, and breathed, "'San hair, astily. Magical strength flooded into his limbs, and with one great heave he rose from his crouch, lifting with the power of his long legs, and threw the heavy slab away from the dank hole beneath. A sickening stench of foul air rose around him. "'Damnation!' Hamel hissed. Only a handful of despoiled bones remained of whatever chieftain had been buried there— but atop the ancient skeleton lay two additional bodies, the corpses of a young woman in a tattered dress of red wool and a short, broad-shouldered man in a shirt of mail. The woman's skin was darkened and tight, and her sightless eyes stared up at the ceiling. Her throat had been cut. The soldier's coat was dyed red from a wound just under his ribs that had left a long scarlet trail down his coat. 
The smell was strong and unpleasant, and Garin quickly backed away, covering his mouth and nose. Kara and Hamel did likewise. Two of Jared's killers, I suppose, he managed from under his hand. Kara held her hand over her nose. I think she's the woman who was with the riders. Her shoes match the marks I found outside. I was wondering why someone up in the high fells would wear shoes better suited for a dance hall. As for the warrior, he could very well be one of the men injured in the fight in front of the barrow door. Perhaps Jared managed to mortally wound one of his attackers before they cut him down. Do you know the woman? Garin asked. Kara shook her head. No, she could be anybody. She knelt and looked closely at the body. She's dressed like a townswoman, and her wrists are tied behind her back. What of the armsmen, Kara? Hamel asked. Look at the mail, Garin answered for her. It's barred horizontally, Molman style. That meant little in and of itself, but it was an unusual style. None of the armorers in Melvaunt or Thentia made their armor in that fashion. It was favored in the city of Molmaster. He realized that he'd noticed mercenaries wearing molman style mail recently, and simply hadn't thought much of it at the time. Thousands of armsmen wore molman armor, after all. The ranger looked at the man's body. No coin or jewelry that I can see. They didn't bother to strip the armor, but his weapons are gone, an old scar across his cheek. She frowned suddenly and straightened up. Damn, I think I've seen this man before. It's a little hard to tell in this condition, but that scar, I know I've seen it. Garin glanced at Hamel, then back to Kara. He waited in silence, allowing her to search her memory without interruption. After a moment, she gave a soft snort and nodded. He's a House Varuna man. I've seen him around town, usually in the company of other Varuna armsmen. Most of them are Mullmasterites and wear male coats just like this. He left his colors at home, naturally. There's nothing here to positively identify him as House Varuna. So they dragged the dead or dying armsman in here and left his body in the barrow grave. But why was the woman killed? Garin wondered aloud. I doubt she was part of the ambush, since she's hardly dressed for a fight. She outlived her usefulness, Hamel said darkly. The Varuna men brought her here as a prisoner, maybe for the purpose of luring your friend Jared to this spot. Once they'd killed him, she was nothing more than an inconvenient witness. Her bad fortune, I suppose. We only know of one Varuna who was here, and he's in the ground at our feet, Kara answered. We don't know for sure that the others were Varuna men, too. Garin made a sour face. I have a strong suspicion about that, especially after what Mira told me about Jared's missing dagger. Kara grimaced, but she didn't debate Garin's point. Instead, she stared at the two bodies, her azure eyes gleaming in the dim light. "'What I don't understand is why they left Jared outside,' she said. "'If they went to the trouble of burying two bodies in here, why not three? Why leave Jared out in the open to be found? If they'd simply dragged his body in here, too, we might still be looking for him.' "'That's simple,' Hamel said. "'They wanted his body found. The killers wanted to send a message.' something more pointed than an unsolved disappearance. But why bury these two here, where they might be found? It would have been better to carry these bodies away and bury them somewhere else. It would have been awkward if they'd met somebody else out in the high fells while carrying the bodies with them, Garin guessed. They were lazy, or perhaps they thought that the Harmax law would keep anyone from looking too closely at the barrel. He shook his head. It could be anything. All right, let's have some fresh air while we figure this out. They withdrew from the barrow chamber and made their way back out from the entrance, climbing into the bright afternoon sunlight. The wind was cool and deliciously fresh after the stale, dead murk of the barrow. Garin took several quick strides out into the hollow around the mound, straightening and stretching, before he realized that someone was standing by their horses watching him. Hamel, he hissed. 
the halfling stopped close behind him, and Kara halted too. They stared at the man who was watching them. He wasn't human. That much was apparent. His skin had a ruddy brick hue, and two sharp black horns jutted from his forehead. He dressed in a long coat of bright scarlet, embroidered with gold thread over a ruffled white shirt, and his black silk breeches were bloused into low boots of fine leather. "'You should be more careful,' the horned man said in a rasping voice. "'There are dangerous men abroad these days. They might have been lying in wait for you.' Garin set one hand on the hilt of his sword and slowly moved away from his friends. "'Well, it seems that we were fortunate to encounter you instead of them.' "'I didn't say I'm not a dangerous man, too,' the stranger replied. He carried a short, rune-carved staff in the crook of his left arm, but kept it at his side. He nodded at the barrow behind them. "'Did you find anything in there? Anything like a book?' "'A book? No, only corpses,' said Hamel with a scowl. He shifted behind Kara to hide his knife-hand from view. The horned man snorted impatiently. "'Well, of course. Barrows are full of them.' Garin narrowed his eyes. He could make out some of the sigils on the horned man's staff, and he didn't like what he saw. Unless he misjudged the horned man badly, they were dealing with a formidable sorcerer of some sort. Symbols of fire and lightning glinted among the rooms. "'Who are you?' Garin challenged. "'What are you doing here?' The sorcerer's nostrils flared. "'Who I am is no business but my own. "'As for what I'm doing here, well, I'm looking for something. "'But if this barrow's empty, then it would seem I am in the wrong place. "'I will trouble you no more.' "'With an eye over his shoulder, he turned away and started back down the thready trail. "'Not so fast,' Kara called after him. "'She hurried after him. "'In the name of the Harmac, stand where you are. "'I will have some answers from you.' The sorcerer glanced back in irritation. "'I think not,' he said, and he struck his staff to the ground. "'Arku! Zanastar! he cried, and then he leaped up into the air. His scarlet coat rippled behind him as he soared off into the sky. Kara swore and dashed over to where Dancer neighed and pranced nervously, reaching for the bow cased by the saddle. But by the time she retrieved the weapon— the horned sorcerer was only a distant speck in the sky, speeding away over the moorland until he topped a low rise and vanished from view. "'Damn!' she snarled. "'If that person was not involved in this somehow, then I'm an orc. What was he, anyway? Some manner of devil?' Hamel shook his head. "'No, a tiefling. They come from the distant east.' They've got some infernal blood in their veins, but they're not really devils. On the other hand, that fellow was clearly a sorcerer of no small skill, Garin added. I think you ought to be glad that you didn't have your bow closer to hand. If you'd shot at him, he might have taken offense. I don't care who or what he is. I won't stand by and let him spite the Harmac's laws, Kara retorted. She returned her bow to its case, still looking after the vanished sorcerer. Her brilliant eyes glowed with anger, and she turned away to collect herself. After a moment, she shook herself and looked at Garin. We should at least take the bodies back to Hullberg for a decent burial. I don't like the idea of leaving the woman out here for Isperus, and I intend to ask Darcy Varuna how one of her men ended up dead at the scene of Jared's murder. She still hasn't given me a good answer about the business at Erstenwold's anyway. We might as well get started, then, since the afternoon is getting on, Garin answered. They'd have to wrap the bodies well to keep the horses calm, double up on one of the mounts, and they wouldn't make very good speed returning to town. I'd just as soon not be out on the moors after dark. What's our next move, then? Hamel asked Garin. I'm not sure, he admitted. But I think I'll follow Miria's advice and try to figure out why Varuna's mercenaries are suddenly interested in barrows. Eight. Fourteen Chess, the Year of the Ageless One. 
Sometime in the cold hours before dawn, snow began to fall around Hallberg. When Garin awoke and looked out his window, the higher hilltops were covered with a dusting of white, and fat, wet flakes were sticking along the castle's turrets and rooftops. He performed his morning exercises in a fitful flurry that stopped and started several times as he practiced his forms. Spring snow was not at all unusual for the northern shores of the Moon Sea, but it rarely lasted long. The cold air spurred him fully awake and chased the last dregs of sleepiness from his mind. It had been a long ride back to Hallberg from the barrow the previous evening, and a longer night of explanations, as Kara insisted on setting down their recollections of the discovery inside the mound, before allowing Garin and Hamel to retire for the evening. She'd also been careful to set down their descriptions of the sinister sorcerer they'd encountered, too. Garin had no idea if anything would come of either account. He sincerely doubted that anyone at House Varuna would admit that the dead man was in the barrow on company business, and as for the sorcerer, he doubted whether the shield-sworn could arrest and hold such a creature against his will. It seemed unlikely that he had anything to do with Jared's murder or the deaths of the Varuna armsman and the townswoman, simply because Garin couldn't imagine why the fellow would return to the scene or ask them whether they'd found a book. He finally gave up with a shrug. Strange folk roamed the high fells at times. Either they'd see him again, or they wouldn't, and there was little point looking for him. Garin bathed quickly, dressed himself, and headed down to find himself some breakfast in the family great room, turning events over in his mind. By the time he'd finished his breakfast— and games of dragon's teeth with the younger hullmasters, Garin had decided on his next course of action. He clapped Hamel on the shoulder and said, "'I think I'd like to seek gainful employment for the day. If you're done with allowing Kerr to instruct you in grand strategy, why don't you come with me?' "'Gainful employment?' Hamel raised an eyebrow. "'Very well, then.' "'But I was winning, Garin,' Kerr groaned. Nonsense, Hamel replied. You were but one tile away from falling into my insidious trap. You'll see when we resume this contest. The halfling bowed to his diminutive opponent and followed Garin down through a servant's stair into the depths of the castle kitchens. In a few moments the two travellers came to the laundry room, where a couple of servant girls worked at a big tub of warm water, washing the castle's linens. Oh, so it's the wash, then? the halfling said glumly. "'All right, I suppose I have to earn my room and board somehow.' "'Some honest work would do you good,' Garin answered him. He spoke briefly to the young women working at the tubs, and they directed him to a large storeroom nearby. Battered old trunks packed with old clothing filled the room. Garin removed his sword-belt and began to rummage through the trunks— the sword-mage found a threadbare old tunic and a nondescript cloak of plain grey, and held them up for a look. "'Ah, this should do,' he said. "'For mucking out the stables?' asked the halfling. "'Not a bad idea, but that's not what I had in mind. I was thinking that we might look for some work as teamsters, and House Varuna might be a good place to look. I'd rather not be recognized. Here, try these.' Garin and Hamel soon enough patched together mismatched working garb to reasonably disguise themselves as common laborers. They stopped by the shield's worn armory, and Garin replaced his elven blade with a plain short sword of the sort that a poor driver might carry for defense against bandits. Hamel found a well-worn crossbow. Then they visited the stables and harnessed a simple buckboard wagon and a pair of mules and drove down from Griffin Watch into town, joining the stream of cart traffic and wagons rumbling along the Vale Road in the wet snow. They stayed east of the river, down to the lower bridge, crossed over to Bay Street, and drove along the wharves past the trade yards of various merchant costers, the Double Moon, House Sokol, House Marstall. Then they came to the Varuna compound and drove through its gates into the bustling yards beyond. Like most other trading companies in Hullberg, Varuna owned several storehouses that were enclosed together by a sturdy wall. 
barracks, offices, stables, a smithy, and the stone and timber houses of Varuna officials clustered together within the Varuna holding, a town within the town. It seems ordinary enough, Hamel said silently. This could be the red sail yard in Tantras. What are we looking for? The mercenaries, Garin answered. He looked around, sizing up the place. A handful of armsmen, in the green and white tabards of the house, watched over the business in the yard. They seemed bored and disinterested. I expect that most of the Varuna operations here are perfectly legitimate. So I'm not worried about what's in the storehouses or where it's going. I'm more interested in the cell swords. Mark them well. I want to find this man Erdinger, and I want to see if any of them are riding off into the high fells to go poke around in barrows when they don't think anyone is watching. The halfling nodded. That might take days, he warned. And it'll look a little suspicious if we just sit here all day, eavesdropping on the guards. I know, Garin replied. He spied the big Varuna armsman, Ban, the fellow he'd confronted in Mirja Erstenwold's store, and he carefully shifted to lower his hood over his face and keep his eyes away from the man. The mercenary led half a dozen more Varuna men past the wagon without giving Garin so much of a second glance, and headed out into Bay Street, intent on his own business. "'You recognize those men?' Hamel asked. I saw one of them at Miria's. Come on, we might as well ask about work. It'll give us a good chance to spy out the place, and we should fit right in. Fortunately, a fair number of the wagon drivers in the town were halflings. It was a little unusual for a human and halfling to work together, but not strange enough to be conspicuous, or so Garin hoped. Besides, he'd observed in the last few days that most of the wagons heading out of town carried at least two men. It always helped to have an extra hand along to carry a crossbow and keep an eye out for trouble. He swung himself down from the wagon and headed toward the nearest Varuna clerk he saw. The fellow was a tall, stoop-shouldered man with thinning hair and a heavy green cloak to ward off the wet snow. "'Well met!' Garin said gruffly. I've got a wagon and team for hire. Got any work for me? Just a moment. The Varuna clerk carried a small ledger and consulted it with a frown of annoyance. I'll need a load of stores taken up to a camp in the foothills soon. It pays five silvers, and you'll get fodder and stabling for your team and a hot meal for yourself. Good enough. Where am I going? You'll be with some other wagons. The other drivers know the way. Stay with them and you'll be fine. The clerk looked up at Garin. I haven't seen you before. New in town? Garin shrugged. I heard there's work and good coin here. We need all the drivers we can get. The clerk pointed at a storehouse across the compound. Take your wagon over there and tell Koger, he's the short fellow in the brown hood, that you've been hired for the Troll Hill train. You're expected to lend a hand with the loading and unloading. Garin gave him a resigned nod and returned to the wagon. We're hired, he told Hamel. Keep your eyes and ears open and we'll see what we can learn. The halfling grimaced. I hope they're paying us well at least. The two comrades spent most of the next five days hiring their wagon to house Varuna and driving provisions of all sorts out to the house's mining camps and lumber yards in the hills east of town. Garin and Hamel turned in a more or less honest day's work for their wages and made a point of trying to haggle a little more coin from the clerks, since Garin didn't want to attract attention for working too little or too much for the pay. As he'd hoped, the work gave him an excellent opportunity to examine for himself the extent of Varuna's holdings and watch their cell swords at close range. The mercenaries paid little attention to the teamsters who were constantly coming and going from the trade yard, and Garin and Hamel found plenty of opportunities to ask questions of their fellow drivers and listen in on the hired swords without raising too much suspicion. Garin soon learned much more about the merchant coster and their mercenaries. 
A noble family from Mulmaster owned the house. The Hullberg holdings were in the hands of Lady Darcy Varuna, who resided in a small manor on the slopes of the town's eastern headland, rarely visiting the merchant yards. Garin and Hamel could think of no legitimate reason to drive a wagon load up to her residence, and did not actually lay eyes on her, but they did learn that she was constantly attended by several ladies-in-waiting, manservants, and guards. A cadre of master merchants who answered to Lady Darcy oversaw the Varuna business in Hullberg's lands. The head of the Hullberg yard was a stout, black-bearded man named Tharman Kurtz, whose demanding nature and foul temper created no small amount of misery for the clerks. Master Tharman was nominally in charge, but the large contingent of sellswords who guarded the Varuna holdings did not answer to the Varuna master merchants. Small groups and bands of mercenaries in green and white came and went from the Hullberg yards and the other Varuna holdings constantly, sometimes escorting wagon loads of provisions bound for the camps, or timber, fur, and precious metals bound back to the merchant yards, but sometimes heading off on patrols or errands of their own. On the evening of the last day, sometimes escorting wagon loads of provisions bound for the camps, or timber, fur, and precious metals bound back to the merchant yards, but sometimes heading off on patrols or errands of their own. On the evening of the last day, just as they finished manhandling a load of hardwood plank, sometimes escorting wagon loads of provisions bound for the camps, or timber, fur, and precious metals bound back to the merchant yards, but sometimes heading off on patrols or errands of their own. On the evening of the last day, just as they finished manhandling a load of hardwood planks into the Hullberg storehouse, Half a dozen Varuna mercenaries rode into the merchant yard. At their head rode a lean, hawk-faced man, who wore his red hair shaved down to an angry orange stubble over his scalp. He wore enameled black half-plate armor under his Varuna surcoat, and he had a gold crest atop his helmet, which hung from the saddle horn. The red-haired man rode up to the master merchant's residence, swung down from the saddle, and handed the reins to a valet, while the rest of his men dismounted. Garin watched the sellsword over his mule team, idly patting the neck of the nearer animal. The mercenary stretched briefly and rolled his head from side to side, working out the kinks of a long trip in the saddle. "'Who was that?' Hamel asked quietly from the wagon's bench. The halfling was careful not to look directly at the mercenaries. "'I don't know,' Garin answered. He glanced to his left, where one of the Varuna teamsters they'd driven with was unhitching his own team and called over. "'Say, Bartolt, who's the captain over there?' The other driver looked over. "'Him? That's Erdinger. He's in charge of the armsmen.' You'll want to be careful around him. He's got a short temper. I heard that he beat another driver senseless when the fellow spilled a load into a ravine out near Troll Hill. Why do you want to know? Garin was too far away to see whether the Varuna captain was wearing an elven dagger at his belt. He peered closer, trying to get a better look, and realized that he was staring at the Varuna captain with far too much interest. He quickly looked back to the other driver and forced a lopsided grimace onto his face. "'I think I heard the same story out by Sterrett Lake. I was just wondering if that was the man.' Erdinger went inside the master merchant's house, and the rest of the guards dispersed. Garin and Hamel finished their work, collected their silvers from the paymaster, and drove slowly out of the Varuna yard. The sword-mage scowled, caught up in thought. He'd marked Erdinger well enough to recognize the man when he saw him again, but that begged the question of what to do next. None of the Varuna men seemed to have noticed his spying so far, but if he confronted the captain of their mercenaries, it would be difficult to conceal his identity, to say the least. He could try to figure out where Erdinger preferred to drink and eavesdrop on the fellow, or perhaps try to confront him away from the rest of the armsmen. 
But if the Varuna captain simply denied any involvement in the tomb-breakings or the murder of Jared Erstenwold, it would be difficult to compel him to speak the truth. Assume that Erdinger is involved in both, Garin decided. What did the Varunas want with the barrows anyway? Was it simply a matter of mercenaries looking for some easy riches that could be had from plundering the tombs of the forgotten dead, ignoring the danger that might attend? Or was it something that Erdinger had ordered his men to do for some reason of his own? "'Well, what now?' Hamel asked, interrupting Garin's musings. "'A good night's sleep so that we can get an early start on tomorrow's provisioning. If we get to the trade-yard at sunrise, I believe we could get in two round trips before dark and double our daily pittance. I think we're done playing at mule-drivers.' "'I thought I'd never hear you say that. "'Well, good. "'What do you propose next? "'Lie in wait for this fellow Erdinger and ambush him? "'Trail the Varuna blades and see where they go when they leave the camps? "'Some of them are likely patrolling the wildlands near the camps, "'watching for monsters or marauders,' Garin answered. "'He clicked his tongue at the mules and lightly flicked the reins "'to urge them onto the lower bridge.' There's little point in following them, and even if we were confident that we were following the right group of armsmen at the right time to catch them in some mischief, well, it's damned difficult to trail mounted men out on the high fells without being spotted yourself. No, I think we're going to have to lay a trap for them. We could start a rumor that someone else opened a barrow and found something, Hamel said, thinking aloud. With sufficient riches in the tale, they'd have to investigate. We could set watch over the barrow in our story and wait for them. Not a bad idea. But half of Hullberg might show up on our doorstep. Garin smiled grimly at the notion. Few native Hullbergans would open a tomb in defiance of the Harmax law. But the town was full of poor and desperate outlanders these days, and no laws pertained to looting burial mounds that were already standing open. We might waylay dozens of men before the ones we're looking for show up. We'd have to stack them up like cordwood behind the mound, so that we didn't scare away the rest. Hamel laughed and shook his head. I see your point. Never mind. We'll talk with my uncle tomorrow. Garin decided. He'll know which barrows have been broken into. Maybe we can discern some pattern to it all if we see more of the burial mounds the Varuna men have visited. To finish out their ruse, Garin and Hamel picked up a few barrels of salted meat and sacks of flour and drove back to the castle. Drivers delivered provisions to the garrison often enough that one more wagon wouldn't seem unusual. No one seemed to pay any special attention to them, so they left the wagon with the shield-sworn stables and returned to their rooms for much-needed baths, changes of clothing, and a good night's sleep in warm beds. In the morning, Garin rose, exercised, and dressed, then met Hamel in the great room. After breakfast, they made their way across the small court in front of Harmac's tower to the library. A steady, cold drizzle was falling, a mix of rain and sleet. As before, they found a pair of shield-sworn standing watch by the Harmac's door. A small handful of clerks and chamberlains hurried in and out, carrying out the business of the castle. Garin and Hamel waited only a moment before they were shown in to see his uncle. Grigor Hullmaster sat at his writing desk, studying a stack of parchment as they entered. "'Ah, Garin, Master Hamel,' the old lord said warmly. "'You have certainly made yourself scarce lately. "'I understand that you had quite an adventure with Kara a few days ago, "'and I've been waiting for a chance to ask you about it. "'I doubt I can add much to what Kara must have told you already,' Garin observed. "'He took the seat his uncle indicated. "'I wanted to see for myself the place where Jared was killed. "'So—' We rode up to the high fells to have a look. He went on to describe their exploration of the barrow to the best of his ability, including the discovery of the two bodies and the encounter with the strange sorcerer. Gregor listened attentively without interrupting. The Harmac might not have been a young man, 
but he had a keen memory and never forgot the details of a story. Garin knew that his uncle would get around to his own questions eventually, after he'd had ample time to weigh all the accounts. When Garin finished, Grigor leaned back in his leather chair. "'Weren't you worried about breaking into the barrel? You know that's dangerous.' Garin met his uncle's gaze evenly. "'Someone had moved those stones recently, and I wanted to know why. Kara didn't want to disturb the burial mound, but I thought there wasn't much risk.' "'As it turned out, you were right. It's not in Kara's nature to trust her intuition, but I'm glad that you trusted yours.' Grigor sighed heavily. I knew that Darcy Varuna and the rest of the Merchant Council had reasons to want Jared Erstenwold out of the way, but I had no reason to think that Varuna mercenaries might be involved with the tomb plundering that Jared was investigating. Speaking of which, I'd like to know exactly which barrows have been broken into and when, Garin said. Jared must have discerned some pattern to it. He had a reason for choosing that barrow to keep watch over. "'You believe the Varunas aren't finished plundering the barrows?' the Harmac asked. "'We've spent the last few days watching the Varuna sell swords,' Hamel said. "'Small bands of Darcy Varuna's armsmen are constantly coming and going from the camps and yards. By our rough count, we'd guess that as many as a third of the Varuna men, thirty to forty mercenaries, all told, mostly in bands of five or six at a time, are engaged in some activity that takes them away from Varuna mines, sawmills, and wagon trains.' The halfling glanced at Garin and back to the Harmac. "'We doubt they're all out patrolling the wilds at the same time.' The Harmac sat in silence for a long moment, gazing out the leaded glass windows of the library. Finally, he said, "'Assuming your suspicions are well-founded, Master Hamel, what business is it of yours? You are not sworn to my service, nor is Garin.' There is no reason to make Hullberg's troubles your troubles, too. As I told you before, my lord Harmac, I'm here to look after my partner. Hamel nodded at Garin. A few years back, when Garin and I were both members of the Company of the Dragon Shield, Garin saved my life at terrible risk to his own. I'm obligated to him for that, if nothing else. But beyond that, Garin is my friend, and his fights are my fights, too. The halfling paused. Besides, it seems that many of the foreigners in this town know your men all too well. We might be able to get answers your shield-sworn couldn't. In that you may be correct, Master Hamel. Grigor shifted his watery gaze to Garin. But, Garin, it doesn't explain why you've chosen to make this your fight. I've never blamed you for your decision to seek your fortune elsewhere— you have no debt to repay me or Hullberg. I've nothing in Tantras that I need to hurry back to, and I think I'll be staying a little while. Garin kept his eyes locked on the Harmax. I find that I'm not satisfied with the questions that are left unanswered, Uncle, and I don't like what I've seen so far of this Mulman merchant coaster that Sergen has apparently sold Hullberg to. This whole business doesn't sit well with me. "'Or with me,' the Harmac answered, with surprising firmness in his voice. "'Very well, then. I have the reports of tomb-breaking close at hand.' He pulled open a drawer in the desk, then checked another. "'Ah, here they are.' The old lord glanced through the papers and handed them to Garin. Most were in Jared's handwriting, simple and terse summaries of each break-in he'd discovered." There were five instances that we know about before Jared's encounter, Grigor said. Of course, there may be more we haven't discovered yet. There are literally hundreds of barrows scattered from Thentia to the ruins of Solasprin, and most are so far from traveled paths and grazing land that no one would ever know if they'd been broken into. Garin looked at them quickly and handed them to Hamel. He'd read them more thoroughly later. But first he wanted to see where the robbery attempts had taken place. 
He glanced at the crowded bookshelves in the Harmac study. Do you still have Walther's map, uncle? Of course, Grigor answered. He pushed himself to his feet with a slight wheeze and shuffled over to a rack where dozens of large leather cases lay gathering dust. He ran his frail fingers over each, muttering quietly to himself. Then he settled on one case and tapped it once before removing it and bringing it back to the desk. This is the one. Garin waited while Grigor carefully opened the case and pulled out the large, yellowed parchment map. He spread it out over the top of his desk. Garin and Hamel stood and gathered around to see it better. The map showed the hills and valleys around Hullberg in exquisite detail, dotted with lakes and bogs and crisscrossed by small streams and old footpaths. Small triangular marks speckled the lands surrounding the Winterspear Vale. My father hired the mapmaker, Walther, to make a survey of the Hullmaster lands, Grigor explained to Hamel. It would be more than fifty years ago now, but no one's ever taken a better measure of the lands around Hullberg. What are the triangles? the halfling asked. Marker cairns, Garin answered. You've seen a few already, the whitewashed stones out on the high fells. You'll see that Jared's letters begin by mentioning the cairn nearest to each of the broken barrows. Read them off to me, Hamel. The halfling looked back down at Jared's letters. The first is, let me see, twelve north-northeast, eight hundred yards southeast, right of small rise. You can make sense of that? The marker cairn is twelve miles north-northeast of Griffin Watch. From the marker... The barrow is eight hundred yards to the southeast. Garin found the marker symbol on the old map and carefully marked it with a pin. Hamel read off the rest, and Garin marked each. When he finished, no immediate pattern seemed obvious. Some of the barrows were east of the Winterspear Vale, some were west, and none were particularly close to each other. That doesn't help very much, Garin said. What did you expect to see? the Harmac asked. Garin sighed. "'I don't know,' he admitted. "'I was hoping that something might seem obvious once we'd looked at all of the locations together.' He looked at Hamel. "'How do you feel about sleeping under the stars tonight?' The halfling grimaced. "'It seems likely to rain all day, in case you hadn't noticed. "'If we leave soon, I imagine we could visit all these sites by midday tomorrow.' So it's only one night out in the high fells, and there are plenty of herdsmen's shelters and huts up there, so we'll probably have a roof over our heads. I think we'd be better off watching the Varunas, Hamel said sourly. I propose that we spy out the taverns their armsmen frequent and eavesdrop on them for a few evenings. We'll have to make ourselves comfortable, eat well, spend coin generously, and feign revelry— but I am willing to make those sacrifices. That seems to offer better prospects than riding around to look at abandoned barrows. We'll try your suggestion next, if the barrows have nothing to say to us, Garin glanced at his uncle. Can we borrow paper and ink? I'd like to copy down the locations. Of course. Grigor found Garin a small journal, and the sword mage carefully copied Jared's notes about the barrows that had been found open. He thought he knew at least two of the mounds already, just from Jared's descriptions, but distance and direction could be deceptive on the high fells. Garin did not want to spend hours riding around in circles, looking for a marker or a barrow because he hadn't bothered to write anything down. When he finished, he tucked the small book into his vest pocket. "'Thank you, Uncle,' he said. "'We'll be on our way. I expect we'll return tomorrow.' The Harmag took his hand. Be on your guard, Garin. I will see you soon. 9. Nineteen Chess, the Year of the Ageless One Orange pillars of smoke filled the night sky above the mining town of Glister. It was not much of a town by human standards, of course, little more than a permanent camp and trade meet in the foothills bordering Thar. 
Few women or children lived there. It was a place where hard and desperate men came to work and wring gold from the ground. Gold that they could then carry back to the so-called civilized lands and use to buy better lives. That did not diminish War Chief Murren's pleasure at Glister's pillage. His nostrils flared wide as he tasted the hot reek, wood, grain, straw, and wool burning in the ruin of the town, and the sweet smell of burning flesh, too. That was livestock, of course. The townsfolk had abandoned the town to the bloody skulls and their allies. A few screams echoing through the muddy, smoke-filled streets suggested that not all of the town's inhabitants had fled in time, but that sport wouldn't keep Murren's warriors entertained for long. A good beginning, Sutha said to him. She stood behind him, dressed in chain mail with the symbol of Luthic, the cave mother hanging on a chain around her neck. The skull guards surrounded them both, watching for any danger. Murren had reluctantly left Yvelda at Bloodskull Keep. He couldn't have the two of them alone while he went off to war, or he was sure that he would have returned home to find one or both of them dead. And Sutha's priestess magic was unquestionably useful on the battlefield. The weaklings fled at the mere sight of us. Murren shook his head. They were wise to give up the palisade and the town. We outnumber the humans and filthy dwarves ten to one. We would have slaughtered them all in an hour. He pointed to the unconquered stronghold at the top of the steep-sided hill on which the town stood. It was a crude stone fort known as the Anvil. Little more than a thick fieldstone wall enclosing the hilltop, it had a strongly defended gate and a single squat tower. That is where they will stand and fight. Other tribes before us have plundered the town, but none have taken the anvil. Glister is not destroyed until it falls. He grinned at the challenge of it and shook his spear. Come on, blood skulls. I want to hear for myself the bleating of the sheep in their little stone pen. He led the way beneath the open gate of the palisade and up through the town's rough, muddy streets. Glister stood on a rocky prominence in the center of a steep-sided valley, in the shadow of the Galena Mountains. The buildings were thick-walled bunkhouses and storehouses of fieldstone and turf, with a few ramshackle wooden buildings scattered here and there. Those accounted for most of the fires, since the stone and turf buildings did not burn well at all. One more measure of defense in a town whose location was decided by defense instead of comfort. Murren doubted whether there was much worth looting in the parts of the town that had been abandoned to the Bloody Skull Horde, but for the moment he was content to let his warriors and their allies have their fun. Soon enough there would be real work at hand. He heard heavy footsteps and snarling curses approaching from a side street and suppressed a growl of annoyance. The one-eyed priest Tangar stormed up to him, his fangs bared in fury. "'We are betrayed!' the servant of Graumsh roared. "'Where are the old, the weak, the women, the children? They have escaped us. The Vassan warned them of our attack!' Murren scowled careful not to allow his canines to show. As much as the priest irritated him, he couldn't risk an open break with Tangar and his followers. "'I did not think to surprise them, Tangar,' he answered with more patience than he felt. "'We have many spears. Of course the rock diggers and goat herders heard of our march. But do not fear, they did not run far.' The scouts told Murren that a number of the Glister folk had fled along the trails leading south to Melvont and Hullberg, but Murren's new Red Claw allies were watching those paths. Those humans who hoped to carry their families or their gold to safety would be easy prey for the wolf riders. He pointed up at the fortress with his spear. Most of the Glister folk hide behind the walls of the anvil with their gold and their women. No, they did not run far at all. 
he came to a broken storehouse at the upper end of the town, not more than eighty yards or so from the anvil's gatehouse. From there he had a good view of the challenge ahead. A narrow path led up to the sturdy, iron-riveted timber gates. The walls of the stronghold were not very tall, twenty feet or so, it seemed, but, other than the path leading to the gatehouse, it was a steep scramble up a bare and open slope to reach the foot of the walls, and Murren could see the dark shapes of bowmen and spearmen hiding behind the crenellations, waiting to repel an assault. No doubt the glister folk had food and water enough to withstand a siege of a month or more. The humans and dwarves who lived in this remote place had waited out more than one orc or ogre tribe, hiding behind their walls until the besieging forces grew hungry, or bored, or turned against each other. Murren did not intend to repeat the mistakes of chieftains before him. There would be no siege against the anvil. Instead, he meant to storm the stronghold before dawn. "'Bring the vassan here,' he told his skull guards. One of the warriors dipped his spear and jogged off into the smoke and darkness. A few minutes later he returned with the warlock knight Terov. The human wore his battle armor of black plate with the ram's head helm, but he seemed to handle the weight of the steel well. Several Vasan knights accompanied their lord, likely to protect him from any sudden misunderstandings with his bloody skull allies. The human glanced up at the walls, measuring the likelihood of an arrow from the ramparts, and then turned his back on the defenders contemptuously. "'Well done, War Chief Murren,' he said. "'You have boxed the badger in its den. Will you smoke him out, or do you have something else in mind?' "'We have not yet tested our new Vassan mail,' Murren answered. He had kept his own armor, which included heavy plates worked in the form of snarling demon faces over the mail he routinely wore, simply because he didn't want his warriors to think he'd become too close to the Vassans. But eight hundred of his best spearmen had traded their leather jerkins and crude scale shirts— for the strong Vassan hauberks, helms, and greaves. Since the glister folk had not defended their palisade or town, Murren hadn't yet had the opportunity to see how it stood up in battle. But he knew good steel, and Terov hadn't stinted on his promise. "'I will take the anvil before sunrise.' Terov nodded. "'Your warriors came here for a fight, and they haven't had one yet.' "'Better to give them one before they decide they're content with burning the town.' "'You understand us well,' Murren answered grudgingly. "'How can I help?' Murren pointed at the gatehouse. First, I want them blinded. Use your magic to conjure a fog or smoke before the gate, so that Gald and his ogres can get close without being feathered with arrows. Then, when I signal... I want your manticores and wyverns to rake the defenders from the wallop to the north, there. The warlock nodded. What of the giants? With my bloody skulls. Gold might force the gate, but the north wall is the attack that will carry. As you say, then, I will conjure you a fog. Send your orders to our monster handlers— and they will see to it that the flyers do as you command. Terov glanced once more at the battlements and strode away with his guards in tow. Murren growled in approval and turned away from the stronghold. Messengers, he called. Young warriors not quite grown enough to stand shield to shield in the tribe's muster leaped to their feet, ready for their duties. Murren quickly gave his commands, made each messenger repeat his orders twice, and sent them on their way, most to Bloody Skull Warbands, two to Gold the Ogre, two to Kroshk of the Red Claws, others to the Vassan's Monsters. Then he settled down to wait. He would do nothing until he received word back that his orders had been delivered. One by one his messengers returned. 
In the town below he began to hear the sounds of movement amid the roaring and crackle of the flames, the heavy tramp of armored feet, and the shouts of harsh voices. Sharp whip-cracks echoed through the darkness as leaders and priests beat and bludgeoned over-eager pillagers away from the meager prizes they had already found and brought them back into battle order. Dawn approaches, Sutha said. Murren glanced eastward. Pearly gray streaks were beginning to lighten the sky. Sunrise was not more than an hour away. No matter, he looked over to his drummers and said, Beat the first signal. The drummers seized their mallets and struck a long, slow roll on their massive instruments. Each war drum was a good five feet across, its voice so deep and powerful that it could carry for miles in the right conditions. In Glister's narrow veil, the high stone cliffs surrounding the town caught the heavy thoom, thoom beats and threw them back until it seemed the whole town quivered in response. Then Murren slashed his hand, and the drummers fell silent. From somewhere off to his right, he heard a human voice calling out some sort of invocation. A single torch came hurling out from the shadows of the buildings in that direction, clattering to the ground a short distance in front of the gatehouse. For a moment, the torch simply guttered there on the ground, and Murren's brow furrowed as he wondered if that paltry gesture was all that Terov could provide— in the way of magic. But then the torch began to smoke, to smoke heavily, and in the space of a few heartbeats it began to produce immense thick yellow-gray billows that heaped up over the spot where it lay, quickly hiding it. Two more torches arced through the night and landed on the hillside by the foot of the wall and began to smoke as well. In moments the whole wall facing Marin was obscured by the growing cloud. Cries of consternation rose from the dwarves and humans defending the wall. Now for Gull's part, Murren said. The second signal, now. Again the drummers began their ominous beat, and scores of great bellowing roars erupted in response. The skull-smasher ogres rushed out into the open from where they had waited, swarming up the path to the gatehouse. Each ogre stood almost ten feet tall, with long, powerful arms and short, crooked legs. Many carried huge hide shields, larger than a full-grown man or orc, and these led the way for their fellows. None of the skull-smashers wore much armor, trusting instead to their size and thick hides to protect them from arrows and spears. In the middle of the ogre assault, a dozen of the hulking beasts carried a crude ram, a tree trunk thirty feet long. They vanished into the smoke, and a moment later the first great thudding boom echoed from the anvil's gate. Stray arrows hissed out of the smoke, some finding ogre flesh, others simply disappearing into the night. "'Get ready,' Marin told his skull guards. Then he shouted to his drummers, "'The third signal, now!' The war drums shifted from their slow, heavy beat to a fast, frantic double time as a second drummer joined in at each, striking furiously. Murren leaped out and began to run toward the wall, his guards following him. From the dark streets north of the anvil, hundreds of bloody skull orcs poured out in a black river, slipping and scrambling as they swarmed up the steep hillside toward the fortress wall. Five hill giants strode ponderously alongside the orcs. If Murren had timed it right, the ogre assault on the gate— had drawn off many of the defenders, while on the south side of the anvil, where its towers stood, the red claws showered the ramparts with arrows, giving a demonstration of their own, and leaving the walls in front of the blood skulls with a perilously thin garrison. Those who remained raised more shouts of alarm, and began to loose arrows as fast as they could at the oncoming horde, and the orcs answered with a wild sea of battle cries, shouts, and screams of murderous rage. A wild arrow whistled out of the darkness. Murren caught it on his shield and kept going. 
Nearby, one of his skull guards suddenly screeched and dropped, kicking to the ground, shot through the eye by a lucky or skilled archer. The defenders began to drop heavy stones from the battlements. Even if they found no orc directly underneath, the stones bounced and rolled down the steep hillside with enough force to snap the legs or crush the ribs of those warriors who didn't see them coming. The war chief reached the relative safety of the wall footing, holding his shield over his head. "'The grapples!' he shouted. "'Hurry up, you dogs!' The steep hillside made scaling ladders almost useless against the anvil's walls, so the blood skulls carried grappling hooks and knotted ropes instead. Dozens sailed up and over the walls. The hill giants, some fairly well pin-cushioned by arrows by then, and furious on account of it, carried much heavier hooks affixed to chains that no mere sword blow would sever. They hurled their own hooks, and in moments dozens of orcs were swarming up the ropes and chains, pushing their way up with feet against the stone wall. The first few warriors, to begin their ascent, were cut down by arrows or crushed by stones dropped from above, and Murren swore viciously to himself. It was a good plan, but it could still go awry if— "'Where the manticores?' A panicked human voice shouted from over his head. The war chief risked a look from under his shield, just in time to see three of the great bat-winged monsters swoop down out of the darkness overhead. Each snapped its wings out to full extent, and arrested its flight for an instant, as its long, barbed tail whipped beneath its body, unleashing a hail of metallic spikes as deadly as crossbow corals. A few hasty arrows shot back at the flying monsters as they flapped away, then a pair of wyverns streaked over the battlements low and fast, snapping with their powerful jaws and knocking men down with their thickly muscled tails. One unlucky human was caught by a claw and carried away screaming into the night sky. Murren grinned at the sight and threw away his shield to grasp the grapple line closest to him and begin his own ascent. The whole time the flying monsters were harrying the defenders, the bloody skulls continued to climb. "'Up the ropes, bloody skulls! Don't give them a chance to recover!' he shouted and pulled himself upward. A handful of defenders returned to the wall-top and dropped more stones on the orcs milling at the foot of the wall. The grapple line next to his was suddenly severed, dropping several warriors back down to the ground. Not a lethal distance, but more of a fall than Murren would care to experience. Then two of the manticores swooped by again and loosed another fusillade of their tail-spikes. Iron clanged and clattered against stone, or sank into flesh with an awful sound. To his surprise, Murren reached the top and clambered over unmolested. He quickly moved away from the rope to make room for the skull guards following him, and drew a short fighting axe from his belt, since he'd had to leave his shield and spear on the ground below. Dozens of bloody skulls were already on the battlements, with more swarming up over the edge every moment. "'We have them,' Murren snarled. "'Die, orc!' a dwarf shouted near him, and sprang forward to bury his axe in Murren's neck with a powerful two-handed swing. The war-chief leaped inside the dwarf's axe-swing, and rammed the spike of his own fighting axe into the dwarf's face. Bone crunched and blood spurted. The dwarf howled and reeled back, but Murren followed and butchered him with a hail of short, furious strikes, hacking the dwarf again and again. He roared in triumph and let the blood madness take him, throwing himself headlong into the first knot of struggling warriors he saw. He struck with axe, with mailed fist, with kicks and punches, and even one frenzied bite when a luckless human was pushed into him. He sent the poor wretch screaming away from him, missing an ear that Murren spat out on the ground. He looked around for another foe, but no more warriors stood against him. Murren roared in frustration, then slowly shook himself out of his rage. There was no one left to fight 
because the bloody skulls had taken the wall. His warriors were streaming into the anvil's crowded bailey, where the glister folk shrieked and ran and wept in terror. Across the way, Gold's ogres had broken through the gate and were already at work on the small keep, whose rooftop had been left undefended, because the wyverns had alighted there to feast. "'It's done,' he said aloud. "'By Graumpsch, Black Spear, the anvil is ours.' Murren descended into the courtyard. Blood ran down his arm and dripped from his fingertips. Somewhere in the melee he'd taken a stab in the meat of his left arm, though he couldn't remember being wounded. That was the nature of the battle madness. Well, it would serve to increase his already considerable standing with his warriors. They would not forget that he had left some of his blood on the anvil's walls, just as they had. "'You have your victory, war chief. Glister is yours,' warlock knight Terov approached, picking his way through the dead and wounded. The Vossen's face remained hidden beneath his horned helm, but Murren could feel the man's confidence. "'Are you satisfied with our bargain?' "'You have done all you said you would,' the chief answered. "'But I think now that I could have taken Glister with the bloody skulls alone. It was weak.' "'Possibly,' Terov conceded. But how many more of your warriors would have died taking this stronghold, I wonder? No ogres to break down the gate, no manticores to scour the wall tops, no Vassen magic to blind the defenders at the crucial moment? I think you might have found it too costly for your taste, especially if the Red Claws were still your rivals, and perhaps jealous of your success. Enough, Murren said. I know what you have done for me, Tarov. So I ask again. Are you satisfied with our bargain? The war chief looked at the carnage of the taken fort and smiled coldly. I think I have a taste for more. We could be at Hullberg's doorstep in a ten-day, and that is a town worth pillaging. The warlock knight nodded. And you may if they refuse you tribute. But I have use for Hullberg, so if the Harmac accedes to your demands, you will not destroy it. Murren scowled. And if I refuse you? You and your bloody skulls may go your way, but I think you will find that the Skull Smashers and the Red Claws no longer answer to you. Nor will the Giants, the Manticores, or the Wyverns I doubt that you have the strength to overwhelm Hullberg without the aid I can provide. Murren did not like the idea of submitting to the human, but Terov did not lie. Like it or not, he needed the Vassen's aid if he hoped to continue his conquests. You have whetted my warriors' appetites for plunder, Terov. Now that they have tasted a victory such as this once, they will demand another— the warlock knight remained motionless. As I told you, Murren, I have need of Hullberg unless it refuses to yield. But I have no use for Thentia. I cannot promise that you will be able to march against Thentia this year. But if the orcs help me to master Hullberg, I will deliver you Thentia soon enough. Now, I ask for the final time. Are you satisfied with our bargain? The chief of the Bloody Skulls glanced to the east. The sun was coming up. Already his warriors were choosing new trophies for the great hall in Blood Skull Keep. More were almost within his grasp. He squeezed his left fist and watched the blood drops spatter on the ground. All right, Terov, he finally said. I am satisfied. I will swear your oath. Ten, twenty-one chess, the year of the ageless one. Garin decided to head for the farthest barrow first, then work his way back toward Hullberg. After provisioning themselves from the castle kitchens and choosing new mounts from the shield-sworn stables, a strong black charger for Garin and a big shaggy Teshin pony for Hamel, they rode again. 
This time they rode better than eight miles up the valley before climbing into the highlands west of the Vale. After a short rest and a cold lunch of dried sausage and sharp cheese, they ventured up into the moorlands proper, and the Winterspear Vale fell away behind them. During their previous ride into the high fells with the Kara, they'd traveled north and east from Hullberg, heading toward the Galena foothills. This time they were heading west and north, more or less straight into the open, rolling upland of Thar. These lands were drier and less boggy than the eastern high fells. Rain sweeping in from the west usually passed over the barren hills on this side of the winter spear vale as a wet, windy mist that didn't really turn to rain until it met the mounting rampart of the Galena Mountains. Barren sheets of rock began to appear underfoot, gray and damp, and the ground cover grew sparse and wiry. Garin pointed out two of the old marker cairns to Hamel as they rode past. The whitewash of the old stones was weathered almost completely away. Three miles from the place where they'd climbed out of the Winter Spear Vale, they came to a serrated fault of fluted rosy stone that marched across the land like a crooked titanic step ten feet tall and miles long, a ribbon of changeland dividing the moor. The trail led to a spot where the natural rise and fall of the ground brought them within two feet of the top of the winding pink wall. Garin and Hamel dismounted to lead their horses carefully to the top. The alien stone ran for miles like a sloping causeway or road, but it was not more than fifty feet in width. Carefully they picked their way across and back down to the natural moorland on the far side, their sodden cloaks flapping in the strong, steady wind. I find that my determination to follow you all over these dismal moors is rapidly waning, Garin, Hamel called against the steady, mournful moaning of the wind as they remounted. At this point I frankly don't care what the Varunas want with old barrows. It's not much farther now, Garin answered him. Four or five miles, and then you'll have an opportunity to get out of the rain and the wind. By clambering around in some musty, dank, foul-smelling barrow, likely filled with hungry whites or soul-stealing ghosts, the halfling shivered. What in the world do you think to find out here? If I knew, I wouldn't have to go look. The sword-mage allowed himself a small smile at his friend's complaining. Hamel was riding at his back and couldn't see it anyway. Garin twisted around in his saddle to address his companion, but something else caught at his eye. Atop the rose-colored rampart of Changeland receding behind them, he glimpsed a dark shape, something large and cat-like, that bounded quickly over the alien stone before leaping down out of sight. "'Behind us!' he hissed to Hamel reining in his horse. He pulled his mount around to the right and turned the animal in place to get a better view of their back trail. What? Hamel quickly glanced over his shoulder and then shifted his eyes back to the front and swept the area around them for close threats before following Garin's gaze back the way they had come. He reached down and freed his short bow from the holster by his knee. What did you see? I don't know. Garin said quietly. Nothing but tatters of mist lay behind them now. He stared for a long time, allowing himself to look past the landscape without really focusing on anything, letting the scene sink slowly into his eye, to no avail. Whatever he had glimpsed, it was no longer in sight, but he thought that he could just barely feel something on the moor with them. It looked like a big cat of some kind, perhaps a red tiger or a rock leopard, but it was black, and I thought it looked longer in the leg than a tiger or leopard. Are they common out in the high fells? No, they're not, Garin admitted. Red tigers favor woodland, and the leopards hunt in the high valleys and passes. I've seen a tiger or two closer to the foothills, but not around here. This isn't their kind of ground. They waited and watched for ten minutes more, anxiously searching the moorland around them. Nothing more appeared. 
Finally, Garin sighed and rubbed his eyes. Maybe I was seeing things. I don't believe that for an instant. Nor do I. Well, let's continue. If something's caught our scent, we'll just have to keep our eyes open and hope that it loses interest soon. Garin shook his head. When he closed his eyes to go to sleep tonight, he knew he'd be thinking about a quick cat-like shadow slinking over the moors toward him. If they didn't find a shelter or hut with a stout door, they might have to think about keeping watch. They rode on another hour more without catching any more glimpses of dark shadows on their trail, and then they found the marker cairn Garin was looking for. It stood near the edge of another old barrow field. A score of low, grass-covered mounds stood scattered at odd intervals for hundreds of yards around. The sword mage consulted the notes he'd taken in the Harmac study, carefully marked the direction from the cairn, and rode slowly toward the north. They passed several old, crumbling mounds, and found the one that had been broken into, exactly where Jared's notes had reported it. It was a relatively large and intact mound, round and dome-shaped, with a steep stairwell in its center, descending straight down between large plinths of stone. Muddy heaps of damp earth and loose rocks surrounded the stairwell, attesting to its recent excavation. The two travelers dismounted and rigged a picket line for their horses, and Garin decided to take down the saddlebags from his mount. Hamel noticed and frowned. Are we planning on staying here long? I don't know what I saw back by the stone wall, said Garin. But if something scares off our horses, I'd just as soon have my bedroll and my dinner with me, instead of bolting off across Thar. Point taken, the halfling replied. He followed Garin's example. The two travelers left their saddlebags by the stairs leading down into the barrow and descended into the gloom feeling their way down the narrow stone steps. Ami, Garin said softly, conjuring a simple globe of light to illuminate their way. The steps led them to a small antechamber, muddy and damp after lying open to the weather for months. The air was dank and stale, but the sword mage ducked down under the low arch and pressed forward, one hand on his sword hilt. Since the barrow had been plundered already, it seemed unlikely that any watchful undead waited there, but he didn't intend to be caught off his guard just in case he was wrong. The barrow proved to consist of three cramped chambers joined by low doorways. Little in the way of funereal wealth had been buried with its occupant, who rested beneath a heavy sarcophagus of stone under the dusty symbol of Lathander the ancient deity of the dawn. He was still widely worshipped under the name of a monitor, though Garin had always preferred Timora and Tempus, deities of luck and battle who looked favorably on adventurers. He moved closer to the stone crypt and glanced inside. The moldering bones of some long-dead person of importance stared sightlessly back up at him, still wrapped in the rotting remnants of a shroud. The tomb-breakers didn't take much, Hamel observed. He stood on tiptoe to peer down at the old skeleton. Look, there's still a couple of rings on the fingers. Why did they leave those? They're only copper, no precious stones. Yes, but if you go to all the trouble of excavating the stairs, why leave a penny behind? There could be a curse on the treasure. Or perhaps there's a ghost or something else equally unpleasant around, said Garin. Hamel frowned and quickly backed away a step. Garin decided to examine the floor more closely, just to make certain that he wasn't missing anything. He tapped on the old flagstones underfoot, listening for any hint of crypts hidden beneath this one, but the ground sounded solid enough. He turned his attention to the walls and determined that there simply wasn't anything more to the barrow. An old inscription was carved into the wall above the head of the sarcophagus. He moved closer and brushed his hand over the runes. "'Is that dwarvish?' Hamel asked. "'The runes are Deathek, but it's not dwarvish. It's old Tesharan.' 
They were the first humans to settle the lands north of the Moon Sea. They used the dwarf alphabet. Garin studied the markings carefully. I think it says, Here steeps Evan Deren. Hi. Counselor? Prince? I don't know that word. To Thentor, keeper of the... something. Servant of Lathander. Then there's some sort of prayer to Lathander. That seems to be all. Well, Evan Deren is a cryptic fellow, and I don't feel that he has been very forthcoming with his secrets, Hamill said. What else are we looking for, Garin? The sword mage shook his head. I don't think there's much more to see here. Let's head for the next barrel. It should be about three or four miles to the northeast. They climbed back up from Evan Darren's barrow, found that nothing had troubled their mounts while they were inside the mound, and saddled up again. They rode to the next barrow and found it more or less similar to the first, a round, dome-shaped structure with a steep stairwell cut into the roof. This one stood alone by a small hillock, with no other mounds nearby. Again they carefully picketed their mounts and descended into the mound. After an hour of exploring the second barrow's cramped passageways and musty chambers, they found nothing more than they had in Evan Darren's tomb. As before, Garin and Hamill carefully searched for secret passages, but the barrow was unremarkable. The high fells were littered with examples of similarly plain burial mounds. Garin climbed back out. The rain had finally let up, but the sky was still sullen and overcast. Two very ordinary barrows, neither with any appreciable wealth for the would-be thieves to remove, and neither haunted by fearsome specters or hateful whites. He supposed that most of the unopened barrows on the high fells were likewise uninteresting. Legends of barrow gold and barrow whites were probably greatly exaggerated. Maybe we'll find something more interesting at the next barrow, he muttered to himself. When they'd gone a little more than a mile, they passed a small herdsman's hut in a sheltered declivity. Garin reined in, looking the place over. The afternoon was growing late, and the ominous shadow he had seen earlier still weighed on his mind. "'Let's make camp here,' he suggested to Hamel. "'We don't have much daylight left, and I'd rather have a roof over my head than sleep out in the open tonight.' The halfling eyed the small structure distastefully. It was made of stones piled crudely in the rough outline of walls, chinked with old mud, and roofed with squares of turf. "'If you say so,' he said. They picketed the horses near the hut, built a fire from a small bundle of wood they'd brought along, and cooked up a simple supper as the sun was setting. Then Garin carefully drew warding sigils and spells around the hut. He'd learned a few such things in Myth Dranor, and while he was not very confident in his efforts, he figured that it certainly couldn't hurt anything to try. With that attended to, the two travelers secured the hut's door and stretched out their bedrolls on the bare wooden frames inside the shelter. The night passed quietly, though Garin found himself starting at every gust of wind or unexplained sound in the darkness. Once or twice the horses outside caught a scent they didn't like and wickered uncomfortably, but nothing drove them off or tried to eat them. In the morning their mounts were still there, whole and unharmed. Garin cooked some bacon over the coals, and they broke camp. The morning was misty and wet, but the wind was not blowing, and Garin had some hope that the overcast might burn off during the day. "'More barrows today?' Hamel asked, yawning. Three, I hope.' Garin stretched, then slowly turned in a circle to study the barrow's surroundings and get his bearings toward the next tomb-breaking. Then he frowned. "'What? What is it?' Hamel asked. "'The first barrow was on the edge of a whole field of burial mounds,' Garin said. "'There must have been a couple of dozen within a mile or less of the one that was opened. But there were no other barrows around the second mound. It was alone.' Is that unusual? No, I suppose not. There are plenty of barrows in the high fells that don't have other barrows nearby. Only... 
Why ride an hour to find another barrow to open when there were many others close at hand? Why skip those mounds and go on to the second one? They opened that one first and then moved on to the field we visited first, Hamel guessed. Perhaps they meant to open more of the barrows in the big field. Garin pulled out his pocket journal and checked the notes he'd taken in his uncle's study. Possibly, but the first barrow was found opened before the second one. The tomb breakers started with one barrow in the big field, then went to a different one several miles away. You know, the Malmasterites might just be looting random crypts. It could be pure happenstance if they chose either one. For all we know, they might be throwing dice to see which mound they open. Garin looked down at his friend. Do you really think so? Hamel sighed. No, not really. Let's go back to the first barrow and have another look around. There must be a reason why they chose it out of a field of dozens. I admire your conscientious attitude. I've decided to charge you for my services. I expect to be paid by the hour. Take all the time you like. Garin laughed and clapped a hand on Hamel's shoulder. In that case, you'll be disappointed to learn that the third barrow I intend to visit is back in that general direction. Evanderin's tomb isn't too far out of our way. Then the two travelers saddled their mounts again and spent the morning making their way back toward the first barrow they'd seen. As they approached, Garin paid more attention to the other barrows around Evanderin's mound. Some were very old, little more than crude heaps of fieldstone and turf that had long since fallen in on themselves. Others were long, rectangular mounds that looked almost as if someone had long ago buried a barbarian chieftain's hall in its entirety. The barrel where Jared had been ambushed was one of those. They returned to the Lathandarian's burial mound and dismounted, gazing around the landscape. The morning was growing late, but the skies showed signs of clearing. A bright wall of yellow sky showed to the west, marking the trailing edge of the rain clouds. "'Clear and cold when the clouds pass, I think,' Garin observed. Hamel didn't reply immediately. He was studying the closest of the barrows, staring at it intently. "'Garin,' he said, "'is there any significance to the different styles of the mounds? That one over there is a big rectangular affair, but the next one past it is a tumbled-down heap of fieldstones like a giant cairn. Did different people raise them?' "'I don't know,' Garin scratched at his chin. It was plain as day now that Hamel had pointed it out but he'd never really given it a moment's thought before. It seems likely. Some are clearly much more weathered than others. I'd guess they might be centuries older. For that matter, they might not be human at all. Some of these might hold dwarves or orcs or even ogres. This is the same type of barrow as the second one we saw yesterday. Look, they're both round not too large, finished with dressed stone, and they both have entrance stairways near the middle of the mound. Hamel glanced up at him. The Varuna men might be looking for barrows of that type. Garin nodded. For that matter, this was the tomb of a Lathandarian, and there was Lathander's symbol on the sarcophagus in the second barrow, too. He pulled out the pocket journal and checked his notes on the remaining barrows, then measured the weather with a quick glance at the sky. The next barrow on the list is another five miles or so. If we hurry, we can visit it and still have a little time to move on to the next one before dark. They headed south, angling indirectly back toward Hullberg across the open, trackless moorland to save time. For the moment, no more mysterious black shadows dogged their trail. Perhaps whatever it was had given up the chase, if, in fact, it had ever been pursuing them. Around noon they halted to make a quick lunch from the provisions they still had on hand. The cloud cover had drifted far to the east, and the wind was beginning to pick up. It might have been wiser to rest their mounts a little more, but curiosity gripped Garin. He wanted to see what the third barrow would tell them. 
Another hour of riding brought them to the third barrow on the list. This one sat in a small hollow, not far from a tumble of old stones that once might have been a circle of men here's. The instant Garin caught sight of the old burial mound, he grimaced and reined in his mount. Beside him, Hamel did the same. They exchanged glances, then slowly rode closer. It was a circular mound, small, with sides of roughly dressed stone. Someone had excavated the old stairwell in the middle of the mound, leaving heaps of damp black earth and small stones to mark their digging. "'Well, well,' Garin murmured. "'Perhaps you were right, Hamel.' "'Best go inside and make sure,' the halfling replied. As before, they picketed their mounts, then scrambled up on top of the low mound. Garin summoned his light spell again, and they descended into the mound." This one showed more signs of damage. Several old doorways had been sealed with fieldstone and mortar by the mound's builders, and the rubble of freshly broken rock showed that the intruders had knocked them apart with pry bars and sledges. They found the sarcophagus lying open, the bones it contained scattered haphazardly in the burial chamber. The stone lid of the crypt was lying to one side, broken into three pieces. But the sunrise emblem of Lathander was still intact on the largest piece. More of the death egg runes graced the broken stone. Garin knelt beside it and ran his fingers over the engraved letters. It says, Sister Castina Ellen, he read aloud, Born Thenter, Year of the Keening Gale, died Thar, year of slaughter. She fell in battle against the burning fist horde. That makes three, Hamel said quietly. Your Mulmasterites are searching for a specific barrow. It's the tomb of a Lathandarian. Do you want to check the fourth and fifth to be sure? They're on the way back home, so no reason not to, Garin said. But at this point I'm inclined to agree, Hamel. I certainly wouldn't wager against you. He rocked back on his heels and looked around, frowning in thought. This tomb seems to have been plundered more aggressively than the last two, he observed. There's a lot more damage here. Perhaps there was treasure worth carrying away. Or maybe we're looking at the work of two different gangs. One's more careful and the other more concerned with speed than with safety. Hamel peeked into the room's antechambers and shook his head. Not much left in here now, that's for certain. It's not a good idea to carry off Barrow treasure anyway. I wouldn't want to explain to Kara or my uncle how your pockets came to be stuffed with gold. They might not expect much of me, but I'm sure they expect at least that much. Well, the Varuna men seem inclined to flout the Harmax law— what about barrel gold they've already removed? If we take it from them, we can hardly be expected to put it back. First, we need to find the men who broke into this barrel. And I remind you, they might not be House Varuna. Garin nodded at the stairs leading back out of the barrel. Come on, Hamel. I'd like to see one more barrow to be sure of things. 11. Twenty-three chess, the year of the Ageless One. The fourth barrow was only about two miles farther on, but it proved difficult to find. Garin and Hamel crisscrossed a low, fence-like ridge of old weathered tors, pocked with crudely built fieldstone cairns, for almost two hours, before they finally found the right burial mound. Garin couldn't imagine how anyone had noticed that it had been broken into, since it was well off any track or footpath he could find. In any event, it was another round, dome-shaped one, as they'd come to expect. "'Care to wager whether it's a priest of Lathander in there?' Hamel asked. Garin just shook his head in reply. Inside they found that even less of the interior had survived intact— than the third mound they'd visited. Garin couldn't be certain that it was a Lathandarian's tomb at all. 
but the construction of the place was similar enough to the other mounds that it seemed to him that someone looking for tombs of a particular appearance might have included it just to be thorough. After sifting through the debris for an hour, they gave up and climbed back into the thickening dusk. A hand's breadth of ruddy orange remained on the western horizon, and the wind was picking up again, keen and shrill. "'You should have taken the bet,' said Hamel. "'If I had, you'd still be inside looking for proof that you'd won,' Garin said. "'As it was, that's the last of our daylight.' He shivered. The night promised to be bitterly cold, and he hadn't seen any suitable shelters in quite some time. They could sleep in the barrow, which would be covered from the weather and reasonably defensible, but he didn't see much that would fuel a fire nearby. Nor did he especially care to sleep in a burial mound. They hadn't seen any restless spirits yet, but the back of Garin's neck prickled at the thought of closing his eyes in the dank stone tomb. If that didn't invite a haunting of some sort, he didn't know what would. Hamel glanced around the rocky hollow where the barrow stood, and he frowned. "'I think I can hear something on the wind, Garin,' the halfling said quietly. "'We need to be careful tonight.' "'I feel it, too,' Garin turned in a circle, scanning the moorland around them. "'Most of the time the high fells aren't that bad when the sun goes down.' but every now and then you get a night when dark things stir. This feels like it might be one. Stay here or find another spot to bed down? I don't want to stay here, but I can't promise anything better. The sword mage ran a hand through his hair and sighed. If this is a Lathandarian tomb, chances are good it's warded against undead. It could be. Garin stopped and glanced toward the south. Hamel had given him an idea. "'Wait. I think I know where we can spend the night, and we might find someone who can tell us something about Lathandarian tombs, too. There's an old abbey five or six miles from here. It's mostly in ruins, but some monks still live there.' Six miles? That's going to be a long, cold ride,' Hamel said dubiously. "'Can you find your way there in the dark?' "'I'm not Kara, but I'll do my best.' Garin leaped down from the mound and gathered up his saddlebags. If nothing else, we might find a better place to camp along the way. They'd left their horses saddled, since they hadn't expected to spend much time at the fourth barrow. The two companions quickly gathered their belongings, tightened the saddle straps, and mounted. Garin took a moment to mark his heading as best he could, then set off at a good trot, posting with his mount's easy gait. It would be a hard ride, but if he didn't get lost, or if the horse didn't step in a hole in the dark, it would not be much more than an hour. He glanced back at Hamel, but the halfling's big pony seemed to keep up well enough. They jogged over the moors as the sunset faded to a dull red crescent limbing the horizon to their right, and stars began to emerge from the retreating overcast. The wind grew stronger, hissing through the long grasses and moaning over the bare gray stone. Garin's hands soon ached with cold, and he shivered inside his cloak. When they'd gone two miles or so, it had grown dark enough that he began to seriously worry about one of the horses missing a step. So he cast another light spell and set the dim blue globe bobbing a few feet in front of him. "'Anything within a mile of us will see that light, Garin,' Hamel called. "'I know, but I don't want to risk the horses in the dark. "'It'll be a long walk if one of them breaks a leg.' "'The horizon was no longer visible, "'and Garin couldn't make out his landmarks any longer. "'He picked a dim star that he hoped was in the right direction "'and urged his horse onward. "'The jogging pace was beginning to wear on him, "'making his thighs and back ache.' Some subtle note in the wind changed, and the steady moaning took on a new tone. Cold, distant voices seemed to mutter and whisper in the wind, and Garin's heart skipped a beat. "'Barrow's spirits,' he said softly. "'Ghosts, wraiths, some sort of dreadful phantoms. Whatever they were, they meant no good to the living.' 
He and Hamill needed to get off the moor, or they'd soon find out exactly what was abroad on the night wind. "'Do you hear them?' Hamill called silently. Garin simply nodded in response. He felt something drawing closer, and glanced quickly to either side. Nothing was there, but when he looked again at the path in front of him, a spectral figure seemed to hover in the air a short distance before him. It was the image of an ancient warrior, dressed in the simple male hauberk and nasaled helm a warrior of five centuries past might have worn. His braided beard was gray and tattered, and his blank eyes shone with a pale green light. "'Thy doom is upon thee, mortal,' the ghost whispered. "'Thou shalt sleep under cold stars this night, and ever again the sun shall find thee.' Garin's horse tossed its head in panic, and icy dread seemed to rob the sword-mage of his will. He stared at the apparition for a long, terrible moment. Then he tugged at the reins and turned his horse away from the dour spirit. He kicked his heels to the animal's flanks, and with a shrill whinny of terror the black charger bolted off into the night. Garin leaned down low over its neck and let the animal run. He heard the hoofbeats of Hamel's mount falling behind him. Finally he slowed the horse's pace, and Hamel soon caught up. "'Don't stop now,' the halfling said. "'I think it's following us.' Garin kicked his mount back to speed, and led Hamel over the moors. Whatever track they were following was long behind them, and he did not want to try to find it again. They came to a steep-sided gully that cut across their path, and Garin swore. He had to detour one way or the other around it. His sense of direction told him to veer left— but in that direction the terrain generally became more rugged as the land descended toward the Winter Spear Vale. To the right they had a better chance of finding a place to cross, but he was afraid that would set them even farther off course. The Sword Mage grimaced and decided to head right first. They rode westward for several hundred yards, and the gully shallowed enough to cross. When they scrambled back up the other side, Garin caught a glimpse of a dim yellow light far across the moor. "'Thank Timora,' he breathed aloud. "'I think that's the abbey.' "'Good,' Hamel replied through chattering teeth. The travellers picked up their pace, following the distant light. For a long time it seemed to recede before them, never growing brighter. But finally they began to make up the ground— and a sprawling heap of broken towers and grass-grown stone appeared atop a short, steep-sided hill. Faint light showed from a few shuttered windows, and a lantern swinging in the wind. They crossed an old stone-flagged causeway and scrambled up onto the road, and Garin breathed a sigh of relief as they stretched out into an easy canter and hurried the last few hundred yards. They rode up to the weather-beaten door in the crumbling wall and dismounted. Garin found a pull-rope by the door and tugged on it. From somewhere inside he heard the flat clang of a small bell. Nothing happened for a while, and he rang the bell again. Then he heard the rasp of wood on wood, and a small port in the door opened. The eyes of an aged man gazed out at him. "'Yes?' the fellow asked. "'Who are you, and what do you want at this hour when no honest folk are abroad?' "'I'm Garin Hullmaster, and this is my companion Hamel Alderhart. I ask shelter for the night, and I'd like to speak with the initiate mother.' The monk's eyebrows rose. "'Garin Hullmaster, what in the world are you doing out here tonight, lad? It's the dark of the moon.' "'Don't you know who walks the high fells on nights such as this?' "'I'd rather not find out. Can we come in?' "'Yes, yes, just a moment.' The port closed. Then a heavier timber slid somewhere out of sight, and the abbey gate opened. The old monk appeared in the doorway, a lantern, in his hand. "'Come on, then.' "'Hurry, lads! It's not safe to linger outside the walls tonight.' 
Garin and Hamel led their horses into the doorway and found themselves standing in an old courtyard. The monk pushed the heavy door closed and slid the bar back in place before turning to face them again. "'Welcome to Rosestone,' he said with a wry smile. "'I know the Abbey has seen better days, but you're safe enough inside these walls. I'm Brother Aaron. Here, let's stable your mounts and get you something to eat.' "'Thank you, Brother Aaron,' Garin murmured. He glanced around at the crumbling towers and the broken pavement of the courtyard, then followed the old monk to a stable that evidently had not seen a horse in quite some time. Still, it was better than spending the night outside. He could no longer hear the chill voices in the wind, which led him to guess that old priestly wardings likely kept the restless dead far from Rosestone Abbey. After stabling their animals, Garin and Hamel followed Aaron to the abbey's refractory. A handful of other monks waited there, and they provided the two comrades with a plain dinner of cured ham, boiled potatoes, black bread, and sharp white cheese, washed down with a tankard of hot cider. "'All right, Garin,' Hamel admitted. "'This is better than huddling in some barrow out in those dreary hills, waiting for ghosts to come for us. But we were lucky to find the abbey when we did. There was a whole company of ghosts following us for that last mile.' "'You didn't say anything about that?' Garin said. The halfling shrugged. "'I wanted you to keep your eyes on what was ahead of us. I was keeping watch behind.' When they finished with their supper, Brother Aaron appeared by the table and bowed. "'Gentlemen, if you please, the initiate mother would like a word with you. Will you follow me?' The two companions pushed themselves away from the table, rose, and followed the aged monk. He led them through a maze of passageways that took him through the main chapel, a tall room whose eastern wall was graced with a great window of stained glass, depicting a glorious sunrise in panels of red, rose, and gold, and then a dark scriptorium filled with wooden writing desks and scroll racks. For all of the abbey's weathering and the poor condition of its outer walls and towers, the interior seemed to be in good shape. On the far side of the scriptorium, Aaron led them to a sturdy wooden door in a deep stone arch and knocked twice. "'Initiate, mother,' he called, "'I have brought Garin and his companion.' "'Enter,' a muffled voice called. Aaron opened the door and led them into a small study or office, sparsely furnished. A stocky woman in yellow robes with iron-gray hair and a nut-brown complexion waited for them by the fire. She had a stern, lined face that would have been quite severe if not for her warm brown eyes, well creased by crow's feet. "'Ah, Garen Hullmaster,' she said in a rich, melodious voice, "'I have not laid eyes on you in ten years or more, and this must be Master Alderheart.' I confess I am more than a little surprised to find you on my doorstep on such a bitter evening. Mother Mara, Garin said with a smile. He'd always liked her. From time to time he and Jared had passed by the abbey in their youthful ramblings, and the monks of Amonitor had always been happy to set places at their table for two hungry young hunters. He crossed the room to bow and take her offered hand, raising it to his lips. "'I'm glad that Brother Aaron let us in. It would have been a long, cold night otherwise.' "'We are honored to be of service,' she replied. "'Please sit. I've heard that you were back in Hullberg, but I would love to know what business brought you out on the high fells this evening.' Garin looked around and found a plain wooden chair. He seated himself, while Hamel scrambled up into a matching one nearby, and the initiate mother took a seat across from them. "'We're looking for tomb robbers,' he answered. "'My uncle told me that Jared Erstenwold was found near a broken barrow, and that he'd been chasing after some gang of robbers who were opening burial mounds when he was killed.' 
I decided to look into it for myself, and Hamill here offered to help me. We spent the day visiting tombs that had been broken into recently, but I suppose we stayed out later than we should have. The abbess nodded. Yes, I know about the tomb breakings, but I hadn't heard that they were connected with Jared's murder. Have you learned anything new? Maybe, Garin said. We've got reason to believe that one of the merchant houses in Hullberg is involved, and we might have learned something important this evening. All of the barrows that were broken into were burial mounds of priests of Lathander. The abbess sat up straighter and locked her eyes on Garin's. That I did not know. Go on. The tombs we've seen look to be about the same age. Going by the inscriptions we can make out, I'd guess they date back about four or five centuries to the time of Thenter, Garin continued. Do you have any idea why the tomb-breakers would choose those barrows and ignore any others? What could they be looking for? The priestess frowned and looked down at her hands, thinking for a long time. Finally, she shook her head. "'I can't imagine what they expect to find, Garin,' she said. "'As you know, a monitor was called Lathander in those days. So these are the tombs of the fathers of our faith you are speaking of. But, to the best of my knowledge, none of my antecedents were buried with any great treasure. I expect that the barrows of old Tesharan chieftains or ogre kings— would be much more attractive to those who seek to plunder the wealth of the dead. Garin scowled and sat back. If Mara didn't know why those tombs might be important, he didn't know who would. Maybe he could find something in the Harmax library that could shed some light on the mystery. Initiate Mother, Hamill said slowly, do you think they might be looking for a book? He glanced over to Garin and shrugged. The sorcerer was looking for one, after all. Maybe they're after the same thing. A book! The priestess's brow furrowed in concentration, and then surprise flickered across her face. A book! Yes, it is indeed possible, Master Hamel. They might be looking for the Infernadex of Isperus. Hamel glanced at Garin and back to Mara. The what? Of what? he asked. The Infernadex, a book of spells or rites that once belonged to Isperus. By all accounts it was filled with dire and dangerous invocations. It lies in the tomb of a priest of Lathander. The halfling grimaced. Garin, Isperus is the lich you and Kara were talking about a few days ago, right? Garin nodded. He's called the King in Copper. Why, I couldn't tell you. He came to power in the city of Thentia several centuries ago, and brought much of the Moon Sea North under his dominion, including Holberg. His realm is known as Thentur, and the old stories say that he used necromancy to cling to power for many years. Eventually the people rose up against his tyranny and overthrew him. Hullberg and the other towns and cities under Thenter's dominion became free, and Isperus fled. Many years later he turned up again as a powerful lich, haunting some place under the high fells known as the Vault of the Dead. It's said that he's the master of all the undead of Thar. He looked back to the initiate mother. But I've never heard any story about a book of his that might have ended up in a Lathandarian tomb. You know... "'Only part of the story, Garin,' Mara answered. "'Few remember it now, but the chief agents of Isperus's defeat in Thentur "'were the priests of Lathander, led by the high mourning lady Terlenis. "'She and her priests rallied the people of Thentia and Hullberg against the tyrant. "'The war to defeat Isperus took years.' but Terlanus and her forces slowly pushed the king and his loyalists to the eastern frontiers of the realm, where Isperus held out in a strong fortress called the Wailing Tower. 
After a long siege, the Lathandarians successfully stormed the Wailing Tower, broke Isperus's army, and raised their stronghold. They found no sign of the king, but they seized many of his weapons and treasures, including the Infernadex. Isperus eluded Terlanus, but he escaped with little more than the robes on his back. How do you know all this? Garin asked. I have read the accounts of the rebellion Terlanus herself set down after her victory. She was quite thorough in describing the wizard king's treasures and the dispositions she made with them. Some things she destroyed, some she felt safe in giving away, and other things she thought best to conceal and protect. Mara folded her hands in her lap and met his gaze calmly. The Infernadex is the only book mentioned by name in her accounts. She feared that the book might survive any attempt to destroy it and perhaps reassemble itself in some distant land, so she directed it to be safely interred for all time, guarded by powerful wards. In fact, when her death approached, Terlanus instructed her followers to entomb the book with her, so that Lathander's blessings would keep the Infernadex hidden from evil hands forever. The book lies in her crypt. So, if the tomb-breakers are indeed looking for this magical tome, then they're not simply looking for Lathandarian tombs, Hamel said. They're looking for the tomb of Terlanus. The halfling scratched at his chin, collecting his thoughts for a moment, before looking back up to Garin. How many Lathandarians are buried on the high fells? Do we have any idea how many burial mounds the Varunas have to search? Garin started to shrug helplessly, but the initiate mother answered for him. Somewhere around eighty-five or so, Master Hamel. Hamel winced. So many? Some are priests, and others are laymen who gave noteworthy service to Lathander during their lives. We have good records of which mounds are sacred to a monitor, since we naturally honor those who followed the Sun Lord in his earlier incarnation as the Dawn Lord. Well, it's a start, at least, Garin pointed out to Hamel. We think we know who's opening barrows, and we think we know what they're looking for. The vast majority of the burial mounds around Hullberg are no longer of interest to us. We can concentrate on the Lathandarian mounds, and maybe we can determine which are likely to be visited next. He returned his attention to the abbess. Do your records mention any distinguishing features of Terlanus's tomb? "'Markers? Inscriptions? Anything?' "'They do not. But I doubt that you will need them,' the initiate mother said. "'You see, I know where High Morning Lady Terlanus is buried.'" Twelve, twenty-four chess, the year of the Ageless One the Harmax Hall seemed draftier and more drab than Kara Hallmaster remembered it. The rare occasions when the Harmac took his seat in the high, open, raftered hall were most often feasts or banquets, held after sundown when the great chandeliers blazed with the warm light of hundreds of candles, and the floor was crowded with merry, well-dressed people. In the gray light of a dull, overcast day, it simply struck her as dusty and unused, like an old barn left to fall down in a forgotten field. By the dreary daylight, the old banners hanging from the rafters looked threadbare and worn, and the thirty or so people in the great room seemed out of place. "'Is the Harmac coming?' Kara asked Sergeant Colton, who stood beside her on the small mezzanine above the banquet hall— and below the doors leading to the upper bailey. Six shield-sworn guarded the upper doors of the chamber, commanding a good view of the spacious chamber below. Another half-dozen of the Harmac's guards stood watch by the great doors leading to the lower bailey. All the shield-sworn were armed and armored for a fight. They wore long coats of mail and carried crossbows or halberds and long swords. 
They weren't the only soldiers in the room. More armsmen in the colors of various merchant costers or guilds stood watch by their council members assembling around the table in the center of the hall. I think he'll be here momentarily, Lady Kara, the round-faced soldier said. He glanced at the gilded doors, now old and peeling, that led from the banquet hall to the interior courts and passageways of the castle. Then he looked back down at the hall below and shook his head. Doesn't seem proper to me, though. He shouldn't be at anyone's beck and call. It would be worse if he didn't greet his guests, Kara said. She sighed and descended the stairs that led down to the hall's floor. In the middle of the room, immediately before the Harmac's carved wooden throne on its old dais, Griffin Watch's servants had set up a horseshoe-shaped table facing toward the hall's doors. Nine chairs were spaced around the table for the Harmac's council, and behind the council's table the castle staff had arranged plain wooden benches for the councillor's retinues, such as they were. She took her seat at the foot of the right-hand arm of the horseshoe, automatically arranging the skirts of her own mail over the chair and turning her sword parallel to the ground so the hilt wouldn't poke her under the ribs. She made sure to sit a good two feet back from the edge of the table. If she needed to get to her feet and draw her blade fast, she didn't want the council table in her way. "'Ah, Lady Kara, perhaps you can tell us what this is all about.' Kara glanced to her left, where Lord Marath Marstall had his seat at the table. The Marstalls were descended from a high-placed captain of the old Red Plumes of Hillsfar, a lord who had taken up residence in Hallberg after the Red Plumes had been driven out of their city, and he'd established a wealthy estate with the plundered loot and sworn armsmen he'd taken with him. Marath Marstall— was a tall, red-faced man of middle years who affected a much higher station than his family's checkered past likely warranted. This is most irregular. Our bylaws insist on three days' notice of a meeting of the council. That's a custom, not a law, Kara replied. She had always found Marstall a leering boor. But, as a hullmaster and adviser to the Harmac, she was expected to sit at the table alongside buffoons such as the head of House Marstall, whether she wanted to or not. She set aside her irritation at his insipid manner and said, "'It's not for me to say why you have been summoned, Lord Marath, but you'll see soon enough.' She took her eyes from his and glanced at the other members of the Harmac's council. They did not meet often. Most attended to their own particular duties in administering the small realm of Hallberg, and rarely needed to confer with the others. Directly across from her was Walreth Keltor, the Keeper of Keys, a careworn, petulant old man who administered the sorely depleted treasury and the public works of the city. Beside him sat the wizard Ebane Ravenscar, the town's master mage. He was a young, dark-bearded Mulmasterite, who was in theory the most competent wizard residing in Hullberg. The Master Mage was supposed to be responsible for ensuring that practitioners of magic observed some basic precautions while within the city, and he was entitled to the ear of the Harmac. In practice, Ravenscar gave his official duties little attention, and Kara strongly suspected that the wizard was well paid to be so inattentive. Next came the chair reserved for the captain of the Shieldsworn. Jared Erstenwold's seat sat empty, and Kara didn't know when it might be filled again. The sight of the vacant chair gave her a pang in her chest. She missed Jared's crooked smile and plain-spoken ways every day. At the head of the table sat Lady Darcy Varuna, head of the merchant council, stunning in a dress of deep blue with an ermine stole over her shoulders. Theron Nimstar, the town's high magistrate, and then her stepbrother, Sergan, the keeper of duties and the Harmax deputy on the council. Finally, on the other side of Lord Marstall, the old white-haired dwarf, Dunstormad Goldhead, brooded in his own seat. He was the town's lord assayer, 
but in practice Sergan's oversight of the hallmaster lands left him with little to do except indulge his passion for drink. It seems we're all here, Kara murmured to herself. She couldn't remember the last time she'd seen all of the council at a meeting, let alone one called on such short notice. The ranger heard a rustle of motion behind her and looked up to the stairs at the back of the hall. Harmac Grigor made his way stiffly down the steps with the aid of his heavy cane. He wore a long burgundy coat over a ruffled white shirt, with a matching hat and gold medallion of office around his neck. Two shield-sworn guards flanked him, ostensibly to guard him from an unexpected attack, but more likely watching for a stumble on the old steps. Everyone in the hall rose to their feet and waited until Grigor took his seat on the dais overlooking the council's table. He leaned his cane against one arm of the great seat and said, "'Please continue. Sergan, summon the messengers when you are ready.' Sergan looked up and down the table, reassuring himself that all the council members were indeed present, and then motioned to Sergeant Colton. "'Bring them in, Sergeant. Be on your guard.' Shield-sworn guards at the lower entrance to the great hall pulled open the doors. There was an uncertain swirl of motion as they stepped aside and more guards entered. Then the orcs pushed their way into the hall, five of them all draped in heavy hauberks of mail. One was older than the others, a hulking gray-haired brute, with only one tusk. The others were younger warriors, fierce and proud. They glared at the humans around them, their hands gripping tightly the hafts and hilts of weapons they wore on their crude harnesses. Each warrior had a simple red emblem painted across the mail of his chest— a jawless red skull. The gray-haired one even had a red-painted skull hanging from a short chain at his hip. "'I am Morag, one tusk, Morag the Slayer, Morag the Old,' he roared at the great hall. "'I speak for King Morin, the scourge of Glister. Who here is chief?' "'Bloody skulls,' Kara thought. She hid her consternation behind narrowed eyes. She knew something about the tribes of Thar, having hunted and been hunted by, quite a few of them over the years. The bloody skulls were about the strongest and most numerous of Thar's orcs, but fortunately they had rarely troubled Hullberg, since the territory of several smaller tribes lay between Bloodskull Keep and the Winterspear Vale the Red Claws Goblins, the Bone Crusher Ogres, and a few other smaller bands as well. The fact that the Bloody Skulls thought that Hullberg was a concern of theirs was a bad sign. Something must have happened to turn the alliances and enmities of the Thar tribes in a new direction, and Kara suspected that she would not like it at all. "'I am Grigor Hullmaster,' the Harmac said, he kept his voice even. "'I am the Harmac, the chief of Hullberg. You stand before the council of Hullberg, Morag. You told my soldiers that you had a message for the leaders of Hullberg. We are here to listen to your words. Come forward and speak.' Morag and the other four advanced, looking around the room with poorly disguised contempt. They marched to the foot of the council table, heads high, sneering at any who met their gaze. The old orc looked at the councillors in their seats, snorting in derision when the keeper of keys averted his gaze, growling when he caught sight of the dwarf gold head, and finally pausing when his eyes reached Kara. "'You are no of,' he muttered, "'the blue serpent, mighty hunter,' "'You do not look so fearsome to me.' Kara's spell-scar seemed to writhe and itch under the skin of her left forearm, but she made no move to cover the serpent-shaped mark. "'I have heard of Morag the Slayer,' she answered in Orkish. Years ago he had led a bold raid that sacked a caravan on the coastal way west of Thentia. 
He was an important blood skull chief. She met the old warrior's eyes, and she bared her teeth in what passed among orcs as a gesture indicating both respect and a fierce willingness to face challenge without quailing. Morag grunted in approval and showed his own fangs before he strode boldly to the center of the horseshoe-shaped table. He stood motionless and silent for a moment, his eyes fixed on Harmac Grigor, paying no attention to the mailed swordsmen who surrounded the dais or the council members who waited on him. Then he threw out his chest and spoke. You are weak, the gray-haired orc snarled at the Harmac. Your town counts thirty score spheres, but King Murren counts six times that number— once, many years ago, all the lands north of the Moon Sea belonged to the King of Thar. Then came the humans of the south and the Burk Husk Dwarves. That was a word in Orkish Kara was frankly glad no one else in the room understood. From out of their mountains to dig Thar's gold, to cut Thar's stone, to hunt in Thar's hills and drink Thar's water. Yet never once did you bargain with Thar's rightful masters for these things. You came and you took. You slew our sons where you found them, and then hid your walls of stone to deny us just revenge. King Murren will stand this no more. You must pay for the things you have taken for our lands. Or we will take our lands back and drive you into the sea. The Hulbergans stirred and muttered at that. Some of the fainter-hearted paled, or looked uncertainly to the faces of those around them, hoping they had not heard the bloody skull messenger correctly. Most of the shields sworn tightened their grips on their weapons until knuckles whitened lips pressed together and eyes cold. Sergen Hullmaster stood, leaning on the table with his hands, and looked the old orc in the eye. "'You come here to issue threats. We will not be cowed by vain orc boasts in the Harmax Hall.' "'I do not make threats,' Morag scoffed. "'I speak truths, pink skin. We are strong. You are weak.' Give us what is ours, or we will take it from you, and more. If you do not hear the iron in my words, then you are deaf. He grasped the red-painted skull hanging by his hip, ripped it free of its chain, and tossed it onto the table in front of Sergen. Bone cracked, and chips fell to the floor. Ask the overmaster of Glister. If the bloody skulls make threats, there he sits on your table, speaking truth to you. Do you hear him? Sergen's handsome face darkened, and he straightened up. But before he could say anything, Grigor spoke. I hear you, Morag. Murren of Bloodskull Keep demands tribute. What does he think I will give him? Five wagons of gold? Two hundred cattle and one thousand sheep or goats, two hundred casks of wine or ale, two hundred coats of mail, two hundred steel swords, five hundred steel axe heads or knife blades. Moreg grinned in challenge. And you will present one hundred slaves between ten and thirty years of age. Twenty at least must be women, suitable to be taken as wives. All this you will do at High Sun each year, or Murren will lower his spear against you, and all that you have he will take. The room erupted with protests. Walrath Keltor, the keeper of keys, simply stared at Morag with his jaw slack and his face stricken. No doubt he was staggered by the enormity of the orc's demands. Beside Kara, Lord Marstall pushed himself to his feet and barked, 
We will not give you a copper piece, let alone condemn our women to rape and drudgery in some filthy cave, you ill-bred louts. Hearing that, Kara leaped up herself to defend the empty-headed lord against the mortal insult he had just issued to Morag. But fortunately, others were shouting, too. The lord assayer shouted, "'That would ruin us! The demand is outrageous!' and one of the Varuna mercenaries behind Lady Darcy actually drew his blade and shook it as he snarled. "'Kill them! Kill them for their insolence! And perhaps Murren will learn to send messengers with better manners next time!' "'And perhaps Murren will learn that he should kill those we send to speak to him!' Kara snapped. "'You fool! The day may come when we need to talk with the chieftains in Thar, and if we kill their messengers, how will they treat ours?' "'Enough!' Harmac Grigor said. The shouting went on around the table, and the Harmac slowly got to his feet and struck his cane to the floor with a resounding crack. "'Enough!' he shouted, and this time he managed to quiet the hall. "'No messenger before me will be killed, because I do not like his words. Put down your swords, those of you who drew your weapons.' You will not violate the ancient rules of parley in my hall. Morag grinned again at that, but the Harmac turned and pointed at him next. And you, Morag, be glad that you speak under a flag of truce. You will not be killed for what you say. But if you insult me in my own hall, you will be driven from my door with nothing but your bare hands to take back to your master. The old chief's grin faded to a sour frown. "'If you dishonor me, human, you dishonor my king. "'If I decide that your king means to march against me no matter what I do, "'then I see no reason why I should concern myself with his honor,' Grigor retorted. "'As you say, then,' Morag growled. "'So what is your answer?' Chief of Halverg, will you render tribute, or will you choose war? The Harmac leaned on his cane and studied the orc for a time. Then he sighed. I must weigh your words, Morag. I will give you my answer soon. Now go. The gray-haired chief snorted. King Morin said that humans can decide nothing without endless talk. He told me to grant you three days. If you do not give me an answer by sunset of the third day, I will tell Murren that you have chosen war. I go to wait at my camp. He turned slowly, contemptuously turning his back on the harmac and striding back to the door. His escort of warriors followed, snarling at anyone who came too close. In a few moments... The Bloody Skull emissary was gone, and the shield sworn pushed the heavy doors of the hall closed with a resounding boom. Harmac Grigor gazed after the orc messengers. Then he sighed and sagged back down into his seat. Quietly, he said, "'Well, you've all heard Murren's demand. What say you?' "'The buddy skulls are blustering,' Marath Marstall said at once. "'They have never threatened us in the past. "'Their keep is more than a hundred miles from here. "'I say that they hope to extort a kingly ransom promise "'by simply baring their filthy fangs and snarling. "'Well, I, for one, am not impressed.' "'Ravenscar, the master mage, cleared his throat and looked to Kara. "'Lady Kara. You know the tribes of Thar as well as any. Is Morag telling the truth about Bloody Skull numbers? He could be. I would guess that they could muster about two thousand warriors from their various strongholds. But if they managed to subjugate some of the nearby tribes and add their numbers to their own, yes, it could be close to four thousand. But they wouldn't all get along with each other. What of his words about Glister? the mage asked. Have the bloody skulls sacked it? They may have, 
Kara answered. Yesterday, a man from Glister came into town with his wife and children. They fled to Glister seven days ago because they'd seen orc scouts and marauders in great numbers, and they had word that orcs were marching against the town. What might have befallen Glister after they fled, I can't say. But I'll have scouts on fast horses sent out within the hour to see. The High Magistrate, Theron Nimstar, leaned forward to look at Kara. He was a stout man with a heavy beard of rusty grey, thoughtful and deliberate in his words. Assume that Morag is telling the truth. Can the Shieldsworn defend Hullberg against so large a horde? No, my lord. Kara saw the sharp shock in the man's face and let it sink in for a moment. We could defend Griffin Watch and Dagger Guard Tower and shelter hundreds of townsfolk within their walls. I feel confident that we could withstand a siege of months, but the town itself would belong to the Bloody Skulls, and most of our people would have to flee, since we wouldn't have space for them within our castles. What if you added the armsmen belonging to the Merchant Council to the Shieldsworn? the old magistrate asked. Would that help? Certainly, Kara replied. I think Morag included those when he said that we could muster six hundred, because that's three times the number of shields sworn in the Harmac service. But we'd still have to meet them in the open field to keep them away from the town. And I can't promise you that we'd win such a battle, if Morag was truthful about the Bloody Skull's numbers. The mage Ravenscar looked around the table. If we decide not to fight, can we actually meet the tribute demand? The tribute he demands is beyond the tower's purse, Keeper Walrath said in a quavering voice. One time, perhaps, we could gather the gold, livestock, and arms, but it would ruin us, and it would be years before we could manage another such ransom. And what is the cost to the tower of sending one hundred people into thraldom? Kara asked sharply. Whose daughters do you intend to provide as wives to the Bloody Skulls? The Bloody Skulls likely don't care where their slaves come from, Sergan said thoughtfully. No Hullbergen need become an orc's thrall when there are slave markets in other cities that could meet our need. Which would also be a substantial expense, Lord Assayer Goldhead grunted. It would cost thousands of gold crowns to purchase so many slaves in Melvaunt or Mulmaster. How is it better to condemn some other unfortunate souls to drudgery and death in the Bloody Skull's hands? Kara demanded. At one stroke, you'd have us become the most vile slave merchants in the Moon Sea. I will have no more talk of this, Harmac Grigor said firmly. My father decreed that no slave would be taken or sold in Hullberg, and I will not be the Harmac to reverse his law. We will buy no slaves to send to the orcs. Then you must fight, or you must send one hundred of your own to become thralls, Darcy Varuna coolly observed. I suppose you might try to negotiate with Murrin and see if he can be persuaded to accept a lesser tribute, but I suspect that he is not inclined to bargain with you, Lord Grigor. Silence fell over the great hall. The Harmac looked down at his lap, his brow furrowed in thought. Finally he shook his head and slowly stood. We all must think on this more, he said. Keeper Walrath, prepare an exact accounting to see if we could possibly meet the demand. Kara, send out your riders. I want to know if Glister has been sacked, and if it has, there may be refugees abroad in Thar who are trying to find their way to safety in our lands. And I want to know where the Bloody Skull Horde is, and its true numbers. Yes, Harmac Gregor. Kara answered. I'll see to it now. She rose with a jingling of mail, bowed to her uncle, and headed for the door. As she left, she heard the arguing begin again. 
13. 24 Chess, the Year of the Ageless One Garin and Hamill rode out from Rosestone Abbey two hours after sunrise. The morning was dank and gray, but the bitter cold of the previous night had passed in the dark hours before dawn. It was wet and windy on the high fells, but there was no sign of the grim specters that had dogged their heels the night before. They rode for most of the morning in silence, heading westward from the abbey. The city of Thentia stood a little less than fifty miles off in that direction, and the two travelers soon found their way onto a rough, lightly traveled trail between Hullberg and Thentia that meandered past Rosestone. Most traffic between the two cities went by sea or followed the so-called Ruined Way closer to the coast, which was relatively level and wide enough for cart traffic. Garin had come by the abbey's path once or twice as a young man, but he'd never followed it all the way to Thentia. A few miles from the abbey, the trail started to climb along the bare shoulders of brown, sear hills, some of the highest prominences to be found in the high fells. Garin began to watch the trail side more carefully, for the landmark the initiate mother had told him about, and soon he found it, the old stone foundations of a long-vanished watchtower. "'We turn here,' he told Hamel. The halfling glanced at the old ruins. "'Who put a tower here?' he wondered. "'Mother Mara said that this old path used to be an important road of old Thentur. I suppose it fell into disuse when war wrecked the kingdom and Hullberg. The old city, that is, was destroyed.' Garin turned his mount uphill and left the path, picking his way toward the bare, stony hilltop. It shouldn't be far now. There was a very faint track above the old trail. It wound higher up the hillside. Garin supposed that the view over the moorlands would have been spectacular on a clear day, but as the weather was overcast, the hilltop was shrouded in blowing mist. They crossed over a shallow saddle— and there, on the south-facing slope of the hill, stood a large, solitary burial mound. "'I think this is it,' Garin said. He reined in before the mound and swung himself down from the saddle. Like the other barrows they had visited in the last couple of days, it was a circular mound covered with turf. A waist-high wall of crumbling fieldstone edged the mound, so that the whole thing looked a little like a large, windowless storehouse, half-sunk into the dry grass of the hillside. He scrambled up onto its turf roof and climbed to the peak. It was perhaps twenty-five yards in diameter, a little larger than some of the others they had seen, but not by much. Near the top, Garin found a shallow set of stone steps that descended four or five feet and ended in a mortared wall beneath a large keystone, a keystone engraved with an ancient sunrise design. "'It's got Lathander's mark on it,' he called to Hamel. "'It seems to be the right age and construction,' the halfling answered." He shaded his eyes and scanned the hillside around them for a long moment, looking for any sign that they were not alone, and then shrugged and slid down from his Teshan pony. "'Is it open?' "'No, we'll have to dig. What about the Harmax law?' "'If I've got good reason for what I'm doing, my uncle will understand,' Garin answered." He didn't like the idea of being the first to open a barrow, but if Mara was right, and this was the tomb of Terlanus, then it was likely warded against the minions of Isperus or any other undead spirits that might otherwise have taken up residence inside. He simply hoped that he truly had a good reason. The Varunas already know that they're looking for a tomb under Lathander's mark, he told himself. It was only a matter of time until they discovered this one. He could try to disguise it, perhaps destroying or altering the sunrise mark on the keystone, for instance, but the mercenaries might be using some kind of divination magic to find the tombs they meant to search, and Garin couldn't be certain that any steps he took to disguise the mound would fool them. Of course, this tomb might be better warded than anything I could come up with, and if the books here, 
then it might be best to leave it where it lies, Garin murmured to himself. But I won't know that it's safe until I see for myself. If it's well protected, I can leave it here and do what I can to disguise the mound. If it's not, then I have to hope that the Varunas never stumble across this place, or I've got to remove it if I want to keep it away from the Varunas, as well as that tiefling we met. Do you have a better hiding spot in mind? Hamel said silently. The halfling might not have been close enough to hear Garin muttering to himself, but apparently he'd been close enough to catch Garin's thoughts with his mind. Keep it in the vaults of Griffin Watch, or give it to the initiate mother and let her look after it, since it belonged to a priestess of Lathander? Garin trotted back down to the mound's edge and hopped down. For that matter, I could do worse than to hide it under a rock in some lonely hollow out here in the high fells. If we actually find it, I'm sure I'll think of something. They picketed the horses at the base of the mound and carried their saddlebags and provisions back to the stairwell at the top. Then Garin took a heavy pry bar down the filled-in stairway and set to work on the old mortar and stone under the sunrise symbol. There was not room for more than one to work at a time, but Hamel helped carry up the stones Garin dislodged. The halfling was careful to spread out the rubble instead of leaving it in a pile that might be seen from a distance. After half an hour of vigorous work, Garin broke through the mortared wall to a space beyond. Cold, stale air sighed out of the opening. He quickly backed away to avoid breathing in the barrel air. Old, foul air could kill the unwary, so he decided to let the barrow breathe while he and Hamel sat a short distance away and ate a cold lunch. At one point, Garin stood to stretch, and he thought he glimpsed a shadow slinking beneath the bare stone of the hilltop, a shadow where one shouldn't have been. But when he stared up at the spot, he saw nothing unusual. "'Is our friend back?' Hamel asked. "'I'm not sure. I didn't get a very good look. It could have been anything.' Garin glanced over to the picket line, but the horses placidly grazed, plainly unconcerned. "'The horses don't seem nervous. I'm not reassured.' "'Nor am I.' Garin rested a little longer before he returned to the stairwell and attacked the wall again, working to make a hole big enough to wriggle through. Despite the chill mist that blew over the high fells, Garin was soon streaming with sweat, but he shed his cloak and kept at it until he had an opening he could squeeze through. "'You should knock out a few more stones,' Hal observed. "'You might get a small pony through there, but I don't think you could fit a draft horse yet.' "'Feel free to have a go at it,' Garin said with a snort. It's not my fault that my people have a sensible stature, while all you big folk take up three times as much room as a normal person and manage to get half as much done. I could have been in that barrow half an hour ago. Well, then, why didn't you go on ahead? I didn't want to get lonely, Hamel answered. Garin shook his head and turned away. He decided to examine his shields and wards before going any farther. The barrows they'd seen before had been opened by others, but this one hadn't felt fresh air in hundreds of years. They'd seen no evidence of traps or guardians in the other Lathandarian tombs, but that didn't mean the tomb of Terlanus would be safe. Closing his eyes, he stilled his thoughts and focused his awareness into a single bright point. The elvish sword mage spells rolled easily from his heart, and will, as he renewed the spells he routinely wore. To these he added another defense, and whispered the words to summon the pale aura of the silver-steel veil. Finally, for good measure, he drew his elf-made sword and passed his palm over the eldritch steel. Rith Arak, Rith Nasilla, he chanted softly. A thin white radiance began to shine in the blade. Hamel looked up from where he stood, stringing his bow. I don't recognize that one. It's a spell of sharpness, but it's especially baleful to ghosts and other such spirits. 
Sword in hand, Garin descended the narrow stairwell again and peered once more through the dark opening he'd made below. A small, dusty passage led deeper into the mound, and he saw nothing else. Carefully, he set one foot on the far side and ducked under the sill, working his way inside. In the shadows, the pale radiance of his sword began to shine more brightly, driving back the darkness. Garin advanced a few steps down the passage, and Hamel followed a moment later, an arrow laid across his small horn bow. The air was cold and stale. The passage led to an antechamber where two dark doorways beckoned. A niche in the wall between the low doorways held a small statue of an angel, made from some porous white stone that was splotched green and black with mildew. Garin ventured right first, and descended two steps into a larger barrel-vaulted chamber. Here stood two full-sized statues of armored warriors, one on each side of a heavy frieze in bronze that was set into the far wall. A faint yellow light spell still glimmered in a small tarnished lantern suspended from the ceiling. The sword mage studied the chamber from the doorway for a long moment and nodded. I think it's a memorial, he told Hamel. The crypt must be in the other room. What does it say? Hamel asked. Garin moved closer to the frieze. It showed a battle scene, a lady in armor riding a great charger, led soldiers over a drawbridge against the gates of a dark castle. Mailed skeletons stood in serried ranks against the lady and her soldiers, but she was raising high a rod with a sunburst device for its head. Rays sprang from the rod, striking the dark castle's gates, which seemed to go up in fire at their touch, while skeletons in the way withered away like autumn leaves. Death-ack rooms, nearly filled in with dust and debris, were cut into the smoothly dressed stone beneath. Garin knelt and brushed his hand over the old runes until he could make them out. "'Old Tesharan again,' he murmured. "'I think it says something like, "'The downfall of the Wailing Tower, "'the glory, fire, of Lathander burns the something warriors.' Iceberus is cast down in defeat. High something. Terlanus, in her hour of victory, may Lathander's blessing follow after her forever. So this is Terlanus's crypt. Hamel padded closer and studied the frieze himself, before pointing to the far corner of the work. Look, I bet that's Iceberus there. He doesn't seem very happy. Garin followed Hamel's finger. Flanked by knights in black armor, a skeletal king in regal robes fled from the destruction of the gates, going down into some sort of tunnel or doorway that disappeared from view. It shows events pretty much as Mother Mara explained them. Terlanus destroyed the tower, and Isperus fled into some dungeon or retreat below his fortress. Let's have a look around and see if the book is hidden somewhere in this room. They carefully tapped, poked, and prodded at the frieze, the warrior statues, even the walls and the floors as thoroughly as they could, but they found no secret compartments or hidden doors. Giving up for the moment, Garin returned to the antechamber and tried the other doorway. This led down several steps into another barrel-vaulted room, dominated by a great stone crypt. Its lid was carved in the image of a stern woman in plate armor, lying in repose, her hands holding a great sunburst emblem over her heart. The walls and floor were finished with smooth polished stone, but the chamber was otherwise bare. Terlanus, I presume, Hamel said. So it would seem. Garin could make out her name cut in runes at the foot of the sarcophagus. He looked at the big stone structure and frowned. Was the book actually entombed with her remains? Digging out the stairwell to gain access to the chamber in the mound was one thing, but he found that he didn't want to be the one to actually damage the crypt. It was possible that they might be able to drive anchoring pitons into the ceiling over the crypt, 
and rig some sort of block and tackle, but he would still have to disturb the ancient priestess's bones, and somehow he felt that a manotaur, Lathander, would not look kindly on that. I hate the idea of breaking into the sarcophagus. Afraid of curses? Guardian spirits? Among other things, yes. Garin looked around and sighed. Let's check everything else before we try the tomb itself. They carefully examined every corner of the room, feeling along the walls and tapping the flagstones with the pommels of their daggers. After a long, careful search, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Not really expecting much, Garin finally took a few minutes to speak a simple elven finding charm. He'd learned a thing or two about finding well-hidden things in Myth Draenor. He'd seen more than one elf-made door that simply couldn't be found by someone who didn't already know it was there. Doubtless, the tomb was warded against such minor magic, but he figured it was worth a try. He whispered the words in elvish, and he felt a slight tug, a gleaming in the corner of his eye, from the antechamber outside the tomb. "'I think I've got something, Hamel.' he said, and he hurried back out to the room outside Terlanus's crypt. He turned in a small circle, trying to sharpen the glimmer of perception he'd felt, and then his eye fell on the small statue of the angel in its niche. There, he breathed. He bent close to examine the small statue in its niche, and thought he could make out a paper-thin seam in the joining of its arm to its shoulder. Hamel, have a look at this. The halfling moved up close beside him and peered at the angel's statue. Garin had learned to respect Hamel's skill with subtle traps, hidden triggers, and concealed mechanisms during their time with the dragon shields. The halfling had made it his business to know as much as he could about such devices, prowling the curio shops and antique collections of every city in the vast, to collect clever puzzles, charms, locks, and even toys, in order to study the workings of each. Hamel's house in Tantras was littered with those devices he prized enough to display for visitors and guarded by more subtle and dangerous ones to make sure that no uninvited visitors would find it safe to linger there. Hamel studied the statue for a long time, then examined the niche all around it carefully. Finally, he drew out from a pouch at his belt a small paper tube full of silvery powder, which he blew out over the statue. It sparkled oddly in the shadows as it settled. "'No hidden rune traps or symbols,' he said. "'I think it's a simple lever. "'Likely it opens a hidden panel or doorway.' "'Garin glanced around the antechamber. "'It's very well hidden, then. "'We both had a good look here. "'Should I pull it?' "'I really don't want to try the sarcophagus "'before we've exhausted all other options. "'Give it a try.' "'Stand back,' Hamel warned. The halfling slid to one side of the niche, pressed himself up against the wall, and gently pulled the angel's arm toward him. The seam between arm and body widened. Then Hamel rotated the arm back. It did not move that way, far at all, reversed his motion, and twisted it forward. It moved a good quarter turn and clicked and the whole statue rose a quarter of an inch. The halfling rotated the angel on its base until he heard another faint click, and he raised the arm again until it locked back in place. Metal and stone groaned somewhere under the feet. Chains clanked slowly, and suddenly the floor of the antechamber began to sink. Garin quickly stepped back into the doorway leading to Terlanus's crypt, while Hamel moved to the door opposite. A section of floor about ten feet across sank until it was a good eight feet lower than it had been, revealing a door of brightly polished bronze, untarnished, despite the age of the mound. Hamel looked across the space to Garin. "'I guess it was an elevator,' he said. "'The sounds you heard were the counterweights.' "'Clever. I didn't expect the floor to move.' Garin stooped down to grip the stone sill, swung himself over the edge, and dropped easily to the floor. 
he crossed over to give Hamel a hand down, since it was a long drop for the halfling, and the two companions turned their attention to the polished bronze door. It was inscribed with a great sunburst, ringed by a strange flowing script. "'What does it say?' Hamel asked him. "'I don't have the faintest idea. I think the script might be celestial, but I can't read a word of it.' The sword-mage frowned and whispered another spell of perception, this one to reveal the presence of magic. The beautiful lettering shone with a fiery gold radiance in his eyes, and he felt the old, undiminished strength of ancient wards. "'It's divine magic of some kind. Some sort of spell of concealment? I can't be sure.' "'Well, that would stand to reason. If the Lethandarians buried something here to keep it away from Isperus, they would have used magic to deflect his efforts to scry its location.' The halfling blew a little more of his silver powder over the door, and again it sparkled as it drifted down to the flagstones. No symbols or runes here, either, but it's locked. Do we open it? Yes. If we can find this place, so can Varuna's soldiers. All right, then. Hamel worked for a moment on the lock and pushed the door open. Cold, dry air sighed out of the room beyond a large, low-ceilinged hall, its roof supported by dozens of pillars, a great bronze statue of a leonine creature dominated the center of the chamber, lying with its paws outstretched on the floor and its head held high. Its face was human in shape, surrounded by a great mane. Behind the statue stood a stone chest covered in fine carvings. Ancient sconces holding slender golden staves lined the chamber walls. As Garin and Hamel moved into the room, flickering flames guttered into life around the golden staves, giving the room a rich yellow glow. Well, the servants of Lathander hid a crypt below a crypt, the halfling observed. I admit it. I didn't expect work of such skill here. The chest, Garin said. He looked carefully at the room, and did not see anything to alarm him, so he started to circle around the statue to the left. He was only five paces from the door when the lion opened its eyes and looked at him. The statue shuddered once, and old metal squealed against old metal as it slowly began to clamber to its feet. Garin stepped quickly back, moving away from the thing, but a bright golden fire sprang up in its eyes, and it opened its mouth to speak. In a voice that sounded like the clashing of cymbals, it roared in old Tisharan, "'Speak now the three secret names, and state thy purpose here, or I must destroy thee!' "'A guardian construct,' Hamel said in alarm. He retreated, too, backing away in a different direction. Garin. What of the nine hells did it say? Garin felt a pillar at his back and stopped retreating. The bronze lion was not alive, of course. It was an enchanted statue, long ago imbued with the power to animate and attack any strangers who made it into the vault chamber. It might lack the speed and ferocity of a real sphinx or lamassu or whatever it was supposed to be, but it would be a formidable war machine nonetheless, tireless and implacable. "'We're supposed to know a password,' he replied to Hamel. "'Answer now, interloper, or thy doom is assured,' the statue roared again. The bronze monster was easily the size of a large horse, its clawed feet the size of dinner plates. "'We need time to think,' Garin decided. "'We might be able to puzzle out the password, but not quickly.' "'Back out,' he said. He turned to race for the doorway only to spy something above the door's lintel. A baleful golden rune inscribed on a heavy keystone, facing in toward the lion. They'd walked right under it when they entered the chamber, which was likely what had triggered the magic to animate the statue and give it a voice. But two other runic marks were cut into the stone on each side of the glowing golden one, and when Garin's eye fell on them, they kindled to life as lines of sullen crimson fire. "'Wait! No!' he shouted. "'Stay away from the door. There are symbols over it.' 
Hamel was closer to the door than he was. When the symbols awoke, he gave a strangled cry and fell to one knee, already within the influence of the magical trap. Somehow he managed two staggering steps away from the door, but now the statue turned with a scraping of bronze and fixed its burning golden eyes on him. "'Defiler! Infidel!' the statue's voice proclaimed. It advanced on Hamel, who still reeled from his brush with the Lathandarian runes. "'Damn!' Garin swore. They had a fight here, whether they wanted it or not. He quickly cast his dragon scale spell, even though he was not sure how much it would help against a foe of such strength. Thilalag na Drendir, he whispered, and around him the cascading scales of glowing violet light shimmered into existence. The sword mage darted forward to distract the thing from Hamel and lunged out with his blade at the statue's eye. Elven steel clanged shrilly against ancient bronze. The impact jarred his hand, and Garin almost dropped his sword. The thing was hot, radiating heat shimmers. The leonine monster turned on him with startling quickness for something so big and inflexible, and raked at him with its huge paw. Garin leaped back out of the way, and the statue followed, bullying its way straight at him. He saw that his thrust had dug a deep gouge just under the blank, molten eye, creasing the bronze without penetrating it. He ducked behind one of the pillars in the chamber, trying to keep it between the statue and himself. How do you destroy something made of metal? he thought furiously. He'd encountered animated statues and magical constructs before in his years with the dragon shields, and he well remembered that they were difficult to defeat. Some had vital mechanisms that could be ruined by a very well-aimed sword blow, but this one had been brought to life by powerful magic. As far as he could tell, it was a cast statue of bronze, hollow inside, with no vital mechanisms to destroy. The bronze itself was not even articulated. The magic of the ancient ritual that animated the thing gave the cast metal the suppleness and flexibility of living flesh. While he tried to figure out how to deal with the thing, the statue moved around the pillar to get at him, and Garin circled away from it. It reversed its course and tried the other direction, and once again Garin moved with it. Then the bronze sphinx simply hurled itself straight at him, shouldering its way past the pillar. Stone cracked and splintered under its weight. Dust sifted down from the ceiling. Garin grunted in surprise and danced back before taking his sword in a two-handed grip. He threw all his strength into a mighty cut across the statue's face, and this time the elven steel actually parted the bronze in a shallow cut. Molten red-gold fire seeped from the wound. A drop splattered the top of his boot and set the leather to smoking. Then the statue caught him with one mighty paw. Garin's dragon-scale spell held, mostly. The deadly claws did not tear through his flesh, only scoring him lightly. But the spell did not guard against the crushing impact of the blow. He was battered away like a mouse, flipped head over paws by a cat, and he skidded to the ground a dozen feet away. The bronze sphinx bounded after him, but just as it raised its paw to crush his skull, a pair of arrows thudded into its golden flank. "'Come on, you lump of lead!' Hamel shouted. "'Chase after me for a bit!' The halfling had rallied from his brush with the symbol spell, and crouched behind a pillar on the far side of the room, firing arrows as fast as he could draw his bow. They did not penetrate far into the bronze hide, but the range was short enough for the halfling to drive the steel points half an inch into the old bronze. More molten metal began to leak from the pinprick wounds, and the statue whirled away from Garin to pursue the halfling. Garin groaned and rolled over to all fours, slowly pushing himself to his feet. His whole left side ached from where the sphinx's bronze paw had caught him. He found his sword lying nearby and stood again. On the other side of the chamber, the statue snapped and clawed at Hamel, who dodged from pillar to pillar, just trying to stay out of its way. "'We need a better plan, Garin!' Hamel shouted to him. 
The sword mage glanced left, right, and all around as he cast about for some position or advantage over the powerful bronze sphinx. Then his eye fell on the first pillar he'd used for cover against the construct. Its head was visibly out of vertical, and deep cracks spider-webbed its surface. A desperate idea sprang into his mind, and he quickly measured the vaulting of the ceiling with his eye. "'Stay near the wall,' he called to Hamel. "'I'll get its attention again.' "'You're welcome to it,' Hamel answered. Garin ignored him and charged the statue's hindquarters, taking a strong cut at its hamstring, or at least where its hamstring would be if it were a living creature. He creased the bronze enough to spill a little more of its molten metal and drew back quickly, even as the monster whirled to face him again. "'Come on!' he shouted. "'After me!' The construct hurtled after him, and Garin darted back several steps. At the last moment he ducked behind the damaged pillar, and the statue lunged after him in response, striking the column almost dead on. The pillar toppled with an awful roar of shattering stone, and the ceiling over it sagged and collapsed. "'Say rock!' Garin shouted, a spell of transposition." "'magic that simply teleported him from one place to another close by, in the space of an instant. "'He flickered out from under the collapse, reappearing on the other side of the room beneath the vaulting by the wall, "'the strongest part of the ceiling, or so he hoped. "'The warm yellow light filling the chamber dimmed and failed, "'as billowing clouds of dust and debris choked the chamber.' More of the ceiling gave way, and a cascade of rock and earth poured down into the middle of the room. But finally the collapse slowed, and an eerie silence settled over the room. Hamel coughed once on the dust, and looked up at Garin. "'What would you have done if the whole ceiling had come down?' he demanded. "'I was hoping that it wouldn't.' Garin eyed the heap of debris filling the center of the chamber." He could see one great bronze paw amid the wreckage, but it was hollow, empty. There was no molten fire within. Wearily he sheathed his sword. The magical steel was unmarked from its encounter with the old bronze, and picked his way over to the stone chest against the far wall. It was carved with images of angels armed for war, carrying swords and shields. Another trap would seem redundant but he could not be certain. Hamel, the halfling joined him by the chest and quickly examined it with his silver powder and a careful visual inspection. I think it's safe to open. Garin nodded and lifted the lid, which was cleverly counterweighted so that it operated easily despite its weight. Inside, wrapped in cloth that had long since disintegrated to dusty scraps, lay a large tome bound in black leather. He reached in and lifted out the book, brushing the remnants of the wrapping away. Lettering embossed on the cover in the old Dethek runes read, The Infernodex, being a compilation of spells and arcane lore set down by the hand of Isperus, king of Thentur. He was sorely tempted to flip it open to a random page, simply to see what sort of things Isperus might have deemed worthy of compiling, but that was not a good idea. Reading from magical books could be quite dangerous, or cause unintended consequences of all sorts. For the moment, it would be enough to secure the thing and spirit it away to some place where the sellswords in Varuna's service couldn't find it. Instead, he wrapped the book in a spare cloak and slipped it into his pack. "'Now we'll have to find a new hiding place House Faruna's men won't suspect,' he said. First, we'll have to find a way out of this chamber. I'm not eager to venture too close to those symbols again,' said Hamel. The halfling gestured at the doorway, where the symbols burned dully. The large one in the center was dark— its magic had likely ended when the animated statue was destroyed, but the other two remained active. I suppose we could try to dig our way out. If my sense of direction is right, we're under the memorial chamber. Garin looked up at the gaping hole in the ceiling and turned to the symbols gleaming over the door. 
I'm afraid it would be too easy to bring the chamber above us down around our ears if we picked the wrong place to dig. But I know a spell or two that might get us past the symbols. It might take a little while, but it will be a lot easier than digging. Done, Hamel said. He sat down on the dais by the stone chest and waved toward the opposite door. Have at it. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. There isn't. Garin studied the markings over the door for a long moment, then sat down gingerly to examine his own spell-book, looking for something that might work. The ceiling overhead creaked ominously, and more dust drifted down. No, tunneling out was not an option. He meant to walk out of the room by the door through which he had entered. Or did he? He looked up at the doorway, measuring the distance with his eye. Yes, that would work, he muttered. But I'll have to study new spells first. Hamel, make yourself comfortable. I have to rest a while before I can get us out of here. 14. 25 Chess, the Year of the Ageless One After Garin and Hamel ate a cold lunch from the rations they had on hand, Garin laid out his bedroll and stretched out on the cold stone floor. He was not especially sleepy, but if he could lie quietly and let his mind rest for a time, he would be able to ready himself for studying his spells. He knew from experience that he couldn't fix a spell in his mind when he was tired or distracted. The long ride over the moors, the excavation of the stairwell, the expiration of the vaults, and finally the battle against the Sphinx statue— had worn him too much to try his spell-books with any hope of success. The words were simple to commit to memory, of course, but each spell also required a carefully built structure of symbology, philosophy, even a certain attitude or particular mode of thinking that would imbue the words he spoke with real and significant power. He needed only a few minutes' meditation to restore the expended power to many of his minor spells, but his longer incantations were far more strenuous and took much longer to replenish. Garin dozed for a long time, then rose, ate, and drank a little more, and began to study his books. He didn't use some of these spells very often, so he studied them carefully to make certain that he would be able to speak them correctly. Six hours after he'd entered the vault of the Infernadex, he was ready to make his exit. He replaced his spell-book in his pack and stood, wincing when his bruised ribs protested. "'All right, Hamel. Ready to leave?' The halfling jumped to his feet. "'I've been ready for hours. Can you erase the symbols?' "'No, we're going to go around them. I don't have quite the right spell to do it directly.' but I can manage it with three. But I'll need a little light first. Garin dug a copper coin out of his pocket, whispered a light spell, and tossed it through the doorway to the darkened antechamber outside. With relief, he noted that the floor remained depressed to the level of the buried vault. If the floor had raised itself back to the original level, his task would have been much harder. Garin moved closer to the doorway, remaining a short distance outside the influence of the symbols. He concentrated, focused his will, and said, "'Say rock!' An instant of darkness, and then he was standing on the floor of the antechamber, looking back through the doorway at Hamel. He waited a moment to see if any new traps had been activated, but nothing happened. "'Well, it appears that you've seen to your own escape,' Hamel remarked. "'Shall I just wait here, then?' "'I'm not finished,' Garin said. He took a deep breath, stilled his mind, and unlocked the unfamiliar structures of a spell he rarely used. "'See a dear Melar!' A faint violet light sprang up around Hamel, who looked startled, and a similar one appeared around the sword-mage. Then, once again, he felt the brief instant of lightless cold— and he was standing back in the chamber of the Infernadex while Hamel was outside in the antechamber. The halfling looked around and laughed. "'My circumstances have improved, but you are right back where you started, Garin. Is this one of those fox-goose-and-grain problems? If you're stumped, I may be able to help, you know.' 
I'm still not finished. Give me a few moments. Garin sat down to compose himself and rest, closing his eyes and using the elven methods that Dariot had taught him in Myth Draenor. A few minutes later, he was ready. He stood up, checked his location, and repeated his spell of transport. Say rock. One more instant of dizzying darkness, and he stood beside Hamel in the antechamber. I don't know any spells that would let both of us teleport together, he explained. So I had to settle for the spell that would switch our places. The minor teleport only takes me a few minutes to ready. Hamel gave him a small bow. You are a more accomplished wizard than I remembered, Garin. Did you learn that in Myth Dranor? If I were a true wizard, I could have simply conjured us both out of the vault and saved us the ride back to Hullberg, for that matter. But, yes, that's a spell I learned in Myth Dranor, along with a few others. Karen made a stirrup of his hands to help Hamel back up to the passageway above. Then he leaped up, caught the edge, and scrambled up with a hand from the halfling. He looked back down at the door to the secret vault. We should put the floor back. The Varunas might miss the vault, and they won't realize that we've been here already. Done, said Hamel. He leaped corner to corner over the pit, and worked his way around to the statue with its niche. In a moment, he rotated it back into place. The antechamber floor rose back into place with a heavy scraping of stone on stone and the clanking of hidden chains. I hope our mounts haven't run off or been eaten by something. I don't care for a long walk back to the abbey. Nor do I. Garin led the way back to the wall they had opened at the foot of the stairwell and ducked through it again. It was dark outside, but he'd expected that. They'd opened the mound in the early afternoon, and they'd been inside for many hours. He climbed back up into the night, cold, damp, windy, and mist-blown, as so many nights on the high fells were. He looked around to see whether their horses were still present. The animals stamped and neighed nervously where they'd been picketed, the saddles and tack piled up where they'd left it. Garin slipped down the side of the mound and headed toward the animals, wondering if perhaps they'd caught more of the strange shadow's scent. Hamel followed after him. Do we try to make it back to the abbey tonight? Garin started to answer, but paused. He thought he heard something, a faint creaking, perhaps the jingle of mail. He slid his sword out of its sheath and peered into the darkness. They'd had the light spell to see by in the barrow, but he hadn't stopped to let his eyes adjust to the night. Now he realized that he couldn't see very well at all, whereas someone who might have been waiting outside would be quite used to the darkness. Hamel, someone's here, he said softly. Cullen Mahariel. The faint sheen of the silver steel veil flickered around him. He felt Hamel close behind him, and heard the rasp of steel on leather as the halfling swept out his own daggers. We walked right into it, the halfling muttered. Silently, men in mail stood from where they'd been lying in the heather. They were empty black shadows in the moonless night, but then several of the men unshuttered lanterns and shone them at the two companions. In the sudden circle of light, Garin saw that they were surrounded by close to a score of armsmen in the green and white surcoats of House Varuna. Several aimed bows at Garin. "'Well, here they are, lads,' one of the shadowy figures rasped. He came closer, and Garin recognized the lean, hawkish features and ebon half-plate armor of Anfell Erdinger, captain of House Varuna. "'I think you've got something I want, Garin Hallmaster. "'Lay down your sword at your feet and throw your pack over here. "'Your small friend, too, and you can tell him that he'd better keep his hands where we can see them.' "'Of all the luck,' Hamel said silently, "'they finally find the barrow they're looking for on the day we visit.' "'To bane with luck. "'Someone must have told them where we were.' Garin answered his friend. This barrel was simply too far from the others that had been opened. It was too much of a coincidence to believe that Erdinger and his men had happened across it, mostly to give himself a moment to think. 
he called back to Erdinger. If we surrender our arms, what guarantees do you give us? I don't see that I need to give you any at all, but I suppose I'll let you ride away with no more trouble, Erdinger answered. The book's my only concern. Do you have it? They can't let us live, Garin, Hamel said. If we give up our blades, they'll take what they want and kill us anyway. Best to make a break back for the barrow and hope we don't get shot down before we get there. I know it, Garin replied to his friend. Against three or four men, perhaps five, he might have tried to fight his way clear, even with the disadvantage of being caught by surprise. But there were simply too many mercenaries around them. A retreat to Terlanus's barrow was the best of their poor options. In the cramped passage at the foot of the stairs, their opponents' numbers would mean nothing, and they might achieve a standoff of sorts. Garin edged back a couple of steps, weighing their odds of reaching the barrow entrance, and then he sensed stealthy movement behind him. He turned to look. There, not twenty feet away, the night mists swirled and coalesced into a great black panther, who padded out of the fog. Its yellow eyes glittered with malice, and perhaps a glint of intelligence. In any event, it was between the two comrades and the dubious safety of the barrow entrance. "'I see you've met Umbril,' Erdinger said with a nasty laugh. "'I'd stand still if I were you. Now, if you don't do what I say and drop your damned elf sword to the ground, I'm going to let the panther have you.' "'That explains much,' Garin decided. The panther trailed them and it must have gone to summon the Varunas when they entered the barrow. The sword-mage took one more look around and grimaced. "'You can have the book, then,' he said. He let his rucksack slip from his shoulder, knelt, and rummaged through it for the Infernadex, one eye on the spectral panther. In a moment he stood back up with the ancient tome in his left hand, the sword in his right. He felt Hamel shift uncomfortably, all too aware that the necromancer's book was their only bargaining chip, but the halfling said nothing. He whispered to the halfling, "'Watch yourself. Make your move,' Hamel answered. Garin lowered his voice and muttered a spell. "'Arvan Sanogan,' he hissed, and all at once bright blue-white flames sprang into existence all around his sword. He raised it over the heavy tome he held in his other hand and shouted, "'Not a single move, or I will destroy the book!' The Varuna's swordsmen surged forward in anger, but a single sharp command from Erdinger stopped them in their tracks. "'Hold!' the Varuna captain shouted at his men. Garin risked a glance behind him and saw the spectral panther crouch and hiss, but it did not spring at them. Erdinger's good humor, such as it was, fell away, and the mercenary glared at Garin. "'You fool!' he spat. "'If you harm that book, there'll be no reason to let you leave this place.' "'I can't see a reason why you'd let us go whether you get your hands on the book or not,' Garin retorted. "'If you intend to kill me no matter what, I might as well burn this musty old collection of hexes just to spite you before I die. I can have my bowmen shoot you down right now. Are you that certain of their aim? Miss by just a little, and I'll burn the Infernadex to ash with my last breath. Garin paused, measuring the effect of his words on the Varuna captain, and added, I'll trade the book for our lives. But you won't have both, I can promise you that. The mercenary captain scowled. All right, then. Make a suggestion. Hamel glanced up at Garin, then back to the Varuna men surrounding them. Yes, make a suggestion, Garin, he said. Give us two horses, Garin said to Erdinger. Then draw back outside a bowshot. I'll leave the book here, and we'll ride off. What's to keep you from riding off of the book once we draw back? or destroying it once we're too far away to interfere, for that matter. "'What's to keep you from pursuing us once you've got the book?' Garin answered. "'The only way this works is for both of us to do what we say we're going to do, and believe that the other fellow means it. 
As for destroying the Infernodex, well, I have it in my power to do that right now. So what would change? Erdinger frowned and turned away to mutter something to the mercenaries next to him. But he never said whatever he intended to say next, for abruptly the wind died, the night grew bitterly cold, and white hoarfrost appeared on the heather. Garin's breath steamed before him, and even the flickering blue flames of the fiery aura on his sword dimmed and wavered. The Varuna men shifted nervously and looked around, and the two companions did likewise. "'The chill voices are back,' Hamel said. "'Something is coming.' "'I feel it, too,' Garin said. "'What else can go wrong?' He glanced back at Umbral, but the spectral panther had disappeared. He swore under his breath and tried to watch in all directions at once. That's what I get for asking, he told himself. Now I have to wonder if the damned panther is sneaking up behind me. Suddenly a column of dark, cold flames erupted from the ground, not far from where Garin and Hamel stood, and a figure of nightmare stepped forth. It was a skeleton, dressed in the old, tattered remnants of regal robes. A heavy golden band served as its crown, and it carried a tall, twisted staff of dead gray wood in its bony talons. Garin heard metal rasping on metal as the thing emerged from the black flames. The skeleton's bones were riveted together by bands of rune-inscribed copper, green and dull with age. Its eyes were burning points of phosphorescent emerald fire, keen and malevolent. The sword mage's heart froze in his chest at the mere sight of the thing, and he took a step back without even realizing it. An unseen mantle of dread and despair seemed to flow before the apparition, as if its mere presence cast some grievous shadow on the souls of the living. Several of the Varuna men actually fell and buried their faces against the ground, unable to endure its presence at all. Part of Garin's mind noted that the apparition's appearance had provided the best distraction they were likely to get if they were to attempt a break for the barrow, but he was unable to wrench his eyes away from the dreadful king. The grim figure fixed its burning eyes on Garin. It was all that he could do to stand without quailing in front of it. Then it spoke. Five centuries have I waited for that book to be brought out of the Lathandarian wards. I will not permit you to damage it now, young fool. You are Isperus, he said in a weak voice. He'd heard enough tales whispered by firelight in Griffin Watch when he was young to recognize the dreadful lich who had stalked the high fells for centuries, a mighty wizard dead for hundreds of years, yet preserved by dark and potent necromancy. Garin had always wondered why he was called the King in Copper. Now he knew. The lich's bones were fairly held together by it. King Isperus, to you, the lich hissed. He glared at Garin, and his eyes flamed brighter with the intensity of his scrutiny. Hmm, you are a hullmaster. I know the smell of your blood. Isolmar is dead now, so you must be Burnoff's son, Garin. Of you, I have heard little. Garin said nothing for a long moment. It was terribly hard to form a thought, let alone speak, while Isperus held his gaze. Finally, he managed to say, I'll barter the Infernodex for our lives, King Isperus. The lich laughed coldly. What care I for your lives, he said. He stretched out his claw-like hand and made a small gesture, and the Infernodex was wrenched out of Garin's grasp by some unseen force, savagely strong. The book soared to the lich's hand, and Isperus twisted what remained of his face into a horrible smile. Goodbye, Garin Hullmaster. I expect that you and I will speak again soon, when you have been laid under stone, as your forefathers were. 
Isperus turned away from Garin, and the sword mage felt strength and volition returning to his limbs. The lich looked at Anfel Erdinger, who averted his eyes and stared at the ground between his feet. "'Tell your mistress that I hold her part of our bargain accomplished. "'Disturb no more barrows, Captain. "'You have no more reason to plunder my realm.' "'Then Isperus took an old amulet of verdigris-covered copper "'from his rotting robes and put it in Erdinger's hand. "'He who wears this token may call on my minions, "'and they will answer and do his bidding.' Now I have upheld my own part, too. Yes, mighty king, Erdinger mumbled. He took the copper amulet and slipped it into a pouch at his belt. I'll tell Lady Darcy what you have said. Tell her this, too. Do not use my gift in the bright hours of day, and do not try to send my minions far from the amulet. She should choose the time and place carefully, for my servants will answer but grudgingly. Tucking the tome under his bony arm, the lich strode off into the night. On the third stride he simply melted into a black mist that dissipated as the wind quickly arose again. The white hoarfrost covering the heather vanished as well, and Garin took a deep breath. They were still surrounded by a score of Varuna guardsmen, and he no longer had the book to bargain with. Erdinger looked back up and shook himself. Then he fixed his eyes on Garin with a wide, predatory smile. "'It seems that you've lost your bargaining chip, Lord Garin. Your previous offer was the Infernadex in exchange for your life. Have you got anything else to add at this time?' "'This does not look good.' "'Hamel observed. "'Try for the barrow?' "'Agreed,' Garin answered. "'Follow me when I move.' "'Then he quickly called out a spell. "'Thealalak na drendir!' "'The violet ripples of his dragon-scale spell "'shimmered brightly around him, "'and Garin hurled himself into motion. "'He darted off to his right, "'heading for the nearest bowman he could see. "'Arrows thrummed and hissed as they flew at him, "'but he judged his moment well. Most of the Varuna men had lowered their weapons when the Lich had made his appearance, so they hastily raised and drew while he was already in motion. One arrow was deflected by his silver-steel veil, another struck his dragon-scale spell and rebounded as if it had hit thick-plate armor. Several more hissed by him, but one well-aimed arrow found its way through his spell-shields and buried its broad head in his left arm. Garin cried out and staggered, but managed to recover his stride. The man in front of him leveled his bow right at Garin's face, but Garin was upon him, and he slashed his burning sword across the man's weapon, cutting the bow in two and sending the Varuna archer to the ground with a long, seared cut across his face, neck, and chest. The man shrieked and thrashed. "'Get them!' Erdinger roared. "'They can't get away!' Two men in mail tried to cut off Garin, but he was faster than they were. A quick passing parry, and he was by them. He heard Hamel's bowstring sing, and a strangled cry from behind him, but he didn't slow down. He rounded halfway around the barrow, scrambled up onto the sloping top, and ducked into the steep stone stairwell just ahead of more arrows and several of the Varuna swordsmen. Hamel skidded down the steps behind him, and Garin dove headlong through the hole he'd made in the wall at the bottom of the steps. Hamel followed after him. The halfling rolled easily to his knees, spun, and fired a couple of arrows back up the stairwell. "'I don't believe that worked,' Hamel muttered. "'Are you all right, Garin?' "'Almost,' Garin answered. His arm burned fiercely. It seemed that he'd knocked his shins against the stones in the stairwell, and his ribs still hurt from the fight against the bronze sphinx earlier. But he seemed more or less intact. The arrow in his arm was not as deep as he had feared. His spell shields had likely slowed it some before it struck. He gritted his teeth and carefully worked it out. Blood streamed down his arm and dripped on the cold flagstones. "'How about you?' "'Are you hurt?' "'Me? 
No, they were all shooting at you. You're a much bigger target, and your sword's on fire. I could have slunk off into the fog, and they never would have noticed. Hamel peered back up the stairwell and risked another quick shot. Another man cried out and cursed viciously. "'Watch it, you fools!' Erdinger shouted from somewhere out of sight. The Varuna mercenaries shouted at each other for a brief chaotic moment. Then the captain's voice carried over the others. "'Shut your damned mouths! Keep it quiet!' "'Well, now the darkness favors us,' Hamel said silently. "'It's pitch black down here, and anybody who sets foot on the stairs is silhouetted against the sky. So what next?' "'I'm still working on that.' "'Garin whispered. "'They could stay barricaded inside the barrow entrance for quite some time. "'The stairs would allow only one man at a time to approach, "'and it would be almost impossible for the Varuna archers "'to shoot past their own man on the stairs. "'What would he do in Erdinger's place? "'The mercenary captain could simply fill in the stairwell and leave, "'but he couldn't be sure that Garin and Hamel "'wouldn't dig themselves out after he left.' so maybe he just set watch over the top of the stairs and let them die of thirst or starvation. Or maybe a shield or mantlet of some kind, Garin mused. Carry it in front to block our arrows, move down and get to the wall. But then you'd still have to get through the hole. They could smoke us out, Hamel offered. Use a mantlet to get down here and then throw some burning brands through the hole, drive us back from the gap, and... Don't forget that panther they have. As far as we know, it could simply appear behind us and catch us looking up the stairs. Garin glanced over his shoulder at the black passageway behind them. That's a reassuring thought, he muttered. He peered up the stairwell as far as he dared. Erdinger was certain to be turning over the same possibilities in his own head. Likely he had an option or two that Garin hadn't even considered yet, such as hiring a wizard to blast open the barrow, or summon some demon who could simply rip them apart, swords and arrows be damned. 